Okay, and we are live on YouTube. Right. Good morning and welcome to the June 14th, 2022 public hearing of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We will begin this morning by taking attendance and I will turn it over to Mark Silverman to call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. All right, good morning again and welcome to the June 14th public hearing and public meeting. We uh, have a number of public hearing items today that are applications for work on designated properties. And uh, this meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on YouTube. If you would like to testify on any of the items, please join the meeting at the estimated time, which is shown on our website, which, which is shown on our agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would just like to watch the proceedings, you may do so on our YouTube channel. And uh, as, as well, with respect to testimony today, we will, as always, uh, accept testimony first from those who have signed up in advance, and then we will um, move to everyone else who's in the meeting who wishes to testify. So we uh, want to assure everyone that everyone will have an opportunity to speak today. So with that, I will turn it over to Corey Harala to take us through our public hearing agenda. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start today's preservation department hearing agenda with item number one, LPC 22-04223 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 323, lot six, 483 Henry Street in the Cobble Hill Historic District. This is a row house with Greek Revival style details built in 1844 to 45, and the application is to construct a rear deck and canopy. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Brett, you now have control of the presentation. And, whoa, hang on a second. Okay, Brett, I just need you to click on your screen. Okay. There you go. And you can advance the slides using your arrow keys. Okay. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Okay. My name is Brett Appel of Appel Architects, and I'm here to talk about 483 Henry Street in uh, Brooklyn. Um, 483 Henry Street is in the Cobble Hill Historic District on Henry between DeGraw and Kane. As mentioned before, we are proposing to add a deck to the rear yard with a uh, glass and steel canopy. The, um, the owners of 483 Henry live in this house with their three small children and decided that they wanted to have access to the rear yard during COVID. They rent out the garden unit, which is the only part of the house that has direct access and so having this um, outdoor space to provide, you know, some safe, fresh air for their kids while they're all at home was very important to them. And the deck and canopy um, aren't visible from either Henry or Strong Place, um, but are partially visible from DeGraw during the winter months when the foliage has fallen. Um, the existing rear elevation is on the left, showing the fire escape. Uh, we're proposing to replace one of the fire escape platforms with a, a deck and a canopy with a stair leading to the backyard. This is the view of the house from Henry Street. And this is a picture of the rear yard elevation that we're proposing the deck. few context images of their backyard. Um, and this is from their yard looking north into the adjacent properties. You can see the house uh, 43 Henry is on the left. And this is a view looking south um, towards DeGraw and you can see the house is on the right. 
As I mentioned, um, the house is partially visible from DeGraw Street. So we provided a couple of context images during the winter months to show you what was visible. Um, just marching along from west to east, you can see a little bit more of the house peeking out. And the part of the house that would uh, be visible is if you come along a little bit farther by the church at 58 Strong Place. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the deck and canopy are not visible during um, most of the year. They are either partially or completely obstructed by a combination of hard and landscape, um, including a 10 foot masonry wall that blocks the view from DeGraw, um, as well as a large tree and some tall hedges on the corner here. And this is a picture during the summer of you know, how much of the house is uh, obscured. Um, but during the winter months, part of the canopy would be visible. Um, the red line indicates the bottom portion is the deck and the upper portion is the, uh, the canopy. And as you turn the corner by 58 strong place, part of it does become visible, um, although still mostly obscured by the large tree here. And this is a rendering showing the outline of the deck and canopy. Um, the, the deck and canopy is supported by a steel structure that would be painted black, which you could see sort of behind the tree. Um, the deck is 22 feet wide by eight feet deep, and it has a direct stair down to the raised rear yard. The canopy is smaller. It's 13 feet, six and a half inches wide by eight feet deep. Um, it's smaller to accommodate the fire escape. And this is a view of the image of the, uh, the rear yard showing the scope of work, what we're removing and a rendering showing the, the deck and canopy. Um, it's worth noting that we have already um, submitted the application to the building department and have cleared all objections with the exception of LPC approval. Um, so they have already reviewed and approved the uh, changes to the fire escape. These are elevations and sections showing the existing conditions, what we're removing. And then the proposed elevation and section. So it's just a, a steel structure for the deck uh, with posts that are all physically separated from the existing historic structure and the canopy slopes away from the house toward the rear yard. Um, as I mentioned, um, everything is completely separate from the historic structure by a half an inch. And the canopy is supported by two W8 sections in the front and back, and then perpendicular to that um, W9 sections, all of which are painted black to support the glass canopy. Um, the uh, community board um, gave conditional approval, provided that we minimize the height and width of the canopy. And we have worked with the structural engineer to make sure that the W8 section is the smallest member that we can use, which it is. And it's as, um, as low as we can get it since it's still part of the path of egress. And this is the elevation of the deck and canopy relative to its um, or with the adjacent buildings for context to show the number of fire escapes and structures and decks in this area. Um, the material palette is uh, pretty simple. We are using a Marvin aluminum clad door to access the deck. Um, the paint or the finished color is bronze. Um, the steel structure for the deck, guardrail, and canopy is painted Benjamin Moore Graphite 1603, which is pretty much a black. And then the glass canopy um, is a is safety glass, uh, so it has a slight texture to it. And the importance to the owners for this canopy is to be able to provide outdoor space to their children. Um, even during inclement weather, so that rain does not, you know, inhibit them from having access to this outdoor space. And this is an image of the existing facade and the proposed deck 
with Canopy. And that's the end of my presentation. Great, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions, so we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior, our Director of Intergovernmental and Community Affairs to take us through the testimony. Great, thank you. So we do have uh, not, not any signups previously, and I don't see any hands raised for this item. So I'll just note that Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends approval with the condition that the canopy roof is made less visible or lowered. Okay, thank you. Okay, and, and Mr. Apple, I think you said that you did work with your engineers to respond uh, to those comments by the community board and reduce it to the extent possible, correct? Correct. Okay. Commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm starting to send you requests to unmute so that we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 The opposed? All right, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And I wanna thank the applicant for a very clear and organized presentation. I think that's why we had uh, no questions. So it's very clear um, the, you know, the, the modifications to the fire escape and the window to create a door and the deck with an enclosed portion. And the visibility was very clearly laid out for us. And, um, and also it's context showing other decks and balconies and fire escapes. All right, so let's begin our discussion. Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this one? Yeah, I think it's appropriate and it was a nice presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Uh, I agree. Okay, Commissioner um, Jefferson. Oh, it's, a, it's an interesting three-dimensional composition and my, I can approve it, but my only concern is the neighbors in this view it's, it's so much more less private than you typically see because there's no wall, there's no separation, but I can approve it. Okay. All right, Commissioner Gustafson? Yeah, I, I agree. It's, bar it's barely visible. It's, it's buried by the context. And uh, um, so I think it's um, appropriate as is. Commissioner Shamir Barron? I think it's appropriate as well. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith? I agree, I think it's appropriate. All right, great. And I think that's everybody. Oh, Commissioner Chapin, excuse me. Uh, I agree, it's appropriate. Okay, all right, great. So I think we have a consensus to approve this one. Commissioner Devonshire, would you make the motion? Sure. In the matter of LPC 2204223, 483 Henry Street in the Cobble Hill Historic District, an application to construct a rear deck and canopy. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not eliminate damage or conceal any significant architectural features. That the rear facade of this building has already been modified with the construction of an extension and is no longer a part of a regular pattern of rear facades. Therefore, the proposed work will not interrupt a unified row. That the proposed black painted steel deck and fixed steel and glass canopy partially offset from the rear facade of the extension will only be visible at an oblique angle from a limited vantage point throughout a parking lot on DeGraw Street and will be seen in conjunction with existing tall fencing and plantings and therefore will not draw undue attention to itself. And the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Yep. Uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passed. That's approved, thank you. We'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 22-04606. 
an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 942, lots seven and eight. 121 and 123 6th Avenue in the Park Slope Historic District Extension 2. Uh, these are two altered Italianate style row houses built circa 1880. The application is to replace windows and install rooftop railings. Okay, hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Richard, you now have control of the presentation. You can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you. My name is Richard Goodstein from NC2 Architecture in Brooklyn. Um, and we are presenting this project to you this morning. Um, let me see. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Great. Um, so um, this is a double, double wide row house um, on um, Sixth Avenue. Um, near Flatbush in, in Park Slope. Um, the scope of the project is to convert the existing building, which on the lower levels is currently an, uh, a, an abandoned funeral home. And on the upper levels is currently residential. We're turning it into four residential units, uh, four double floor through units. Um, our application here, um, pertains to the windows in the front. It pertains to these windows associated with the funeral home and uh, railings um, on the roof um, for the proposed roof deck. Um, the project is currently um, under construction. Um, most of the work was approved um, at staff level, um, also approved obviously by Department of Buildings. Um, we're um, asking for a small modification here to um, the approved project. Um, shows a little bit of a uh, context and the tax photo here. A um, little bit of the history of the building. Um, in the 1940s, number 121 on the left side was converted to the funeral home. They removed um, a lot of the architectural detailing um, on the facade, they removed the front stoop. Um, and that's when they installed the, um, the uh, casement uh, funeral home windows. Those windows, um, they're leaded glass um, with a sort of yellow uh, textured, textured panes in them. Um, and on, oh, what you can see also I wanted to point out was at the time, uh, I can't go, Backwards. Sorry about that. Um, in the 1940s, number 123 was, sorry, was not yet converted. Um, so you see the original, um, the the original state of the building. Um, that changed in the 1950s, and um, both buildings um, then had the same um, exterior exterior appearance. Um, these are some context photos um, from directly in front of the building on 6th Avenue. Um, as you can see here, I'm sorry. Um, as you can see here, the um, both facades, the architectural detailing was removed. Stoop was removed from 123. Some more context photos. These photos also um, were taken when the mock-up was in place. So and we'll have some more detailed photos of this later on, but up here, um, you can see the rear roof railing um, and in the front, um, you, you can also see the, the mock-up of the roof railing. You don't see it from, from this side over here. Um, some elevations just showing the work, the proposed removal of the funeral home leaded glass windows replacement with simple one over one um, double hung windows that are um, very, very similar to what was originally there. You can see the addition of the roof railing on, on top. Um, the rear elevation, um, this does show a number of the items that were approved at staff level. I won't go into that, but this does show the rooftop um, railings. So um, 
we're showing here a detail at the rear um, of the way the railing would look up um, near the area of the gutter at the rear of the building. Um, what you're seeing in plan, again, this is a demo plan on the left side, on the right side, it's um, the proposed plan. In red, what you're seeing, the lines that you're seeing in red are the railings that were, that were approved at staff level. This roof deck and the bulkhead were approved at staff level. Um, our application here uh, for the hearing has only to do with um, moving those railings and enlarging the roof decks. The railing in the rear is moving back, I believe it is six feet, and then the front, uh, it's moving forward about two feet. Um, they were not visible before, and um, there's, there's some street visibility um, in our um, proposed change. What the visibility diagram indicates is that directly across um, from the building, um, you do not see the, the railings um, in, in the revised position. It's only when you step back, and this is a somewhat unique um, site in that it's across from a church. So you're able to get these kind of long views um, to the facade. And because of those long views, you can see a bit of the front railing. This is a view from the side. And then from back here, you do also see a little bit of the roof railings. And from the rear, um, we have the typical townhouse block condition where you can see into the, the um, see into the, the interior of the block. And because we're close to the corner, you can, you can see the, um, the rear railings. Um, this is a blow up of a previous shot. Um, and uh, this illustrates how um, our visible roof railing, railings are not the only ones on this block. Um, there's also here a visible roof railing, and there's also on this more modern building, a visible roof railing. Um, and then if you take a walk around the block, you will see other, um, other buildings that have railings up at the roof. Um, now I'd like to switch to the discussion about the windows. Um, this is a, a, a bit of an overview of the history of the building. Um, basically, it's, it's outlining the same thing that I talked about before. 1940s, number 121 was converted to funeral home on the first two floors. They put in the funeral home windows. Um, in the 1950s, um, 123 was then converted um, also um, into an expansion of the funeral home. And they did that modification with the windows. This shows the condition of the, the existing condition of the windows. Um, as far as we can tell, the funeral home has been defunct for since the early 1990s. Um, and this shows that uh, many of the panes were, um, were replaced over the years with non-matching panes, that there's some damage, some broken glass, that the frames in some areas are um, badly deteriorated. A few more shots showing some of the leading is, is uh, deteriorated. This is a blow up elevation, just showing the uh, proposed, um, the proposed um, removal of the leaded glass windows and replacement with um, one over one um, double hung windows. Um, we are replacing the upper windows also as part of this project. They're being replaced with um, um, aluminum clad wood windows um, one over one, uh, similar to what was exist, um, originally existing. And um, we do have some of the historic brick molds, um, which will be reused, replicated in places where they're not reusable. Um, and what's also um, important for me to note is that when these uh, windows were replaced, the original one over ones were replaced with the casement windows. They also replaced the brick molds. Um, we are returning the brick molds back to um, what we, um, we think the original brick molds were. We think they, they all matched um, on, on the entire facade. 
And then this um, slide is just the detail of the basement level windows. Um, on the basement level, there were some modifications made um, to the window openings, the masonry openings. Um, we are not proposing to restore those back. We're simply gonna, uh, we're simply proposing to put um, one over one double hung windows um, in, those, in those existing openings. And that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have questions? I don't think we have any questions now. So we'll move to public testimony. And if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do have some signups. Um, our first speaker will be Christina Conroy from the Victorian Society. Christina, I'm promoting you to panelist. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you can please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay. Okay. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society, New York. Now, founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual landmarks, interiors, and civic art. The VSNY has no objection to the proposed roof railing at these two adjacent houses. Designed in a simple, straightforward manner, which will not draw attention to itself, the railing is to be finished in black, matching the black painted finish typically seen on ironwork in this and other historic districts. It is set behind the front parapet in a location which will minimize visibility and will be seen above the rear parapet at a distance in conjunction with a varied group of rear facades, garden walls, chimneys, fire escapes, and extensions. We also have no objection to the removal of the minimally detailed leaded glass casement windows and transoms added to the front facades in the 1930s and 40s which have neither stylistic relationship to the original architecture nor a strong design which speaks to the period when they were fabricated. However, we find that the proposal for the new windows leaves many questions unanswered and on the area way level 121 misses an opportunity. Now, commissioners 121 and 123 are two in a row of four houses. The designation report of the four specifically mentions their slightly arched windows. The photos show that they appear to be the original windows and brick mold on the upper floor with drawing 13 stating, all windows intended to be replaced with modern insulated double hung units emulating original windows with original and or replicated brick molds. But there are two problems with this. The historic windows should be retained and restored with inner storm windows if necessary. And the drawings for the proposed brick mold don't match the drawings for the original brick mold. Well, they need to match. Finally, this will probably be the only chance to correct one of the destructive changes made in the 1940s, the installation of the wide triple window at the area way level of 121. That window opening was specifically made to hold that specific casement window. Once that specific window is removed, we believe that the grandfathered condition is lost and that the original pair of window openings with double hung windows should be restored. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be uh, Michelle Arbelou from the Historic Districts Council. And I will be promoting you to panelist now. And you should be able to unmute your line if you can please state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Good morning, Michelle Arblow for the Historic Districts Council. HDC is generally comfortable with this proposal. However, there are three items that we believe the applicant should consider or be required to do. First, the rear facing guard rail on the roof deck should be pulled back from the rear facade at least three full feet to further reduce visibility from park place. Second, 
the front facing guardrail needs to be set back six feet from the front facade, not the front edge of the cornice. The FDNY does not consider the cornices to be part of the required six foot landing zone. Third, the masonry pier at 121.6 should be restored with the idea of restoring the building masonry openings to their original size and cadence. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker will be Philip Marriott. Philip, I'll be promoting you to panelist. And Philip, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Philip Marriott. I live at 125 Sixth Avenue and I'm uh, at this, attending this meeting to object to the uh, railings as revised in this current proposal that's being put forth. The original uh, railings uh, that were approved at staff level, uh, as noted in the presentation that you saw today, are set back both on the front and the rear. And uh, I think that's much more in keeping with the notion of uh, the district uh, so that the railings can't be seen either from the front or the rear. They can be seen from the rear from Park Place. And the railings in the rear are right up against the edge of the roof line, which is inconsistent with the notion of, of uh, maintaining. It, 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 it potentially leads to uh, noise pollution filtering into the rear shared garden areas uh, in the neighborhood. So that's my objection. Thank you for your consideration. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And those are all of the speakers that we have signed up in advance. And I do not see any hands raised at the moment. So I'll note that um, Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends approval uh, with the following conditions, that the roof deck be not enlarged beyond what was approved at LBC staff level, and that an elevator bulkhead is not built and is not required per the uh, 2014 Building Code Chapter 11 Accessibility Requirements. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Goodstein, would you like to respond to the comments we've heard? Um, and maybe before you begin, I just also will clarify that the um, commission reviews applications to install windows in previously altered openings, openings that were altered prior to designation. And we have not been, we do not have the power to compel owners to restore the openings. So we do evaluate the proposed configuration within that opening to determine appropriateness. And very often it can be done at staff level if it's the similar configuration to the rest of the building or the historic configuration. So the really the element of the ground floor window that is before us or that kicks it before us is the removal of the leaded glass and then the proposed aluminum clad material, not the rest, not the this, not the absence of restoration, restoration of those openings. Sure, I, I understand that. Um, I, I, I don't have anything to add at this point. I'd be interested in hearing what the commissioners have to say. Great. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, I'm sending you all requests to start to mute. Right. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. You and Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So this, uh, as was presented, is for the removal of the leaded glass windows at the parlor floor that date to the uh, 30s and 40s when the building was converted to a funeral home at those two floors at, at different times. And, um, and then the installation of new aluminum clad wood windows within all of the openings featuring a wood brick mold that matches the historic brick mold. And then uh, the second part of the proposal is to install railings for a roof deck closer to the front facade and the rear facade, which results in some visibility for us to evaluate. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Chapin, would you start this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
I think that removal of the leaded uh, glass is fine, uh, that the uh, replacement of the windows is also appropriate. Uh, I do think that the railing is too visible over various aspects for the front facade and should be pulled back. Um, oh, and the one issue that was raised by testimony, obviously applicants should work with the staff on the brick, brick molds to make sure that the brick molds are appropriate for this building's uh, style and, and uh, time. So other than that, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, um, I, I think it's unfortunate that the applicant can't be compelled to uh, replace the ground floor window configuration the way it was historically, because now we're, we're setting up yet a, a third alteration to this building. But uh, I guess there's nothing we can do about that. I do believe that the railing should be set back, um, as Diana mentioned. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I'm in agreement uh, with the other commissioners about the uh, the railing uh, should be set back uh, because it's highly visible. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Jefferson? Just... Um, sorry, there I mean, with all the comments. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson? Uh, I also agree with uh, Diana's comments. Okay. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I do too. Okay. Commissioner Holford Smith. I do as well. Okay, great. So I think we have a consensus to approve with the condition that they set the front railing back further. So Commissioner Chapin, would you make that motion? Sure. Thank you. In the matter of a certificate of appropriateness for a Brooklyn LPC 22-04606-121 through 120. 3 6th Avenue Park Slope Historic District Extension 2. Two altered Italianate style row houses built circa 1880. Application is to replace windows and install rooftop railings. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the historic district. I also note that the stoops were removed, details were stripped, and leaded amber glass casement windows were installed in the basement and parlor floors of both buildings prior to designation and in the case of 121 prior to the 1940s tax photograph. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the leaded amber glass windows are not original to the building and were part of a later conversion of the lower floors to commercial use that was not part of unified significant building alteration. Therefore, the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. That the proposed straight and segmental arch headed one over one double hug aluminum clad window, wood windows with a dark finish will match the original windows in terms of configuration, operation details, and finish. And therefore, the change in material will not detract from the buildings or adjacent buildings that the lower windows, which will be installed within modified masonry openings will be harmonious with the other windows at this building and in the row, that the proposed metal railings at the rear of the roof will be simple in design and will only be seasonally visible at an oblique angle from Park Place and therefore will not detract from the building or the adjacent historic buildings, that the light gray finish of the railings will help them to recede from view and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building of the Park Slope Historic District Extension uh, 2. However, I find that the proposed railings at the front of this very large roof deck will be visible over the primary facade from several vantage points along Park Place and 6th Avenue and will detract from the historic cornice. Therefore, I recommend that the front railings be set back to a non-visible location. Thank you. And Commissioner, um, Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passed. That's approved with that condition. Please continue to work with the staff and we'll now move to the next item. 
the next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 22-07586, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Queens, block 8046, lot 45, 237 Hollywood Avenue in the Douglaston Historic District. This is a New England colonial revival style freestanding house and a contemporary garage designed by Lyle Bulware and built in 1933. And the application is to demolish the garage, remove a tree, modify an entrance, replace windows and a wall, and construct an addition driveway and curb cut. Hey, good Commissioner morning. Is Sorry. Hello. Are you ready? Okay. Good morning, Commissioners, Bernard Artist Preservation Department staff. This application is, as stated, for 237 Hollywood Avenue in the Douglaston Historic District. Uh, the upper photo is an existing condition of the house. The applicants have asked that we note that um, the current owners are new owners and that they had purchased this property with the intention of maintaining the house going forward for a long time and that some of their the proposed alterations are really focused on setting up the house so that they can live solely on the ground floor if ever in the future they have mobility issues. So the proposal includes changes to the house and to the site. Uh, at the house, the proposal con includes constructing an L footprint uh, addition. So you're seeing it both on the left where you see the, the paired garage doors and then a bit of it on the right. Additionally, they're proposing to replace the siding and the windows throughout the house. This would meet staff level rules with the two exceptions. With the siding, the, there will be installing insulation at the same time, so that will push the plane of the house out about an inch and a half. And with regards to the windows, they're proposing aluminum clad wood instead of wood. So those are the two things that, that uh, make this something that has to go to a hearing. Additionally, they're proposing changes to the main entrance. So you can see in the photo above, it's a single door. And then at the uh, below, you see what they're proposing, which has a larger opening, new infill, a portico replacement of the steps. Um, additionally, they would like to stucco the concrete at the base of the building. So these are existing conditions, photographs of the house, the uh, front and then the rear at the top. The rear is visible from a public thoroughfare and then the two sides are at the bottom. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, the bottom left photo is the photo circa 1940 of the tax photos and the other photos in, on this page are all from the time of designation. Oh, I apologize, I did not mention the site work. So let me go back just for a second. In addition to doing the house work, they are also doing some work on the site. This includes demolishing a structure at the back. It's a garage and shed that you see on the right-hand side of the house. Uh, there are additional photos that are coming up. They would be removing the driveway and the curb cut that are associated with that. And then on the other side of the house where they're proposing the garage, they're proposing a new driveway and a new walkway and to remove a tree, which you don't see in this photo, they're also proposing to install three new trees at the back of the site and do some regrading. So to get to that. And this is the structure at the, it's a garage and shed at the back that's proposed to be demolished. Um, all of these photos are of that structure with the exception of the photo in the bottom right hand corner. That is a structure at 345 Cherry Street that the commission previously had approved for demolition. This is the site plan. So on the left is the existing conditions and you can see highlighted in pink, the tree that is proposed to be removed with some close up photos to help document the condition. You can also see in the back corner, the garage structure, the applicants have uh, told us that uh, it is in such a case of disrepair. If they had to rebuild it in kind, they would not be able under zoning to build it in the exact same location. And then if you look at the proposed condition, you see the L footprint addition. You can see the driveway, the new pathway adjacent to it, there's the portico, and the structure has been removed as well as the driveway on this side of the house. This is showing the house in context of the block with its proposed addition as well as additions at other houses in the block. This shows the massing of the house. So on the left is existing, the right is proposed. As I noted, the, the rear is visible. So the what you're seeing on the lower image is the proposed condition. They're um, exposing some of the basement level uh, by regrading. Uh, that will not be visible from the street, but the upper portion of the house will be. 
So the next four sheets are existing and proposed elevations. So they're on the left is existing, on the right is always going to be proposed. Just to remind you, the changes to the house are the construction of the addition, the changes to the entrance, the stucco at the building base, uh, as well as the um, the siding having insulation and the windows being metal clad wood instead of wood. So this is the rear and here you can see how uh, the previously at some point the ground had been bermed up so they're going to be leveling that out or they're proposing to. This is the east side of the house. This is the west side. I'm sorry, I'll go back. That's east side, west side, and these are views from the street. So the upper views are what you see looking towards the back of the house from Manor Road between two other neighboring houses. Uh, in the foreground, you're seeing a wood fin fence at six feet high and meet staff level rules. So that's being reviewed at staff level. And above that, you see addition that's being proposed. The lower views are from the front of the building looking from Hollywood. So the existing condition on the left, proposed condition on the right. And oops. Uh, again, views from the front just from a different direction and the lower image is from further away, existing on the left, proposed on the right. This is a page of some precedents that the applicants have provided for both the portico and for garages at the front of the building. Uh, 250 Arley Road, 301 Richmond Street, 21 Center Drive all had the garage at locations that are shown at the time of designation. 220 Forest Road is a commission approved building. Uh, additionally, 348 Hollywood with its portico is another commission approved building. And 221 Hollywood Avenue uh, had that portico at time of designation. 239 Hillside Avenue, that's not the correct address. We don't know exactly where that building is. And these are other other examples the applicants would like to present. One is 245 Arley Road showing existing and proposed conditions where the commission approved um, extending out and creating a portico at the front of the house. And both 351 Hollywood Avenue and 378 Beverly Road, the commission approved uh, paired, paired garage doors. So at 351, uh, it's adjacent to the front of the house. 378, it's here on the left, which is um, attached to the rear. And these are showing some of the materials. All of the materials that they're proposing are consistent with materials that could be approved at staff level with the exception of the aluminum clad wood for the windows. Uh, these are some details of the doors and the surround. These are some details of their portico and the column, which will be wood uh, and the bricks for the steps. This shows the insulation that's being proposed. If you look at the section, you can see that one and a half inch that's being added in where they're putting in insulation behind the siding. And I'm sorry. And these are the floor plans. Again, you see the L-shaped footprint. So now the applicants would also like to add in and speak a bit about the proposal. So Bagna, if I'm going to get you to page one. So can can you unmute and speak? Please remember to state your name. Bogna, we can't hear you. Hold on. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay. But you cannot see us, probably. That's OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Hello, okay. my name is Bogna Pro and uh, from Sky Architects. And together with my husband, Joseph, who is here with me, we are the architects for the project. And we wanted to uh, give you some sort of a feeling for the idea behind the project, which is to create a living space, new living space for the two empty nesters uh, while keeping um, uh, it uh, in style with the existing house. Uh, the owners of the house, Mr. and Mrs. Landau, have lived in Douglaston for 25 years and love the neighborhood. Currently, they live uh, a few blocks away on Cherry Street in a three-story house and on a small lot. Uh, they uh, are looking for property in a manner big enough to afford uh, one level living. And when 237 Hollywood came on the market, they saw its potential and decided to buy it, despite the fact that it was an eyesore in the neighborhood. And the previous property owner has uh, let it fall in a total disrepair. And the grounds were overground. The house was in a very poor shape, as you can see here, still is. And the garage was beyond repair. That's why we 
um, recommending its taking down. Uh, the owners, however, decided to bring the house to its former glory and it befitting the manor location. So in, while they uh, owned it already for two years, they got rid of the brush and overgrowth and weatherized the house as much as possible, uh, earning big prizes from the community since uh, it uh, is clear that they will uh, be good neighbors. And the house, uh, it's very simple and it charmed the owners with uh, its character and simplicity. And uh, since they have become the caretakers of the property, they have developed a deep emotional attachment to it. And we saw it, uh, saw how much they loved the house when they asked us to turn us, to turn it into their forever home, meaning that it will have to serve them for many, many years. Uh, and, so, and that's how the aging in place concept uh, came about being a main design criteria for our project. One of our main challenges was dealing with the very neglected structure. In our studies of the current renovations in the manor, no other properties were in such state of neglect. Uh, and the entire, as you see, the entire elevation, uh, exterior, siding, windows, and the fascia must be replaced. And the house must also be brought up to the current energy code standard. That's how we added that extra uh, layer of uh, uh, insulation, zip system insulation that will provide uh, enough of the, to, to its six inch walls right now, uh, the energy code. And also we're going to have to bring up uh, all the house's utilities to, uh, to standards, the electric and plumbing, as well as uh, sewers. In essence, this is not just a simple addition to the house, but uh, rather a complete renovation of the entire building due to present conditions. The owners uh, have taken quite a lot on. So on page six, yeah, we've looked, uh, we search, researched the uh, neighborhood and found that uh, uh, every house on the block has sizable additions. On the page, the next page, you can see that we're using the exterior vocabulary of, uh, of the, and the elements of the original design and style of the house and extending them to the new addition. My, uh, my husband can uh, continue about the more technical aspects of it. Yeah, well, we... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Please just state your name before you speak. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Pro. Sky, Sky, Sky from Sky Architects. <laughs> well, the, we're trying to match the existing vocabulary of the house and the elements of the original design and style of the house to extend them to the new addition. Um, this is, this is a real uh, livable house and they wanted garages that they actually park in. When they get out of their cars, they go into their uh, master bedroom and then into the kitchen area. Um, we, the addition includes a kitchen enlargement, uh, enlarged to accommodate current ADA guidelines, laundry room, master bath, master bedroom, and a garage. The original house area serves as dining and living rooms. The master bedroom has access to the side entrance, so it has two ways of egress. Uh, the entire plan conforms to AIA, ADA uh, guidelines. Um, they're not at all bound in any way um, to those guidelines at this point, but they're planning ahead. They're both in their 60s and they, uh, this is their forever home as they have stated many times. Um, the windows are wood clad aluminum and we're replicating their six over six. We're replicating the uh, existing windows um, with Pella. You can move to page eight, Bernadette, if you want, um, just to show uh, design that features, the, the yeah. design features that we uh, are incorporating, uh, like the portico, which is, yeah, which yeah, is the part. Yeah, we can do this, yeah. okay. So, okay, we added windows 
to the side, side lights to the, to the door. Uh, the door was like a- For security reasons. For security reasons to begin with. Then they have dogs so the dog could actually uh, act as a precursor of who's at the door. But um, the portico also is a raindrop so, and snow to keep the snow and the rain off of the immediate entrance. Um, the columns are wood, uh, round, that would, uh, or, you know. That, that would simply help with holding up, obviously, and adding to the dignity of the house and right. the elegance of, of the entrance. We uh, researched uh, similar styles and found that this very simple uh, triangular uh, with no uh, round elements uh, style is uh, fitting with the colonial revival house. Another so, example, if we can go to uh, the um, this page, yeah, for the garage doors. Uh, these doors we had existing drawings, uh, the owner commissioned existing drawings of the house prior to any work being done on it. These doors were in such a state of repair they had to be destroyed, but from the drawings, we managed to um, replicate them and they uh, will be custom doors. Cust custom doors, yeah, for sure, with, with lights on top of it, uh, windows on top of it and uh, wood, so. Um, so we were, we, were, we were very much uh, trying to keep the integrity of the house intact, <clears throat> stay in its vocabulary, and yet at the same time provide all the living amenities that one needs these days. Okay. Yeah, and you know, the clients wanted to maintain the integrity. That was also one of the main criteria for the design. And they're anxious to move into their house and become part of the fabric of the neighborhood. Uh, they love <laughs> and okay. um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see if we have any questions. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Perfect. Thank you. So we have uh, two speakers signed up in advance. The first would be Michelle Arbelou of the Historic Districts Council. Michelle, I'll be promoting you to panelists if you could accept that request. And you should be able to unmute your line if you could please state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Good morning, Michelle Arbelou for the Historic Districts Council. The proposed alter alterations to 237 Hollywood are inappropriate and should be rejected in full. This neighborhood and this block in particular are characterized by detached garages set at the rear of the property. This strategy allows for the front yard to be a heavily planted landscape that allows the larger community to read as houses set in a parkland. This proposed scheme with its straight facing car garage would turn that landscape into a parking lot. The front entry portico and addition of side lights to the front door is similarly inappropriate and not properly proportioned or detailed. The applicant needs to study these elements and develop an appropriate solution. The rear yard additions are also poorly proportioned and glommed on the way to existing house in an awkward way. This is perhaps being driven by the location of the garage as attached to the building. HDC therefore asked the commission to reject this application and ask the applicant to design a a project where the rear yard garage shed is rebuilt in an appropriate size and complementary set of details. We also ask that the remaining additions be reconsidered in light of the correctly located garage. And finally, the front entry portico be redesigned using a more studied classical language. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Sydney Kruger. I do not believe they are in the meeting at this time. Um, and I do not see any hands raised. So I will note for the record uh, that Queens Community Board 11 recommends approval. All right, thank you. Right, I'd like to turn to the applicants and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. 
it's difficult to say <laughs> Where something to start on this. Yeah, with, with, kind with of the crazy. total rejection. <clears throat> it it is it is a house that is uh, uh, at the very height of the hill that's uh, in the air, um, neighborhood. We thought that uh, despite of the fact we've tried to make uh, in respect very much the, um, the language that it spoke and additions, the additions just simply um, fulfill the wishes of the owner. The owner is important in that aspect uh, we feel and what we wanted to present is what we could do to keep in the massing and the looks of it. Uh, with a, there is several different uh, as additions as we as we know. And on the slide fourteen, uh, Bernadette, I don't know if you can bring that back to show uh, how they are being treated. And uh, there is many of them not in that style. Uh, the one here on this fourteen, yeah, on the slide fourteen. Uh, this is Sorry. Slide yeah, 250 Arley Road, which is the very bottom on the, under the map, uh, yeah. is, um, is, is, is a very similar in the same style uh, house, which is the New England uh, Colonial Revival. And uh, um, the only difference between this and ours would have been that extra overhang that uh, was created. We're willing to do that if if to uh, push back visibly uh, the facade. Also, we, also the, to, to rebuild the existing garage, we, we would have to meet new zoning requirements. It includes setbacks of at least six foot on the, on the rear feet, property and then uh, on the side block too, which would make maneuvering into the garage quite impossible. We'd have to enlarge the garage for modern cars. It's a 14 foot garage. Right now, um, you know, and also and also uh, it would not be historic anymore because no, it would have exactly. had to be moved. And since we cannot at this point in the way that it is uh, in, in that condition, it presents the life safety hazard. So uh, also it's, it's a good trot to the garage from the house in the rain and snow. Um, yeah, as I said, yeah. the main goal was, you know, one story living and uh, and we had the opportunity to enlarge to do it. the back of it. Yeah. The, the, the back facade um, is just a simple one story. It's a one story addition. Uh, and it has, uh, it, it has, right. It, it, it has the, the ability of, of uh, doing the walkout basement just is uh, so happened because the natural lay of the land is such that right. it allows this is, the, for this is actually the lay of the land here, right. where we're at with this line. It was bermed up to here uh, by the pri prior owner, here I guess. You can see, you can see As you can see it right here. Yeah, on the left. Uh, right, the and these are stone steps going down, but this is this is the extent of it. And then we're here, and then we're extending down to see. there. So, the in essence, <clears throat> it is a simple one story. Addition, there is um, not much else one can do in terms of fitting uh, story, uh, one story buildings. They would always have roof. They would always have, we've tried to do a, a little bit more elegant uh, look for their inside of their bedrooms, where the bedroom, because the house in itself uh, is just barely eight foot six high in, in, in the floor, floor to floor. So if we maintain the same height, which we are for the rest of the addition, uh, the, the spaces, the larger space like the kitchen and the bedroom just get slightly elevated uh, ceiling just to make them more spacious, feel more spacious since they are really small. Despite of the looks of the, of the presentation here or in the presentation, uh, the ground floor is uh, 2,300 square feet. So it's not, it's not overly uh, big. All right, thank you. There is a deck and a balcony that's in. I think we're open to questions now, if we yeah. can answer questions. Commissioner Chapin, did you have a question? I know your hand was up for a while. Commissioner Chapin. 
I think they addressed uh, the question I was going to ask. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other final questions, commissioners? All right. I don't see questions, so I think we'll move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, Commissioner. Oh, oh, sorry, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll now begin our discussion. And we have a number of components here. We have the addition that wraps around it, one story that wraps around. We have the uh, portico at the entrance, the insulation which pushes the siding out further, the aluminum clad windows, and then the site work, which includes the demolition of the existing garage and the new driveways and pathways. So Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Sure, sure. Um, I'll start with the entrance. Um, you know, there are two approaches to these type of colonial houses. There's a simple entrance that they have there or a portico. And in, in Connecticut, they love the portico. And I, I can accept the portico. I think the proportions are kind of odd. Two, two side lights, maybe one, but acceptable. Um, uh, the, the existing building is a freestanding building. Um, and that's the beauty of this type of building. I think the L-shaped addition uh, should, should make the freestanding building dominant. So it should be pushed back. The garage should be pushed back to reflect the dominance of the original. Um, that's a simple process. Um, uh, I thought the roof should be reduced somewhat, but I'm not, I'm not sure I can accept it the way it is. Um, the windows, the aluminum clad, the aluminum clad windows, I think I can approve that. Demolishing the garage, I can approve that. Um, removing the trees, I can approve that. And replacing it with three trees, that's fine. And the drive in the curb is all necessary. So I can approve that also. Okay, so really some focus on the um, addition and the, this proximity to the front and the, how it relates to the existing building. Uh, some comments on the proportions of the entrance. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Okay, um, well, there's a lot going on here. Okay, on the... Um, um, Portico, um, I largely agree uh, with Commissioner Jefferson. Um, on the portico, I would um, ask that they work with staff on that proportions issue that uh, Commissioner Jefferson raised, uh, but, I, but I'm okay with the, uh, with the change. Um, the, I also agree the garage should be set back um, to um, afford us primacy to the, uh, to the, the original house. Uh, the insulation that changes the, um, uh, uh, the plane um, is fine. Um, and aluminum clad windows are fine. The demolition of the old garage is fine. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not, I guess I, I'm not getting enough um, clarity on how much of the, um, uh, of, of the um, site, the driveway and, and is going to take up in the, um, in the new configuration. It, it appears that it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of, um, uh, of hardscape, um, um, there, I would also ask them to work with staff on, on trying to give them the appropriate access they need for the driveway with the minimal amount of hardscape. Um, I think that covers everything. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, I agree with um, a lot of the comments the previous commissioners um, noted. And I, I think it might be a little bit um, difficult to simply push back the uh, the, the garages that, as they've proposed it, uh, only because it looks like it's, um, it's very specifically dimensioned to accommodate the garage use. So uh, I, I actually think that more than sort of pushing back, I, I think that the entire garage um, sort of addition should turn 90 degrees or somehow be oriented so that it, so that we understand the roof as uh, uh, the, the the roof plane as it existed in the previous, um, where the garage was previously, meaning that it's against the direction of the house roof. Now, well, I, I'm not sure what that entails, if that's a full redesign or 
relocation of the, of the exact garage. I am in, I, I support and can approve an addition to the house, but I really agree with Commissioner um, Jefferson that that the existing building needs to read as, as kind of dominant and singular, um, as, as close to the way that it reads today. So I think that it would help if, it may, if maybe the entire volume that's currently designated as the, um, as the garage is, is reconsidered. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith? Yes, I agree with uh, a lot of the comments that have already been stated. Um, I do think that the addition is, uh, competes with the existing building and that the house, the original house really wants to stand on its own. So had, I believe the garage should be pushed back in some, some manner. Um, and I think that the roof needs to be lowered to make it much less dominant. And I also think that the rear addition should, should also be set back. So it doesn't look like it, just a continuation of the plane of the side of the house. The original house should really still read as, as the, its original volume. Um, you know, I think in general, the addition is kind of overwhelms this pretty small house. So if they can reduce maybe the, maybe the roof heights, um, just to give the original building a little more prominence to it. Um, and I think that should definitely work with staff on the proportions of the entry and reduce the hardscape at the front to, to the you know, minimal that they need for the driveway. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I agree with most of the previous comments, though I think that entrance to the garage should be at the, you know, and facing the street as is typical in the district. Um, I think that I just add to what has already been said that, uh, or want to further on it, that addition, the, the addition maybe uh, could be a little less wide, the roofs simplified. Uh, and as everyone said, further back from the front, um, it just looks, especially because you can see it from Anna Road as well, it, it does seem unfortunately a little too, uh, it, it not subordinate enough to the uh, original. And I understand they're trying to give them a little more, uh, uh, you know, ceiling room, but those uh, gables, I think, uh, are in particular causing it to look much more, um, you know, uh, much larger <laughs> against the existing house. And uh, perhaps there's another solution to that, or just, you know, not, not having the gables or having only one gable or something. Anyway, uh, so I think some modif I agree with the modification suggested by the commissioner in general and about the front as well, where the portico needs to be a little more simplified, perhaps uh, with regard to the um, side lights and uh, just the work with the staff on the sort of portico that would be more typical for uh, this type of very. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the colonial house. And I also just want to congratulate the applicants on taking charge of this house and trying to bring it up to, uh, uh, you know, a good condition, which is a really a very, <laughs> is great that they're doing that, so. All right, great, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Uh, thanks, I, I guess there's a lot that has to be done here. I. I I do not disagree with anything that my colleagues have said. Um, I specifically agree with Anne about the um, issues with the addition, that um, it really almost seems to subsume the, the house, so they have to work with staff on that. Um, the, I, I really like Adi's idea about the garage turning it 90 degrees. The problem with that is then you create a valley where the one roof slope meets the side of the house, which will continually be a maintenance problem because of leaves and other stuff collecting in that valley. So um, I'm compelled to think that, that it's a great idea to turn it 90 degrees but it should be separated somewhat from the house if that occurs. And perhaps they could have a hyphen that connects the two. But um, lacking that as an option, the, um, 
the garage needs to be pushed back at least four more feet. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I guess uh, uh, I agree with most of the comments from the commissioners. I think the applicant is almost there. Uh, I do agree with the, the comments from the commissioners about uh, the addition overwhelming the, the this little house. Uh, I have no problem with the demolition of the garage. And I do agree that the applicants should work with the staff on the hardscape. I think the uh, uh, in terms of the driveway and the appropriateness, I, I think the commissioners made excellent suggestion about setting back the new garage. Uh, and I agree with Anne's comment about the back that if you can set back that as well. I think those are excellent comments. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire, did you wanna add something else? Yeah, I'm sorry, Sarah. On, on the illustration shown, the, um, I just wanna be sure that the shutters that are ultimately installed are not these little weenie things that actually would not cover the windows. They have to be proportioned as if they were um, real and usable. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you commissioners for focusing so specifically on every aspect of this proposal. So we won't take an action today. I think that in general, the commission is supportive of an addition and an entrance portico that meet the owner's needs, but we've asked um, in various ways for the applicants to reconsider the volume and size of the addition relative to the main house and the proportions and details of the portico and shutters and other elements. So we will um, not take an action, have you continue to work with the staff and we'll have you back as soon as you're ready. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item now. And the next item is public hearing item number four, LPC 22-09715. This is an application for an amendment. It's in the borough of Manhattan, block 97, lot nine. 107 South, uh, South Street Seaport, uh, I'm sorry, 107 South Street in the South Street Seaport Historic District. Uh, this is a building built in 1818 to 1819 and altered in 1855. And the application is to amend an approval under LPC 20-06856 for constructing a rooftop addition, altering the front and rear facades and replacing storefront and film. Good morning, commissioners. Brian Blazak, preservation staff. Uh, again, the subject property is 107 South Street. So this slide shows uh, the existing primary facade on the left and the previously approved on the right. On March 9th, 2022, the commissioners approved a proposal to construct a rooftop addition, alter the front and rear facades and replace the storefront. And to refresh your memories, um, these renderings show the addition as approved. And the uh, existing rear facade on the left there and the approved rear facade on the right. Um, so this resulted in an additional two floors at the rear facade and combined window openings throughout the rear facade. So the applicants have returned for an amendment to that approval. The building, which was originally planned for office use above the second floor, will now be converted to residential use above the second floor, with the first floor remaining a commercial space. So the first change is the introduction of a solar panel array at the southern facing pitched roof, which you can see here. So as shown in these renderings, the pitch of the rooftop addition remains unchanged and there will be no visibility from street level. Um, the primary area of visibility for the solar panel array will be from a great distance at the Brooklyn Bridge walkway, which you can see here, this area just at the Southern portion of that roof. So the, um, this slide shows again, the existing on the left and the newly proposed on the right with that uh, additional solar panel array. The other area of change is at the rear facade. Multi-light window and door assemblies will open onto steel, fire escapes, and balconies. Additional HVAC units at the roof are staff level, 
just to note that up there at the roof. And um, this shows the proposed on the left in elevation and on the right, it's just shown without the fire escapes and balconies for clarity. So this slide shows just some details of the steel fire escapes and balconies and window and door assemblies. And this slide shows um, the proposal and section with the previous roof line uh, in red, no changes to the actual pitch of the roof from what was approved previously is, is proposed. Um, and, but this shows that in section that the window and door assemblies at the rear facade will be set back 15 feet from the lot line. And again, that's driven by the change uh, to residential use. And again, the approved primary facade on the left and the uh, proposed on the right. The additional door at the storefront is also a staff level approval. And finally, the uh, approved rear facade on the left and the proposed on the right. Uh, the architect, Thomas Barry, is here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brian. Commissioners, do we have any additional questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. So, oh yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Just hit the okay to unmute. Oh, Commissioner Jefferson, um, there you go. Okay. Listen, um, the question is about the solar panels. Why not cover the whole roof with the solar panels? Why partial? Well, um, we're, we're actually providing- Thomas, just state your name for the record. Okay. This is Thomas Berry, Opera Studio Architecture. Um, we, uh, we basically uh, provided the minimum required in this case to meet the sustainable mission requirements. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so now we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Great, thank you. So we do have one person signed up and that is Michelle Arbeluth. So Michelle, I will be promoting you to panelist. And Michelle, you should be able to unmute your line. If you can please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arblu for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the proposal to be generally appropriate with one major concern. We find the proposed rear elevation to be awkward and neither well re resolved nor in keeping with the district or otherwise sensitive approach to the front of the building. We therefore ask the commission to have the applicant work with the staff to develop a rear facade that is less frantic in its fenestration, perhaps more dense in terms of brickwork and far more modestly mutant, mutant with what is currently proposed. In a single word, simplify. Thank you. Thank you. And we do not have any other signups for this item. And I do not see any hands raised. So I'll note that um, Manhattan Community Board 1 recommends approval and recommends that the applicant work with staff on more modest signage above the ground floor. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to turn back to the applicant. Mr. Barry, would you like to respond to the comments we've heard? Um, no, no, I'm, I'm happy with the rear facade articulation and fenestration. Okay. It's a simple uh, grid of windows uh, in alignment, um, consistent with some of the other rear facades uh on the block um with the with the fire escapes and balconies as the okay. as the rendering shows can you maybe go to the slide and just show or brian if you have control whoever has control just show the adjacent rear facades uh, I, we approved new rear facades on i think 105 or 109 just the, the rendering to the right yeah so just if we can see the context that would be great so we can see commissioners we did approve um, in a regular massing with some balconies on the adjacent buildings. All right, Commissioner Gustafson, please go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, what, what's the, maybe you answered this already, but what's the visibility of this rear facade? I mean, from from where can it be seen, if, if at all? There's no visibility from the street, just from the adjacent courtyards and buildings. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? We're going to now move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. So we're sending all requests to unmute. Commissioner Devonshire, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll now begin our discussion. So the proposal is um, an amendment to a previous approval we voted on to enlarge the building. And the uh, two pieces that are being requested are for the solar array on the front slope, which will not be visible from the street, but will be visible from the Brooklyn Bridge and changes to the rear windows and the installation of fire escapes to accommodate the residential use, the codes for the uh, residential use. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Holford Smith, could you start this one? Sure. Um, I apologize if you can hear the drilling in the background, but they're working on my facade of my building. So um, sorry, it's very loud here. Um, okay. So I have no problem with the solar panels. I think that's appropriate. Um, the rear facade, um, I understand having to add the fire escape um, and the balconies as well to accommodate their residential use. Um, I do find the, um, the density of the fenestration uh, pattern to be a little out of, out of character, inappropriate. I think that they could work with staff to help simplify as, as was heard in the testimony. I think multi-light is okay, but I think maybe it's just a little, little too much. Maybe they can just reduce the number of, of lights. Um, think otherwise it's appropriate as is. I think the storefront is appropriate. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Chapin? Um, I think I can accept it as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? I'm okay with the storefront and the uh, solar panel. I think the, the fenestration on the rear facade is completely inappropriate for this building. Uh, it changes it from <laughs> County house into an industrial building. I think it uh, it actually is a lot too much. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I'm in agreement uh, with Anne and Michael. I I think that the I'm fine with the solar panel in front, uh, but I do agree with the testimony as well as the commissioner's suggestion that the rear facade be simplified a bit. Uh, yeah. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I agree with the solar panels. I agree with the storefront entrance. I think the rear facade should be absolutely simplified. Commissioner Gustafson. Um, I, I agree as well. Um, I think the, uh, um, this is a uniquely good way to, to install solar panels um, and, uh, um, and it works very well here. Um, I think that the um, the rear facade is. I think the, the word is someone used was frenetic. Um, that there's just t t too much going on there. Um, that needs a little rethinking. Okay. And Commissioner Shamir Barron. I agree with all those comments. Simplify the rear facade. Okay. And you know, as I said, the rear is not visible from the public way, and adjacent to rear facades that we approved on the two other buildings that have not only uh, dense windows and balconies, but uh, shifts in the massing. So I think that we can certainly ask the applicants to simplify, but if everyone's comfortable with that, we'll let them work with the staff on that, just given the lack of visibility and context. Yes. Okay, great. So Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make the motion then? Yes. In the matter of LPC 2209715, 2, 107 South Street in the South Street Seaport Historic District. A building built in 1818-19, altered in 1855. Application is to amend an approval under LPC 206856 for constructing a rooftop addition, altering the front and rear facades and replacing storefront infill. 
I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the South Street Historic District, South Street Seaport Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the work will not eliminate any significant architectural features, that the proposed solar panels will have a low profile and will be mounted parallel to the pitch of the roof, thereby maintaining the, thereby, thereby maintaining the roof plane, that the placement of the solar panels on the south facing slope of the roof is necessary for proper performance and economic viability, that the solar panels will only be appreciably visible from the Brooklyn Bridge walkway and the FDR in the context of numerous rooftop additions and mechanical installations on buildings along South Street, and that the simple rectilinear configuration and dark uniform appearance of the solar panels and framing and framing elements against the gray background of the metal roofing will not call undue attention to themselves or detract from the special architectural features of the building. Uh, that the proposed alterations to the non-visible rear facade featuring uh, punched combination openings with multi-light with, with window and door assemblies will be in keeping with rear facades of surrounding buildings in the block. That the rear facades of other buildings in the block are varying depths, including many that feature additions or are modern reconstructions with projecting decks and fire escapes. Therefore, the, the deeply set openings and projecting decks and fire escapes will not disrupt pristine rear facades or central green space. That the proposed deck floor platforms, railings, and ladders at each floor and atop the rear slope of the roof will be simple and utilitarian in design and opening character and will recall typical industrial decks and fire escapes found within the block, uh, but that the applicant will work with staff to simplify the fenestration pattern um, and details of the rear windows and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or historic district. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you, Mark. Will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved with that condition. Please continue to work with the staff on the fenestration pattern. We will now move to the next item. Thank you. Next item is public hearing item number five, LPC 22-05611, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 496, lot 35, 65 Spring Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District Extension. This is an altered Italianate style store and tenement building designed by William E. Waring, built in 1878, and the application is to construct a rear yard addition. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Michael, you now have control of the presentation. Um, you just need to, you've already clicked on your screen so you can advance the slides using your arrow keys and the project team may begin when ready. Please state your name for the record. Hi, um, it's Albert Lebos. I'm one of the property owners, commissioners, and thanks for having us. Um, I just want to give a little background on, on this project. We, um, we, we embarked on this project to create handicapped bathrooms for two retail stores. And frankly, this was an odyssey I didn't expect. Uh, we started before the uh, Soho rezoning where uh, we needed a special permit from city planning to permit us to have retail, a retail extension in the rear. Well, we started that project, that process back in 2018. It took us three years to get the city planning to give us the permission to do a retail extension. And of course, you know what happened to, to the summer rezoning. So here we are now, four years later now, doing this minor, minor extension that's really innocuous, I believe. Uh, that that's very, very that we need very badly for to make our retail more marketable, since it's been vacant for the past three years. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our architect to make the presentation. But I just want to give you some context to why we're making this application. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is uh, Michael Nelson from Shallot Architects. Um, we're the applicant from this project. Um, like Albert said, um, we're proposing a one-story rear addition. Uh, with, the, with this addition, we aim to provide ADA restrooms to the existing commercial spaces on the first floor and a roof terrace to the existing second floor apartment. Um, as you can see, 65 Spring Street is located within the Soho Cast Iron Historic District Extension. Um, on this site plan, you can see 65 Spring Street at the corner of Spring Street and Lafayette. Um, our proposed rear yard is in the hatch and you can see the, um, the portion of the rear yard that is minimally visible from Lafayette Street through a portion of lot 34. Um, on the left, you'll see the existing um, Spring Street facade. Um, we are not proposing any work to the building's street facade in this application, but a separate master plan application has been approved to create accessible entrances to each store from Spring Street. Um, this is a view from Lafayette Street. Um, the light colored building, uh, brick building you see um, is 63 Spring Street, the, um, the neighbor. Um, the mechanical units and um, black metal gate here are both located within the 63 Spring Street property. Um, these are a few photos of the existing rear yard at 65 Spring Street. Um, you will notice that there is a existing stair to the cellar. Um, and then in photo one, you will also see the existing um, black gate out to Lafayette Street. This is um, the existing plan. Um, so as I noted, this is the existing black gate to Lafayette Street. This is the existing stair to the cellar. This is the proposed cellar plan. Um, we are excavating and to provide a new stair and corridor to the existing cellar. Um, no underpinning will be required in this application for this excavation and stair. Um, on the left, you'll see the proposed first floor plan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these are the two ADA restrooms for the existing first floor um, commercial spaces. Um, and here is the stair down to the cellar. Um, on the right is the, the proposed um, roof plan. Um, there is two roof terraces, 2A and 2B. We have the existing third floor fire escape above, a proposed fire escape stair from the third floor down to the roof level, um, and our common path of egress to the relocated drop down fire escape ladder, which will take the um, the path of egress down to the level of the rear yard. Sorry. Um, in this axonometric, I think it clarifies a little bit the, the path of egress from the third floor existing fire escape down the stair, following the path of egress to the relocated drop down ladder um, to then exit out onto Lafayette Street through that black metal gate. This is the existing um, 63 Spring Street facade. Um, the portion that is visible of 65 Spring is beyond this facade. Um, it is slightly obstructed by the existing mechanical units and black metal gate. This is our proposed facade. Um, as you can see um, beyond, there is the, um, the finish, uh, the brick finish of the addition. Um, with the metal guardrail above and in the background, the um, privacy fence. From the, um, the rear yard, um, you'll notice that this is the existing drop down ladder that is being relocated here. Um, and these sections here are the privacy fence that divide the two roof terraces and provide the common path of egress. Um, this is the area of visibility from the sightline diagrams. Um, I will provide some photos here in a moment of the, um, the other side of Lafayette Street to show the, the extent of what is visible. Three elements will be visible from Lafayette Street, the proposed brick finish on the first floor, the black metal guardrail above, 
and the privacy fences on the roof terrace. Um, on the left, we have a construction tape mock-up. Um, this view is from Lafayette Street. This lowest level is the level of the roof. This next horizontal construction tape level is the level of the guardrail. And the highest point is the level of the six foot high privacy fence. Um, and then on the right, we have a, a rendering of the, of the same location. Um, and finally, these are um, photos from across Lafayette Street showing the, um, the extent to which the, um, the addition is visible um, as you walk down Lafayette Street. Um, and these all show the, the construction mock-up. Um, that's the end of our presentation. We're open to any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions, commissioners? I don't see any questions right now, so we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Great, thank you. So we do have a couple of signups. First, we'll have Connor Allerton from Councilmember Marte's office. And Connor, I'll be promoting you to panelist. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, my name is Connor Allerton. Uh, and I'm presenting testimony on behalf of Council Member Christopher Marte, representing Council District 1 where this application lies. Um, thank you, Chair Carroll and Commissioners for allowing me to testify today. I urge you to uh, reject this application as it's presented today for incomplete materials presented to Manhattan Community Board 2 and for several serious accessibility concerns associated with the proposed rear yard addition. As is stated in the Manhattan Community Board 2 resolution on this application dated May 23rd, 2022, the presentation given to the Community Board by the applicant was incomplete and misleading leading to confusion among the board as to the visibility of proposed additions with no further clarity in the question and answer portion of the presentation. Uh, an incomplete presentation with unresolved questions should raise concern for the commission and warrant a closer look at transparency and honesty of the application as it's moved through the review process. Additionally, our office has received numerous concerns regarding the design of the rear yard addition and the lack of ADA access, particularly for emergency evacuation. We should be using these additions as opportunities to make older buildings such as 65 Spring Street as safe as possible. And this application as it stands today could pose serious dangers to older and disabled residents in an emergency and can significantly hinder rear access to the building uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Uh, for these reasons, I urge the commission to reject this application at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next sign up is Christina Conroy from the Victorian Society. And Christina, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And Christina, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society in New York. Now, admittedly, the view into this oddly configured little courtyard is fleeting for the pedestrian walking by. Nonetheless, the Victorian Society feels that the addition of several new materials in multiple planes will increase the chaotic nature of the space. Now, this would be an inappropriate change whose result will be to diminish the special architectural and historical character of the Soho Castle iron historic district extension. Thank you. Thank you. We do not have any other signups, though I do see a hand raised, James Singletary. And I'll be promoting you to panelists now, if you could please accept my request. And uh, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. I'm sorry, my hand should not have been raised. My apologies. No problem. Okay, so just see if there's any other hands raised. 
uh, there are not any. So um, I'll just note for the record that uh, Manhattan Community Board 2 recommends denial owing to the uh, second incomplete application received and noting the absence of a mock-up of proposed construction um, and also recommending denial based on photos and drawings provided in lieu of a mock-up. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to turn to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments, both the completeness of the presentation to the community board and, um, and also the question about the, the changes in height plane and materials and your view on that within this, this the Victorian society said sort of leading view. Um, and before, but before you do that, I also want to just note that the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission does not um, always require mock-ups for rear yard additions. We do for rooftop additions when there's a question about how, whether or not something is visible and how visible. Um, but in typically in views like this, it's it's not a requirement. Although there is a mock-up uh, being presented to us today, but perhaps you could address the community board's questions. Yes, of course. Um, so some of the community board concerns were um, the presentation lacked um, visuals of the full full area in which the addition would be visible. Um, and to answer those responses and, and comments, we've provided the, the slide that is currently shown. Um, this was not indicated and included in our previous community board application and presentation. Um, but I think this presents a, a, a clear idea of, of the full extent of the visibility of the rear yard from Lafayette Street. Okay, thanks. And do you want to speak to the, the materials again? I know it's a brick addition and then the metal privacy screen, but they are in different planes to allow for the egress and in the view, there seems to be two different heights, but that may be because they're in different planes. That, that's correct. They, the, um, the privacy fence occurs in two different planes. Um, we have tried to simplify the materials. Um, in the rendering, we've shown them a bit brighter so that it is legible, but in reality, the, the black painted guardrail and the privacy fence would be the same color, um, ideally to kind of prevent it from looking like there are multiple planes um, visible from Lafayette Street. I'll, uh, I'll pull up the plan to indicate that the, uh, or to show the multiple planes. So you would see the plane of the guardrail here. You would see a small plane of the privacy fence here and then set back even further. There is this, this plane of the privacy fence as well. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any other final questions? starting to send you requests to unmute so we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion and these are relatively small um, additions that are at the back of one house in from the, the Lafayette, which has a, a very a building that gets very narrow at the edge. So there is a moment between the two buildings where you have a view in and we'll see the side of the additions set back as well as the metal fence and privacy screen above and, um, and the change in the drop ladders. And um, so we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start this one? I'm sure. Um, I'm kind of taken aback by how much opposition there seemed to be in the in the testimony. I think the applicant must have inadvertently ticked somebody off because this I, I don't I don't see the issue here. Um, it, it's visible from uh, the rear additions visible from just this small little narrow gap. I, I, you know, I, I can't even, you know, imagine in what way it's really diminishing the character of the historic district. Um, it's limited and it's certainly not um, obscuring anything. Um, so I, I'm okay with it as it is. Thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree with those comments um, and think that it's appropriate as presented. 
Commissioner Halford Smith. I agree. I think it's appropriate as presented. Commissioner Chapin. I can I can approve it as presented. Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's appropriate. Commissioner Chen. I, I agree with all the commissioners. Commissioner Jefferson. I agree with all the commissioners. Okay, great. So I think we do have a consensus to approve. I think, you know, there may be other privacy or other issues that are, um, have raised concerns, but for the purposes of appropriateness, I think the size and the scale don't overwhelm this building or the adjacent buildings. Um, it's neatly tucked back in with a fleeting view. And I think that the materials are simple, the brick materials and the black metal fences and will actually be a fairly clean line and won't diminish anything in the historic district. So um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you go ahead and make the motion? In the matter of LPC 22-056116, 65 Spring Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District Extension, the application is to construct a rear yard addition. I know that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Soho Cast Iron Historic District Extension. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. That the proposed rear addition will only be visible through a narrow gap in the street wall on Lafayette Street and will be seen within the context of other plain secondary facades and mechanical equipment that filling in this small courtyard surrounded by other buildings within a historic district, which features many full lot buildings, will not detract from the central green space or eliminate a significant characteristic of the historic district. That the presence of this one story addition, which only occupies a limited footprint at the rear of this building will not obscure the historic massing or overwhelm the building. That brick cladding of the addition and dark painted finish of the metal screens and railings will have a utilitarian appearance that is compatible with the building and in keeping with typical installations found in this historic district. And that the proposed work will not diminish the special character of the building or the Soho Cast Iron Historic District Extension. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? No oh, second. Thank you. And Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Sorry about the noise here. Uh, Commissioner Samir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passed. Right, that's approved. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, commissioners. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to the next item. Okay, that is public hearing item number six, LPC 22-09135, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1217, lot one, 165 to 167 West 86th Street, AKA 541 Amsterdam Avenue, the West Park Presbyterian Church individual landmark. This is a Romanesque revival style church complex designed by Henry Franklin Kilburn and built in 1889 to 1890 which incorporated an existing chapel designed by Leopold uh, Eidlitz and built in 1883 to 1885. The application is to demolish the building pursuant to section 25-309B2 on the grounds of hardship. Okay, great, thank you, Corey. And before we begin, I just want to say a few words. Um, I know there is a lot of interest in this application. We have already received a lot of material that has been submitted in advance. I wanna thank everyone who has carefully thought about the presentations through the process to date at the community board and through the materials we've had on the website. And thank everyone who has submitted materials for our use to review. Um, we have shared that with all of the commissioners. And I want to start out today by letting everyone know that this will be a very robust and methodical public hearing process. We um, today will be listening to the presentation. We will also be hearing testimony from the public. And after that, we will close the hearing and the commission will then um, absorb everything that we've heard. We will continue to review all the written materials that have been submitted to us. And I think some commissioners are also going to be making site visits. And uh, we will be 
reading and listening and thinking about everything we hear today and everything that's been submitted. And then we will regroup at a subsequent public meeting in one month uh, to ask questions based on the materials submitted and our site visits and to gather more information before we provide comments. So we will, um, we will do this very methodically and we will keep the public apprised of each step as we move through the process. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Abby, who I think will turn it over to the applicants. Okay, hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Toby, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Um, the project team may begin. Please state your name for the record before you begin. Good morning. Um, my name is Valerie Campbell. I'm a partner in the land use department at Kramer 11. We are land use counsel to the church and to the West Park Administrative Commission. This application asks the commission to determine whether the church has satisfied the extraordinarily rigorous standards set forth in section 20. 5309 subsection 2 of the Landmarks Law for the issuance of a notice to proceed with demolition on the grounds of financial hardship. Specifically, the church must meet the statutory standards applicable to not-for-profits who, one, own a landmark property that no longer supports the purpose of submission of the not-for-profit, and two, have a contract to sell the property to a not-for-profit purchaser that is contingent on a demolition approval. The availability of the hardship application is a necessary and constitutionally required component of the landmarks law, but it is admittedly rare. Since its establishment in 1965, the Landmarks Commission has only considered 19 hardship applications. Some members of the commission may recall that the last successful not-for-profit hardship application approved by LPC was for St. Vincent's Hospital in 2008. Our presentation today demonstrates how the church has met the standards for a hardship application. However, we urge the commission and members of the public to review the application statement and the underlying reports and financial analysis that were submitted with the application in detail. We are confident in our assumptions and analysis and welcome your scrutiny, but it is obviously a very uh, difficult application to sort of summarize in a, what is essentially a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So to summarize the requirements of section 25309 subsection A. First, a not-for-profit applicant must show that it is exempt from real estate taxation and that it is entered into a contract to sell the property which is contingent on the issuance of a notice to proceed with demolition. Second, the applicant must also show that the property would not be capable of earning a reasonable return as such term is defined in the landmarks law. This is definition is a return of 6% calculated on the assessed value of the landmark building. The not-for-profit applicant must also show that the property has ceased to be suitable for its purposes. And finally, the prospective purchaser must show that it intends to demolish the building and construct a new building with reasonable promptness. We thank the commission in advance for its time and consideration, and we look forward to um, your discussion and responding to your questions. Before I turn the presentation over to Roger Lee, the head of the administrative commission, I would like to briefly locate the church and discuss the basis for its designation. The church is located at the northeast corner of 86th and Amsterdam. It is outside of the historic district, which you see outlined in white, and opposite another individual landmark, the Bell Nord, which you see across Amsterdam Avenue. One of the things that the church investigated when it was designated was the possibility of transferring its unutilized development rights to any potential receiving sites. And while there are theoretical receiving sites, as a practical matter, it is surrounded by fully occupied residential buildings and the chances that any of these buildings would take, um, would build a substantial addition on top of an existing building is very remote. Next. On the left, you see an early photo of the church in a more recent um, shot of the church as it exists now. You will notice the sidewalk bridge, which has been up for more than 20 years to protect pedestrians 
from pieces of the facade falling off of the building. Next. West Park looks like a single building, but it is actually two buildings. An earlier chapel built in 1885 was designed by Leopold Edlitz, which is shown on the right. And then the main sanctuary and a unifying facade was designed by Henry Kilborn and constructed in 1889. The church was designated in 2010 and the church opposed designation at that time. And this uh, opposition to designation was largely on, on the basis of the condition of the church and um, the lack of available resources to, to repair it. Roger Leaf will now give a brief description of how the burden of maintaining this building has impacted the West Park congregation and depleted all of its financial resources. Good morning, my name is Roger Leaf. I am chair of the West Park Administrative Commission, which was created by the Presbytery of New York City in January of 2021 to assist the, uh, the congregation of the West Park Church in uh, addressing the needs of its building. Uh, West Park has owned this building for its entire life and is solely responsible for its upkeep. Over the years, it has taken extreme actions to pay building maintenance costs and repairs, including selling all of its other assets and eliminating nearly all of its staff, including its pastor. It has been without a pastor since 2017. The once vibrant congregation has been diminished over time because of the resources that have been consumed by the maintenance of the building that have taken away from its primary mission as a vital congregation on the Upper West Side for over 160 years. At present, it's relying upon loans from the Presbytery of New York City to cover its basic operating expenses for things like insurance and so forth, and also to make emergency repairs to the building. Next slide, please. Uh, after decades of exposure, the building's soft red sandstone facade has become severely degraded and the building has been surrounded by a sidewalk shed for over 20 years. The interior of the building is not in compliance with current fire code, fire safety, and ADA accessibility requirements, and there are currently over 60 open DOP violations on the building. DOB has recently issued violations. This was in November of 2021 relating to the safety of the facade that would cost tens of millions to repair. And the building was closed earlier this year for three months in response to these safety concerns. Next slide, please. Shortly after landmarking, the building was closed. Uh, there was no heat and uh, the building was uh, unusable. Uh, it only reopened after a capital campaign to raise funds for a new boiler and the Landmarks Conservancy provided funds for a new roof over the community house, which is the building on the eastern end of the property. After landmarking officials promised, elected officials promised tens of millions of dollars to restore the building. I think this heavily influenced the landmarking process as it unfolded in 2010, but only $35,000 were ever raised in this effort. In 2016, the church explored a partnership with an arts group hoping that a 501c3 could be more successful in raising funds to restore a building rather than a church, which may have been prohibited from obtaining funds from certain public sources. The center at West Park was created in 2017, but it produced almost no new funding for major repairs. And instead it's below market rent, which is less than a fourth floor walk-up studio apartment in this neighborhood. Was cons has consumed much of the church's limited financial resources. Next slide, please. The Presbytery of New York City is the governing body over all Presbyterian churches in all five boroughs of New York City, which includes over a hundred churches and worshiping communities. Four churches are individually landmarked. In addition to West Park, there is First Chinese on Henry Street, Fort Washington on Wordsworth Avenue, and Riverdale in the Bronx on the Henry Hudson Parkway uh, byway. There are 12 others that are located within historic districts. Uh, it has uh, just three full-time employees and located in a small office, uh, which it shares with another nonprofit. Most of the work is done by unpaid volunteers. 
The entire annual budget of the presbytery is about a million dollars. 10% of that uh, is dedicated to grants to member churches for building repairs. This comes from a board designated fund for that purpose. But if all the assets of the presbytery were dedicated to the repair of this building, it would, it would pay just a fraction of the cost of even the most basic repairs. I would also highlight that the, uh, that because the church is owned by, the, the building is owned by the church, there is no requirement or obligation or even grounds for the Presbytery of New York City to provide funding for these purposes. Next slide, please. When the Administrative Commission was created in January of 2021, we began a long search into or a long investigation into the various ways this property could be repurposed and um, looked at different ways in which we could preserve or retain or restore all or portion of the building. The Administrative Commission immediately recognized that it did not have either the technical expertise or the financial resources to conduct such an undertaking. So we sought out a partner who was experienced in this sort of development work and had a long track history with dealing with the Landmarks Commission. We selected Alchemy as our partner who assisted us in this research and uh, analysis. And on March 3rd of this year, we entered into a contract with them to purchase the building contingent upon the issuance of a demolition permit. Under that contract, Alchemy will construct a new building on the site, but within that building will be 10,000 square feet of space that will be retained by the church for worship, community activities, and an arts program. I'd like to turn it over to Ken uh, to refer to talk to you a little bit more about the team he put together to help us in this undertaking. I believe that um, Ken Horn has not been admitted as a panelist yet. He is listed on the attendees. Um, I don't know if we could give him a minute to be admitted. He should be joining now momentarily. He's okay, thank you. Switched to panelists. Okay, I think I could everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Kenneth Horn, and I'm the president of Alchemy Properties. We are a real estate development firm located in Manhattan. We have uh, done over 30 buildings in New York City over the last 30 years. Uh, many of them, I'm sure you folks know, we just completed the Woolworth building, uh, which was you know, one of the grand dames of um, New York architecture. Spent a lot of time on the facade of that building. Similarly, we are also completing 378 West End, which is the home of the former collegiate school, <clears throat> which also needed landmark approval in order for us to uh, move ahead with the project. Uh, so Roger mentioned that we actually executed a contract in March of 2022, but our involvement in this project really predated the execution of the contract by approximately 14 months. We became involved really in January 2021 when Roger and his team approached us to examine the potential of a readaptive use of the church. <clears throat> we have done many of these readaptive uses in New York of the 30 buildings we've done, about 15 have been ground up, about 15 have been readaptive uses of old buildings in New York. Uh, when we first looked at the building, we brought in a very strong, comprehensive team of facade MD, uh, Rick Lefevre, who really was our facade consultant on the Woolworth building, Severed Associates, one of the most well-known and accomplished structural engineering firms in New York who worked on probably about 15 buildings with us, Leading Builders Group, which is a part of AECOM, one of the largest construction firms in the world, CCI, code consultants to examine the code worthiness of the building, and Dan Kaplan and his team over at FX Collaborative, who have worked on about 15 buildings with us over the last 15 years. 
Our initial desire and initial uh, concept was to figure out a way to use portions of the existing church to build a new building. But as we became more involved in the analysis of the building through Rick's work at Facade MD, Severud, LBG, all the team we put together, we realized that the building was really in horrible condition and that to implement any readaptive use was gonna be both structurally and um, uh, impossible to accomplish. Uh, we spent a good six to eight months examining every conceivable way of using portions of the building, uh, a part of the building uh, to do readaptive use. Uh, but unfortunately, the more we became involved, the more we realized that the cost just to stabilize the building, make the facade safe, make the building code worthy was just impossible to do. Um, I should point out that our firm's reputation is one of working with existing buildings. I'm sure you know we spent over $23 million on the terracotta facade of the Woolworth building. It's impeccably done, very well received. And we did not go into this project even knowing what a hardship application was. We came to the conclusion, however, that because of the safety and because of the impossibility of repairing a sandstone building in its current condition, that the only way to proceed with the church and with our team was unfortunately to take the building down. Um, again, no one on our team took this task lightly. Everyone looked at this and struggled for a good six to eight months to try to figure out readaptive uses. But the condition of the building was such after working with our team that we all concluded that it was really impossible to salvage and to readapt into any particular use that would have any merit and any safety going forward. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to um, uh, Dan Kaplan over at FX um, to you know, review the existing conditions. Uh, thank you, Ken, and uh, good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. My name is Dan Kaplan, FAA Senior Partner at FX Collaborative Architects. Uh, as Ken noted, Alchemy retained us and a team of consultants to assess the condition of the existing church uh, and uh, identify deficiencies. Um, Rick Lefevre uh, of Facade MD will uh, summarize his findings, and then I will return to summarize the structural and code consultant reports. Um, Rick? Good morning, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Rick Lefevre. I'm a professional engineer and the president of Facade MD Architecture and Engineering. Uh, I'm a licensed engineer with 36 years of experience, specializing exclusively in the assessment, preservation, and restoration of facades, primarily here in New York, but also throughout the eastern half of the United States. I prepared the facade assessment for the church, which I will summarize. Uh, I'm glad that Ken made the comment that we walked into this thinking that this was a restoration, uh, unaware of the extent of deterioration. First, I will give you a description of the facade, then I'll explain our methodology, the extent of our probing, types of stabilization, repair, and restoration that were contemplated here, and finally, the extent of restoration and replacement in our report. Regarding the facade itself, the building is a bearing wall construction. It was completed in 1890. Exterior walls are clad in two types of red sandstone. The majority, the field of the walls on the street facing elevations are clad in long meadow brownstone from Massachusetts with a rusticated surface. Detailed trim surrounding windows and in various architectural locations is Lake Superior redstone from Michigan. Sandstone is a sedimentary family of stones consisting of layers of sand and cement deposited over millennia and bonded through pressure and heat into stone. Sandstone was and remains a popular building material because it's soft and it is easily carved and shaped. Our analysis showed that this building sandstone is face bedded, meaning that the stone is set with the layers oriented vertically rather than their natural horizontal orientation. Large portions of stone layers are therefore vulnerable to separation rather than small flakes and fragments as would be typical if the uh, bedding planes were horizontally oriented. Most common mechanism for sandstone deterioration is freeze thaw action. The stone surface is porous, which allows rainwater to penetrate deep into the stone. Each time the temperature passes 
below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, penetrated water expands approximately 8 to 10 percent in volume, which uh, overstresses the surrounding stone, causing pulver pulverization and cracking in the stone. The cracked and pulverized stone material allows additional water into the stone surfaces, aggravating and extending this problem. Unfortunately, the number of times the ambient temperature crosses above and below 32 degrees Fahrenheit in New York City is particularly high, resulting in a large number of frost expansions. Binder materials in sandstone are also susceptible to being dissolved in weak acids, such as our local rainwater with its uh, acidic pH value. This increases the surface porosity of the sandstone, allowing further water uh, infiltration. Our facade analysis methodology, my team was hired to perform a visual analysis of the building exterior from street level and from close range using an articulating boom lift. We came within a few feet of most areas of the street facing elevations, which allowed us to evaluate surface conditions at perspectives that were other, otherwise uh, unavailable. And the extent of deterioration, as you can see from the photographs, was quite surprising and quite alarming. Uh, regarding extent of probing, the extent of stone deterioration that was visibly apparent during our close range examination using the articulating uh, boom lift was so widespread and so significant that we determined probing is, is essentially impractical. We were concerned that removal of stone material beyond small loose fragments, which we removed for safety, would destabilize large amounts of adjacent stone. In our opinion, probing and removal of additional loose and unstable stone material will require far greater access and protection than can be achieved through a boom lift or through suspended scaffolding. Likely pipe scaffolding of the entire street facing elevations will be required. The types of stabilization repair and restoration that uh, we have recommended, available options for addressing deteriorated stone conditions include patching, partial replacement, or Dutchman repairs, resurfacing of individual stones, i.e. rotating the stones to expose the rear surface, and full replacement with either natural stone or a replacement material acceptable to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. It is important to note how our close range analysis showed significant areas of the facade where an accelerating rate of deterioration of the stone was evident. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, concept of the corrosion curve, meaning that once a certain amount of deterioration has progressed, um, that the rate of deterioration will increase at an, at an ever accelerating pace. We know that much of this facade has already undergone uh, dissol dissolving binding in the sandstone delam delamination and other forms of erosion. Regarding the extent in rest of restoration and replacement, our examination identified large areas of deterioration in both the brown rusticated field stone and in the red trim stone. The majority of the street facing walls, as I said, are clad in long fellow brownstone. Casual observation of this stone may create a false impression that it is in good condition, perhaps because the irregularity of its rusticated surfaces, uh, surfaces may aid in hiding defects. Upon closer examination, including physical sounding of uh, limited areas of the ground floor stone, we found significant delamination of the stone surface. As this first floor stone is protected by the side, sidewalk shed and has been uh, protected for the past 20 plus years, it is highly likely that other long stone brown, long fellow brownstone areas with rusticated surfaces, but above the sidewalk shed and therefore more exposed to weathering will prove to be equal, equally delaminated, uh, at least equally delaminated and in need of further repairs. We fully anticipate that additional repair will become clear with, ever close, uh, with every uh, close range access and study. The extent of deterioration in the fine detailed Lake Superior redstone trim has expanded significantly as evidenced by large areas of cracking and deep spalling of this material. Cementitious patch repairs are evident at, at various locations. These patch repairs include, involve troweling repair mortar at deteriorated sandstone areas where loose and unstable sandstone was removed. These patch materials appear to be unstable due to continuing deterioration of the underlying and formerly in good condition sandstone. In each case, it will first be necessary to remove loose and unstable stone material from the exterior walls. 
This will require stable and robust close range access as some of the stone materials to be removed will be heavy and awkward. Once these materials are removed, the, the stable underlying stone materials can be evaluated for further stabilization and reinforcement and all prior uh, repairs and restoration will, be, will also be evaluated. Given the visibly apparent extent of stone deterioration from our boom lift examination, it's highly likely that additional stone repairs beyond the scope outlined in Facade MD's uh, December 13, 2021 exterior repair scope will be necessary. What this means is that the scope outlined should be considered the absolute bare minimum of work to stabilize and repair, to perform stabilization repairs on the facade based on known evidence. It should not be considered a total restoration, nor is it a guarantee that after completing this scope of work, the exterior walls would be in condition appropriate to remove the sidewalk shed. The nature and extent of our repair recommendations include repairs to existing stones where there appears to be sufficient existing material to allow patching and stabilization, and replacement of stone where the integrity of the, exist of the existing stone makes repairs impractical. Our facade report lists the replacement of over 500 individual stone units on the south and west facades alone. It includes removing fragments, repair and replacement of field stone, trim stone, face brick, mortar, window frames, glass and stained glass, terracotta tiles, coping, roof shingles, flashing, and more. All of these is issues and conditions are itemized in our report. The differentiation between repair and replacement is based on our close range visual examination, limited physical examination where possible, and 30 plus years experience in the field. I'm happy to go into further detail as needed during questions later, but for now, I thank you for your time and I will turn it back to uh, Dan Kaplan. Thank you, Rick. Um, I will now summarize the structural engineers and code consultants reports. I will then summarize the resulting cost estimate to bring the building up to a safe, usable, and uh, leasable state. Um, I wish to know we were also retained to study um, alternatives for adaptive reuse and to develop concept design for the proposed building replacement. I'll return to discuss these after Adam Wall presents his section. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Toby. Um, so in October and November of 2021, Severwood Associates, uh, a well-regarded uh, structural engineer based in, in Manhattan, visited the site to assess the structural condition and determine a high level scope for repair. Uh, Mohammed Ruhal from uh, Severud is available for, for questions. Echoing um, Rick's testimony and Facade MD's observation on the exterior wall, um, the sandstone uh, is uh, uh, in a very deteriorated state um, and there's uh, areas of cracked ha and hollow saddle sounding into delaminated surfaces. Um, likewise, um, Severud noted that the uh, uh, gable uh, facade that faced 86th Street was severely out of plumb and opened up a gap between it and the uh, wood framing uh, behind, uh, letting in water and uh, um, uh, the elements. This has been repaired on an emerg or, or stabilized on an um, emergency basis in the uh, intervening months. Next slide, please. Uh, there is extensive uh, uh, evidence of, of cracking, deformation, and, and deflection, uh, all evidence of settlement and, and lateral movement. Next slide. Also evident is water damage from, from structural issues uh, throughout the uh, interior. Next slide. Also in November last year, CCI and National Code Consultancy walked the site and created a report. Um, uh, in a high level summary, the um, uh, building is missing all the fundamentals. Uh, it, it is not sprinklered. Um, the building has open stairs. There's no, there are not two means of egress from uh, significant public assembly spaces. There's no emergency lighting. Next slide. Uh, similarly, with accessibility uh, deficient in all the fundamentals, no accessible route into the building or through the building, no elevators, no toilets, accessible, and of course, no hardware. Next. In this year, so far, next slide, please, Toby. Yes, thank you. In, in this year, so far, uh, the DOB has issued three violations uh, for general spalling, facade deterioration, for the removal of a large finial 
which was was deemed unsafe and and the detachment of the gable that I referenced earlier from from the roof structure it is worth noting that these are on top of the 60 or so open uh, violations next slide so um rick lefevre's report um the structural engineers report the the uh the code report was um all given to uh lbg uh which is a well-known um cm firm based in manhattan that is a subsidiary of ae comma publicly traded uh construction services company they visited the site lbg visited the site read the reports, discussed the findings with the consultants and developed a construction cost estimate. They too are here for uh, available for Q&A. Before I walk you through the summary of the estimate, I wanna make clear what the end product of the proposed renovation and repair and uh, would include. In other words, what, what the, what the um, cost estimate represents. In summary, the costs represent a stabilized core and shell to the minimum level suitable to be leased at market rates to tenants. Significant items include an exterior envelope prepared as described by Rick, brought up to the bare minimum in his words. It, it is worth noting that there would still be significant ongoing maintenance of the continually deteriorating stonework. The structural code and accessibility issues would be addressed. The building's mechanical infrastructure and interior finishes brought up to a white box level so it may be leased for the financial analysis it is worth noting that there is no tenant fit out uh in the uh in the cost estimates next slide so uh here is the high level summary of what is in uh the submission um the facade and roof repair restoration uh just under 18 million dollars the structural repairs, $2.8 million, the code compliance, $1.5 million, and the interior repairs, uh, uh, about $9.6 million. A word on the interior repair line item, this includes a um, new core and shell level of electrical and HVAC infrastructure, a new elevator cut into the existing structure, repair and renovation of the interior walls and ceilings uh, to uh, deal with the water damage. Um, those are the estimated trade costs of the $32 million. In addition, um, there are the emergency repairs. There is the general conditions. Uh, these include costs to run the job, the CM's personnel, field office, and so forth. This is just under 11%, and that is calculated on the trade costs, but also the two line items of the contingencies, the $3.2 million of, of construction and design contingency. Um, insurance, construction management fee at, uh, uh, at uh, $7 million. There, uh, this includes three types of insurance, two are normal coverage for, for construction risks, um, one for the owner and, and one for the other. Uh, for the CM and the third uh, level of, of insurance is to protect against subcontractor default similar to a, to a bond. These total about 13.25%. Also included is the CM fee of about 4%. On top of that is uh, the two contingencies, uh, design and construction. Design is for the normal development of plans and specifications. 10% uh, is modest at this level of conceptual development. Uh, construction contingency is both for the unknowns in construction, hidden conditions examples, and also covers some anticipated escalation in, in the current bidding environment. Also, uh, this is modest. Um, in addition, uh, the, well, that, that totals uh, for $49 million. Yeah. In addition, our soft costs, uh, which uh, Adam uh, has estimated at 22% uh, consistent with uh, the stall case. So this is the work that uh, was the foundation in part for uh, the financial analysis that, that Adam Wald will now go through. Adam? Thank you, Dan. Um, my name is Adam Walden, Executive Vice President at Appraisers and Planners, and our firm was retained to uh, complete the economic analysis component of the hardship application. So the purpose of our report is to determine whether the 6% uh, can be achieved 
following a renovation and reno uh, restoration of the property. Uh, the 6% is per LPC statute. And in developing our analysis, we were guided by the landmarks law and the LPC analysis in the stall matter. So the basic component, components of the economic analysis are to estimate a market rent under three scenarios. Then we estimate stabilized operating expenses for the property under the three scenarios. And including uh, an, an expense for what is a 2% uh, annual allotment multiplied by that 49.7 million uh, that, that Dan previously referenced. Uh, and the next step is to determine the net operating income for the property as renovated and restored. We would note that real estate taxes are not included as a stabilized expense in our analysis um, for reasons for that the property does not achieve a, a positive income, so the, there is no real estate taxes uh, which are generated in the effective tax rate. So we stabilize the net operating income into value using the loaded capitalization rate to determine if a 6% return is possible over the assessment. Next slide. So the analysis is comprised of three scenarios, a, a base scenario, which is a community facility commercial use for the property using its existing square footage and existing building envelope. The second is an infill scenario, uh, which we worked with FXC to maximize all available square footage within the envelope. Uh, and then the third scenario is a multifamily scenario which also seeks to maximize all available footage under the existing envelope. Uh, and under all three scenarios, we are unable to even produce a positive return. Next slide. So for the base and infill scenarios, uh, we relied on six recent leases and two active listings. Um, they, and these uses range from education, religious school, church, museum, and nightclub, all, all uses that uh, church buildings around the city have been repurposed for. The net effect of taking rents range from approximately $32 to $103, but eight of the nine comps are in a, a much tighter range of $32 to $58 per foot. The outlier comp is for a nightclub in Times Square. And we concluded to a market rent of $50 per square foot and we applied that across the square footages for both the base and the infill scenario. Next slide. This is an array of photos of the comparable data that we relied upon developing the base and infill scenarios. So these are landmark properties, so we we'll recognize them. Next slide. So this is the presentation of income and expense analysis for the base and the infill scenarios. Uh, using the $50 per square foot uh, and taking the minimal vacancy and collection loss, we have effective gross income approximately $871,000 in the base and $1,045,000 in the infill. Then with respect to expenses, uh, we have very minimal expenses. The, the concept here is, is that the tenant will, will bear most of the operating costs of the property and that the landlord will have minimal operating expenses such that our operating expense ratio for both of these scenarios is less than 10%. When we get down to the next uh, section is where we apply this 2% depreciated factor from the uh, development costs. So, for the base scenario, it's a million ninety-five thousand. For the infill scenario, it's slightly more because there's additional square footage that is built within the existing envelope, uh, so that the net operating income in the base scenario is essentially negative three hundred thousand, and in the infill, it's negative two hundred thousand. And so this is just a summary of the calculation of the annual depreciated costs. Uh, so it's two percent plus the valuation of the improvements, uh, the improvements 3.1 million, the projected renovation costs uh, for the base scenario and the infill scenario is 51.6 and 53.9. We would note that those numbers include uh, $100 per square foot per tenant fit out under each of the two scenarios. And that number is then multiplied by 2% to get the million 95,000 and the 1.142 million for the infill. Next slide. So this is the multi, the third scenario we did is a multifamily scenario in which we tried to maximize all available square footage. Uh, that resulted in 20 apartments ranging from studios to three bedrooms. Um, and we would note that in this image here, everything that is orange 
is a new window that needs to be punched through the exterior of the building in order to create legal light and air and therefore legal bedrooms in the existing property. And I believe it's over 40 new windows. Um, and our analysis relied upon comparable rentals for other luxury buildings in the Upper West Side. And we also uh, re referenced broader market studies. Next slide. So this is the summary of our um, comparable of, of the rents that we project for the property. Uh, again, this is only a four-story property. So the, the rents range from 3,300 for studios all the way up to 12,000 a month for a two bedroom. Uh, the average rent is essentially $6,300 per unit per month with an average rent of $73 per square foot. But, so this is the presentation of the income and expense uh, under the residential scenario. Uh, we have an effective gross income of essentially 1.5 million. And what we want to draw your attention to is that the payroll we estimate for this building is uh, only $100,000 per annum, which is generally a, considered a skeleton crew of a, a maybe one to one and a half employees for a building like this. However, the rents that we estimated, we largely relied on doorman type properties. So the argument could be made that the payroll could even be several hundred thousand dollars more. Um, the expenses we have are only $275,000 per annum. And from the 1.22 million uh, uh, NOI, we then deduct the amortized development costs under the residential scenario. This 1.27 million is greater than the base in the infill scenario because the cost to develop the residential scenario is uh, nearly $10 million more. And again, we show that the net operating income is negative, negative $50,000 approximately. Next slide. This is just a presentation of the uh, depreciation calculation under the residential scenario or the multifamily scenario. 2% uh, multiplied by 60.4 million and plus the improvement assessment and get an annual depreciated figure of 1.27 million. Next slide. So in all three scenarios, uh, negative net operating incomes are what we uh, established. And again, this does not include real estate taxes as an expense. And a positive return cannot even, the 6% return cannot even be calculated because we don't even have a positive uh, net operating income. Yes, I think that's the end. Okay. Thanks, Adam. And I'll just finish up here. So. Um... If, if I just want to uh, outline uh, uh, two things, uh, the residential conversion and partial demolition alternatives we looked at, and then also uh, the replacement uh, building. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, in this scenario one, which is really Adam's multifamily scenario that he just went through, would we convert the existing buildings to residential use? Uh, next slide. Um, the uh, uh, issues that uh, we uncovered is that uh, we would uh, need to cut in uh, an inner court uh, uh, to allow for legal windows uh, and, and in addition to a, uh, an extended rear yard, um, we need to uh, 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 create uh, four new floors of uh, uh, structure to um, create the uh, floor area. Um, as Rick said, you know, the facade is in, in dire straits and to create a new, uh, you know, a, a renovated multifamily uh, um, structure here, we would almost certainly need to have a significant, if not complete replacement of, of, the, of the stone. And there'd be uh, an extensive number of new windows cut into the existing facade. If you go to the next slide, please, you'll see on the left, the existing footprint of the building and on the right, um, uh, the, with the green line where we would actually have to cut into the existing structure to um, get legal windows for the for the uh, basically the north uh, facing uh, half of, of the uh, floor plate. Next slide. This shows where um, new floor slabs would be um, inserted into the existing shell. Um, so we selected these elevations either uh, at their existing floor lines or um, where strategically we can get as much windows as possible. If we go to the next slide, 
um, the as Adam referenced, the orange here are the um, proposed uh, new windows that would either be cut in or put in behind the existing arches. Um, there are 69 uh, street uh, uh, facing windows and 44 inward facing windows. Uh, the degree that the extent that this is appropriate or not is uh, questionable, but um, this is what it would take to physically create the apartments behind uh, uh, the existing facade. Next slide, please. The second thing we looked at uh, was a uh, 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 partial demolition scenario where the parish house is demolished, uh, a new residential building is constructed in its place and the sanctuary is, is renovated. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, the, the two buildings would have to be separated. And as I said, the parish house demolished, um, the sanctuary would be renovated and used as a community facility. Uh, the new residential building that would be constructed, which I'll show you in a moment would be, um, costly, complex, and we yield um, very small and efficient floor plates and a, and a total of approximately 32,000 square feet. Um, and uh, as in the other scenario, the existing remaining facade would need to be substantially, if not completely, uh, uh, replaced. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so as Val referenced in the very beginning, uh, the building is really two buildings with the parish house on the right and the sanctuary on the left. In this scenario, the parish house would be demolished and the, and the orange or a salmon color would be the result in floor plate uh, of, of uh, about uh, 22, uh, 2,285 square feet. 2,285 square feet. And you can see how the core takes up the majority of or a significant portion of, of that floor plate. If you go to the next slide, um, it shows what the three-dimensional result of that would be with uh, a, a small floor plates uh, next to the church. And to try to eke out as much uh, usable floor air as possible, uh, uh, a cantilever scheme resulting in 3,100 square foot uh, floor plates. Um, the result is, uh, you know, uh, as I said before, 32,000 square foot inefficient, 58% efficient, uh, which is very low for this, this building type um, building. Um, I would also note that um, this site is subject to the sliver law. And because we're less than 45 feet wide, uh, we cannot use the full height of the building. If we could, if you go to the next slide, we could result uh, for, go from a 13 story to a 19 story building. This would require a BSA waiver and result in uh, approximately 20,000 more square feet. So switching gears um, to the uh, uh, proposed replacement building scheme. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the proposed uh, replacement building would be uh, as of right. Um, the site uh, on the right is uh, in the salmon color, 75 feet frontage on Amsterdam, 125 feet frontage on West 86th Street. It's a little over a 10,000 square foot lot, um, a 10 FAR um, uh, uh, ratio, yielding a little bit over 100 thousand square feet of, of zoning floor area to be put on the site. Um, it is worth noting that this is contextual zoning, which means you have floor, uh, street walls going up to between 125 and 150 feet, a 10 foot setback with a maximum height of 110 feet. Next slide. So here is the uh, massing in, in context. Uh, so uh, you could see the um, street walls uh, uh, basically at the same height of the cornice of the adjacent buildings on Amsterdam and uh, West 86th Street, the maximum height of uh, 210 feet uh, with the 10 foot setbacks and two sets of dormers, one on, on 86 and one on Amsterdam, really creating the transition between the two. It is worth noting that the 210 feet is basically the height of the buildings across 86th Street and certainly lower than the building at the corner of 87th and Amsterdam. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a view looking uh, east on, on West 86th Street. Uh, 
it shows the massing I described with the street walls uh, marrying with the cornice lines of the adjacent building and then the maximum height of uh, uh, 210 feet and the dormers creating the transition between the two. It also, while the design is really conceptual in nature and very preliminary, it, uh, it conveys the uh, intention and ethos of the building of to create something that's contextual, individual windows, highly textured, uh, masonry facades, uh, and really something that was a well-crafted uh, uh, contextual building. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a view from uh, West 86th Street, um, uh, showing again the masonry facade and, and uh, on the left-hand side at the ground floor uh, is a small retail space in the center is uh, uh, the residential entrance and then the five brown um, or bronze uh, storefronts are views into the West Park uh, community facility, which I'll talk about in a moment. Next slide. So uh, this is the uh, Amsterdam view of the base, uh, again, conveying um, the uh, attitude and ethos of the building with uh, a brick masonry, cast stone, limestone uh, facade, uh, individual windows, uh, well-crafted, attention to shadow um, and texture. On the right is uh, the um, retail space and on the left is would be the entrance to uh, the West Park um, Church uh, Community Center, which is a 10,000 square foot uh, community facility proposed. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. Next slide. Uh, the plan at grade, the blue is the, is the, the West Park uh, community facility. It's 10,000 total square feet, 4,000 at grade and 6,000 below grade. The yellow would be the residential lobby on West 86th Street and then uh, a small retail uh, space on the corner of Amsterdam and 86. Next slide. The residential floors, uh, as I said before, the contextual zoning requires street wall continuity. So the, the building goes up to the street walls uh, and faces primarily the street, creating an ample uh, rear court um, uh, for, for legal light and air. Next slide. Uh, this is, these are test fits of the uh, community facility. Um, the intention is to create a flexible um, space for both religious use and, and arts use uh, at the site, continuing what is on uh, the use that's on the site today. Um, this would be a um, uh, you know, a modern contemporary uh, performing arts space with all of the uh, associated support spaces, green rooms, uh, meeting rooms, uh, and, and so forth. Next slide. Uh, this conveys the uh, sort of um, the spirit of, of that facility. Um, again, something that's flexible, something that's suitable for religious services, that's suitable for arts, something that uh, contributes to um, the streetscape of the neighborhood. And with that, I'll turn it over to Valerie Campbell, who will summarize. Thank you. Um, good afternoon now. Um, we are available for questions or um, if the commission prefers, we can, uh, you know, we can certainly do public testimony and do questions at a, a later time. Thank you. I think we will move to testimony. We have a number of people signed up. Um, we may have some preliminary questions after that. I, I, I'm not sure. We'll see how that goes, but we certainly won't get into substantive questions today. So um, why don't we now move to our public testimony portion of the hearing. And um, for the public, if you would like to speak, please identify yourself by raising your virtual hand so that we can identify you. As always, we start with anyone who signed up in advance and then we get to everybody else. So we will work methodically through the list of people who have signed up. Um, but even if you signed up in advance, please raise your hand so that we can find you in the, the long list of attendees. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Sonia, Sonia Gior, Lisa Kersavage, our executive director to take us through the testimony today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I am going to start with Council Member Gail Brewer.
Okay, council member, I've brought you in. I'm all set. Thank you. I hope you can hear me, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, I am yeah. Gail Brewer. I am the council member. You know that I am one thousand of preserving this red park terrace building. I am marked by me. Council member, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're you're very broken up. Okay. Um, well, I don't know what to do because this thing is not working. So. I tell you what, take somebody and else. Now we, can, now we can hear you, though. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Anyway, I'm Gail Brewer. I'm the Manhattan Borough President, and I am very much in support of preserving the West in Church in 2010. Council member, you're still breaking up. Can you face? Uh, turn no, it doesn't. Right. There's something wrong with it. I'll switch. Go ahead and take somebody else, and I'll switch to my cell phone because I don't know what's wrong with this thing. So take somebody else. Okay. 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 Okay, next I'm gonna call Tyler Reynolds, Reynolds, Assemblymember Rosenthal. Okay, Tyler, I've brought you in. Thank you, everybody. I hope everyone can uh, hear me. Um, yes. Thank you. Please um, state your name for the record. Yeah, the uh, church is actually right on the opposite side of the street from where the assembly Tyler, member. Tyler, I'm sorry. Could you state your name for the record? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. My name is Tyler Reynolds. I'm the community liaison for assembly member Linda Rosenthal. Yes, and the church actually falls on the opposite side of the street where our district ends. Um, but we still felt the need to come and provide testimony for today uh, just because the church is, you know, 10 feet outside of our district doesn't mean that we don't care about the church and the importance it has uh, to the to all of the Upper West Side and all of New York City. The original sanctuary, the original church that was built, the architect also designed um, or did the redesign, I should say for the New York State Capitol and specifically designed the assembly chamber where of course uh, Linda spends a lot of her time working. So the church has um, a lot of meaningful value to the assembly member. 13 years ago, um, she gave testimony uh, to the commissioners um, and was in favor of landmarking and we're here today to say that the church should stay a landmark. Um, Alchemy has offered to buy the church for $33 million. Um, and they're not the only offer that has come in to buy the church. The center at West Park has brought in a less lucrative offer um, to buy the church. Um, and with the and the center has offered to maintain the church as it is and keep it as a successful reuse as a performance center. So complete demolition is not the only option on the table for the church. And if the church changed hand to a nonprofit, it opened the doors for new revenue streams from public funding and private funding as well. Um, I'll submit the rest of the assembly members written testimony. Um, that way it can be reviewed uh, fully by the commissioners. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, and the next person, um, Reverend Kay Carpin from Community Board 7. And I would just remind everybody, please do state your name for the record. Um, and because we have a very large group of people speaking, limit your comments to three minutes. Okay, Reverend Carpin. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be uh, hopefully brief. 
we considered this application at length, both in our preservation uh, committee uh, meeting and in the full board spending hours, uh, meetings that drew hundreds of participants and uh, met dozens of uh, testimonies. I wanna start by saying that we appreciate the presentation and we recognize that the hardship process is an integral part of Landmarks Law. Still the majority of Community Board 7 feel that there are still uh, open areas of inquiry, potential alternatives to demolition, and other, um, other options that warrant the denial of the application. They include the possibility of transfer of the ownership uh, of the church and community house to a not-for-profit entity that's already been raised, um, to ease fundraising, concerns over uncertainties arising from the computation of the estimated rate of return presented in the application, and existence of uh, al architectural alternatives to demolition. And given the irreversible finality of the total demolition of the church building, and the heavy burden to be met on an application for such demolition, we felt that the applicant has not met the heavy burden of proof required for such an application. And therefore, Community Board 7 resolved that uh, to uh, disapprove the application as presented to us. I wanna note that the vote was not unanimous. The final vote was 24 <clears throat> to deny the application, 13 to approve it and seven abstentions. Overall, I wanna say that we're sympathetic to the situation of the congregation and the challenge of caring for this landmark with very limited resources. And if the applicant for hard, application for hardship is not successful, we understand that it's then incumbent on our community and the city to lend aid in whatever way we can to the restoration of this building to a far greater extent that has then has been forthcoming over the last 10 years, 12 years. And personally, I'll note that while I'm a preacher and not an engineer, I know uh, quite a lot about caring for uh, aging church buildings. So I spent a lot of time crawling around the attic and I found the structure surprisingly intact. But the facade is another matter um, and it is indeed crumbling and I'm not sure what could be done about that. I wanna close by expressing the feeling of the majority of our community board that this building is a unique and inspiring part of our neighborhood and that its demolition would be a tremendous loss for our community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna try again, um, Council Member Brewer. Thank you very much. I think you can hear me now. Yes. All right. So I am Gail Brewer. I am the city council member for the Upper West Side. And I am very much support of preserving the West Park Presbyterian Church. I was the one with other support who landmarked it in 2010 when I was in the city council previously. And I urge the commission strongly to reject the hardship application submitted by the owners. Um, Reverend Carpen, who just spoke, representing Community Board 7, uh, expressed uh, my concern much better than I could. But I want to say this is exceptional thing. It's in a prominent location, and I think it's a unique example of religious uh, uh, architecture. And it's been there for 132 years. It's been a refuge in its role as a house of worship and an inspiration for historically important social movements. We all know that there are fewer people in our congregations. In 2010, Gallup found that only 47% of a synagogue or a mosque. But I want to point out that at this particular church, there were not a lot of parishioners even before the landmarking. And I want to point out that as we speak, there is, however, a group of people who do worship in this structure, in addition to the wonderful cultural activities that take place. So one of the issues that has to be addressed is cease to be suitable for current use. There is a lot of current use that is relevant to the church. 
when I was a borough president from 2018 to 2021, we had a lot of discussions about religious institutions meeting challenges. And we published a zoning book on this topic. And I want to say that one of the lessons we learned is it is really important to be vigilant as a society when religious landmarks are threatened because they are readily adaptable, but they're threatened because they're adaptable to alternatives when they um, are original. And we have a nonprofit that is in there every day. So the walls are not falling down on top of anybody. I think what Reverend Carpenter said is correct. The outside needs a lot of work, but the inside could be restored quite easily. And I wanna talk about the funds because that is what people talk about all the time. We just finished the budget in the city of New York. I have to be honest, I allocated personally to museums, to nonprofits, to the parks. If this building, and this is what it has to be done is, owned by a nonprofit, partially or completely. In other words, if the sanctuary stayed as the church and the parish house stayed as the same height, but was converted to a nonprofit, then the nonprofit could receive millions of dollars that could take care of the roof and the uh, parish house. So don't tell me that that's not possible. Look at the Elbridge, the museum at Elbridge Street, the most beautiful restoration ever. And we all know that they did it with public and private funding. The uh, sanctuary continues to be used, as we all know, by the congregants. There's a, a memorandum of understanding. And the museum, which does get federal, state, and city money, was restored with public and private money. The Museum of Manhattan is to Mission Science Church on 96th of Central Park West. And they budget, we just gave them millions of dollars and they raised millions of dollars and they're restoring it beautifully, repurposing to an amazing museum. It's possible. So I wanna be clear. I know you heard from Ms. Campbell about some of the issues regarding the uh, hardship application. I believe that all of them have to be met because the word and is in there. And I don't think they are all, I would also be with Reverend Carpenter, much as I have respect for Adam Wald as a member of community board number eight and I appointed him, I wanna be clear. Um, I don't think that, I, I just don't know that his calculation is one that everybody would agree with regarding the 6% return not possible to make. I wanna, I wanna um, point out also, uh, because of all of our publicity, a church has come forward with lots of money that would like to buy the building. And we're meeting with them next week. After we did an exhaustive search for a purchaser, I don't know. But I do know that we've had that kind of call. And I do know that with a nonprofit entity similar to the one established at Elder Street, this church could be restored, purchased by a nonprofit and or a church, city, state, and federal money and private money could make sure that it is restored to its beauty. So I wanna to say to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, to bear large responsibility to require some applicants as Secretary to meet the highest bar in justifying their request to destroy, to destroy an exceptional historic and religious landmark. I believe strongly their application fails to meet that burden and should be denied. And I want to point out that this quote unquote new building, which with all due respect, is ugly. It doesn't have one unit of affordable housing. And there are Koreans who are quite upset about that. Not a lot of ministers, obviously, and religious leaders in general are usually supportive of landmarking. Even that has upset people because this building has absolutely no affordable housing and we get told not possible. Everything is possible. Um, I also wanna point out there are the ministers who do support have come forward and said, Gail, make sure that this hardship is denied. Presbyterian ministers. Thank you very much. I feel passionately about this. And I hope that as we suggest and you're all day long, that this building continues to stand because I don't think their application meets the burden of hardship. Thank you very much. Please deny it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Council Member Brewer, please submit your, your written comments, please. 
sorry. And um, as a reminder to everybody, even if you've signed up, please do raise your hand and um, please make sure that your name is your actual name. I see some Zoom users uh, with their hands raised and it makes it hard for me to identify you and whether you've signed up. So please do change your name if you can. Um, I'm going to call Laura Jervis next. Okay, Laura Jervis, you've brought in. You've been brought in as a panelist. You just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. My name is Laura Jervis. I urge you to vote in favor of the hardship application. I was a parish associate minister at West Park from 1975 to 1991 and a participant in the opposition to landmarking in 2008-2010. During my time at the church, I was knowledgeable and participated in the many efforts to maintain the building, including spending down the endowment for repairs, <clears throat> selling two manses, and most recently unable to financially support a minister. You will hear from opponents of the hardship application that the members of West Park intentionally neglected the building. Nothing can be farther from the truth. When West Park was landmarked by the commission in 2010, against the wishes of the church, promises were made to raise enough funds from the community for the church's restoration and safety concerns to be addressed. Sufficient funds were not forthcoming. The current response has been that many foundations do not give to religious organizations. Surely those who pledged adequate funding knew of these restrictions in 2010. Nevertheless, the leadership of West Park sought out partners to share the burden of the building. Several organizations studied the building closely, including private schools. We were very close to an arrangement with a well-endowed school until their trustees, after continued study, rendered the verdict that the risk to the school's endowment was too great to move forward due to structural unknowns. We continued to look for solutions. I remember meeting with Tom Vitula Martin of Blessed Memory on several occasions. In favor of landmarking, he tried valiantly to help us consider other options, but we, he and I and others could not find them. There is now a plan to rede redevelop the corner of Amsterdam and 86th Street, a plan that will allow the church to continue to be a church, which is its right to provide space for a mixed and vibrant arts venue, and to provide funds to assist other small churches in the five boroughs. And yes, there will be market rate housing due to the constraints of the site and the commitment for community space. In this instance, knowing that funds are in hand for other iliomocenary purposes, I urge you to support this hardship application. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, another person that signed up, um, got your hand up, but I'm gonna call you Jack Green. I'm going to promote you to as a panelist. Okay, Jack Green, I've brought you in as a panelist. You just need to unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you choose. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jack Green. Um, I signed up to testify today uh, as uh, both a Presbyterian, belongs to another church here in the city, and also as a new neighbor of the West Park um, building. Um, I want to focus my comments today on the um, immense value and um, benefit that the Presbyterian churches here in New York City provide. And I focus on that because of the um, 
of the money that will be going uh, as a result of the sale to benefit those churches and the programs that they support. Um, there are um, 89 Presbyterian um, Presbytery churches throughout the city. They provide invaluable um, support, uh, both direct support through um, homeless shelters, assistance to homeless people, feeding programs. They provide space for um, for uh, addiction programs and other immensely valuable programs. Um, my own uh, church, First Presbyterian Church here in Manhattan, um, provides space um, for a number of different schools, including an autistic school. Um, the, the, the other thing I wanna emphasize is that um, as a lawyer, I, I look at what has actually happened versus what uh, people talk about happening. And I see since the landmarking was, um, was done, that the history teaches that it is just not possible, um, feasible to, to take this building as it stands now and convert it into other uses. The proposal will create a, 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 a nexus of community engagement, a fresh opportunities for arts, a new rebirth of the West Park um, congregation, okay freed from the burden of having to take care of the, the museum piece that it inherited. And so I urge the commission to, uh, to grant the hardship exception. Um, I am a big fan of the landmarks system, but I think in this case, the, the burden for um, granting the exception has been met. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next, I'm going to call Nathaniel Christian. Hey, Nathaniel, I've brought you in as a panelist. Just need to unmute yourself, turn on your camera. Let's see, Nathaniel Christian, are you here? Ask you to unmute. I, I'm sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay, great, uh, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the commission. My name is Nathaniel Christian, and I'm speaking in support of West Park's hardship application. Uh, I am the chair of the board of trustees of the Presbytery, I am a, I'm a volunteer and all of the members of the board of trustees of the presbytery are volunteers and we are we are fiduciaries and we are we are tasked with overseeing the finances of the presbytery as the presbytery seeks to serve the needs of the over 90 presbyterian churches in new york city and based on my eight years of experience working with churches such as west park i can attest to the fact that the issues that it is facing are not unique and are not manufactured the declining membership, declining resources, and deferred maintenance and rising costs have led many churches in our presbytery to seek to find new ways to serve their communities in a sustainable, a sustainable way. And in this time when so many of our citizens are struggling for the right of self-determination, the current landmark status of West Park has robbed this congregation of the right to worship God and to serve its community as it sees fit. And the denial of this application would also prevent West Park from making donations that would serve the communities all over the city where so many of our churches, which are struggling to maintain the services that they provide to the food insecure, the homeless and the racially and socially marginalized. The current plan is to put the net proceeds of any sale into such a restricted fund for those purposes. I'm new to this process of community board and commission meetings, but I must say that I was, I was saddened uh, when I attended the recent community board seven meetings to hear some well-meaning people twist the facts of this application to suit their politics. And all of us have observed recently how, how destructive effects can be made on our democracy when facts are denied and twisted to serve politics instead of having political processes and outcomes adjusted to address the facts. 
The fact is that promises of support that are now being made are similar to promises that were made 12 years ago and that were not kept. And why would one believe that those promises would be kept now? I now know we can move forward together as community on this issue. West Park is committed and has shown it is committed to continued sustainable service to its community and to the greater New York City community. I, I ask that you assist it by approving its application. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next, I'm going to call Michael Hiller. Michael, I've brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself, turn your camera. Can you hear me okay? Yes, just a word of warning, you're sideways though. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Is that better? I can't see yes. myself in the picture. Oh, there I am. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry, my, uh, my internet is out today, so I'm using my phone. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Michael Hiller, Hiller PC. I represent the center at West Park and other members of the community, and we stand in opposition to the hardship application. The subject building was at the time of its designation just 12 years ago, identified as one of the most, uh, one of the Upper West Side's most important buildings. And notwithstanding the size of the submission by the applicant and the purported grounds upon which it is based, uh, the truth is that the, upon close inspection, those grounds are virtually non-existent. I intend to use my time today to, for the purpose of providing an overview of the testimony to, to the commission that you can expect to hear today from those in opposition and just offer a few points of emphasis as I uh, ask you to uh, focus on them. I'll begin by agreeing with Ms. Campbell on one point. The standard for granting a hardship application is, in her words, extraordinarily rigorous. The first element is the rate of return. Uh, the assessed value of the building is less than $3.5 million. That would typically be the number against which the rate of return analysis would be considered. The center has offered $3.5 million, the full assessed value to purchase the building with no finance contingency. The center offers also, an offering also includes language that per would permit the congregation to continue using the building and also would allow the congregation to participate in the sale of air rights, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. The, that Alchemy may have offered more money is irrelevant insofar as a reasonable return on investment does not equate to the best and most lucrative turn on, return on investment. Now, if the building is not going to be sold, but instead is going to be rented, then using uh, the 6% statutory minimum rate of return would, be ha would have to be measured against the $3.5 million, which basically means 6% times $3.5 million or $210,000 a year. As you'll hear from David Feinhirsch later today, there is no question that the subject uh, building can generate more than $210,000 per year. Fully aware of this fact, it appears the applicant, in order to supplement that $3.5 million baseline number, has added repair estimates in the amount of $50 million approximately. Commissioners, we have engaged WJE engineers and Slocum Consulting, both of which consult, uh, performed multiple site inspections and visits and have performed a preliminary cost estimate for the repair of the building. You will hear from them that the $50 million figure is wildly overstated. Among the most egregiously exaggerated figures are the facade repair and structural repairs. I will leave it to WJE and Slocum to explain why those numbers are wildly exaggerated. What appears to have happened is that the applicant, which obviously has a substantial interest in establishing hardship here, has prepared an estimate not based upon merely repairing the building, but upon the most expensive comprehensive method of renovating it inside and out. There seems to be a dedicated effort to exaggerate the expenses so as to increase the cost basis in order to make it seem as if the building could never generate a profit. And once it's clear that the applicant's submission exaggerates expenses, it calls into question the integrity of the entire application, including each of the allegations that comprise it. You will also hear from representatives of the center at West Park. They will confirm certain critical facts. First, they will confirm that the building is in active use as a cultural arts facility. In addition, as confirmed by Ms. Campbell on behalf of the applicant at page 13 of the submission, the subject building continues to be rented out on an occasional basis as a congregational facility for use by religious organizations. Thus, the building is in active use as a cultural art facility and a spiritual congregation. One representative of the applicant mentioned earlier that he was going to discuss structural repairs necessary to restore the building to a, quote, leasable state. Commissioners, the building's already being leased. It does, it does it require repairs? Certainly. But is it dangerous? Is it about to collapse? 
course not. If it can be used on an occasional basis as a congregational facility, it can be used for the very purpose for which it was built and acquired. And when a, bu a building, when a building constructed for charitable purposes can be continued to be used for those purposes, there can be no finding of hardship. Lastly, you are going to hear evidence that the owner has allowed the building to fall into disrepair without exploring the multiple options available to raise the money and maintain it. I'll give you a few examples. First, you'll hear from George James, a well-respected and well-recognized ozone expert in New York City. The building has 85,000 square feet of usable air rights that can be transferred to neighboring buildings under zoning resolution 74-79. Ms. Campbell claims that the possibility of selling the air rights is quote, extremely remote because she says the neighboring buildings wouldn't be interested. Respectfully, Ms. Campbell's opinion about what surrounding buildings might or might not do if approached does not constitute evidence, much less substantial evidence to avert hardship. In fact, Mr. James confirms that six of the seven buildings qualify. Six of the seven neighboring buildings qualifying under 7479 could acquire 45,000 square feet of air rights and that each of the buildings has the available space to accommodate those 45,000 square feet. At $300 a square foot, that represents over $13.5 million, which is more than enough money to perform all the repairs necessary to restore the building. Mr. Zakai of my office will identify the prior decisions of the commission in which failure to market air rights constitutes evidence of a self-imposed hardship. And if there's a self-imposed hardship, the, uh, the application must be denied. I'll lastly mention that the Presbyterian denomination here is part of a larger church, which has over $700 million in assets. There is no evidence that the owner has requested grant money from its exceptionally well-funded parent order. It is quite simply as if the owner has dedicated itself to avoiding the solutions necessary to address the maintenance problems at the building rather than resolving them. I see that this is not a hardship, ladies and gentlemen. It is an opportunity for the developer to throw a ton of money at this building to generate money necessary to build luxury housing, not affordable housing. And in the meantime, we are at the precipice of losing a building that the commission indicated was among the most important on the Upper West Side. I will say this, the commission can always deny this application without prejudice and afford the owner and the community and Gail Brewer, Jerry Nadler and all those public officials who support this building, the opportunity to provide the funding necessary to restore it. But if this hardship application were to be denied, the building is gone forever. So I urge the commission to pay close attention to each of the, uh, the oppositions that you hear today. I thank you so much for the additional time and I'm available for any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next we have um, Jason Zakai. And I would remind people, please state your name for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Jason, I've brought you in. And um, after Jason, we'll have Susan Sullivan. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Zakai. I am an attorney from the law firm Hiller PC. We represent the center at West Park and members of the community in opposition to the hardship application. I'd like to address LPC precedent and case law relating to hardship applications under section 253092 of the landmarks law. One of the requirements of a hardship application is to establish that the building would not be capable of earning a reasonable return if the applicant were not tax exempt. This commission as well as the courts have made clear that such inquiry is subject to vigorous scrutiny. One such example is the St. Bartholomew's Church case in 1985, in which this commission denied the hardship application and the federal courts thereafter affirmed. The court held that if an applicant relies upon the cost of repairs and renovations, its estimates must be credible and persuasive. The applicant cannot simply maximize the cost of the estimates of the greatest defensible extent or show a bias in favor of demolition rather than rehabilitation of the landmark building. The legal case uh, site for that is 728 FSUP 958, SCNY 1989. The same concept was also applied by this commission more recently in 2014. That was the matter of Stahl York Avenue, 429 East 64th Street and 430 East 65th Street. And the docket number for that was LPC 127519 from May 29, 2014. 
The commission denied the hardship application for failure to establish that it was not capable of earning a reasonable return. The federal court in Stahl made clear that the commission is not to blindly accept an applicant's assumptions. And then the state court, the appellate division held that the commission rationally rejected the applicant's cost approach in finding capability of reasonable return. In finding that there was no capable of reasonable return. Another requirement of the hardship hardship provision is establishing that the building has ceased to be adequate, suitable, or appropriate for the owner's devoted use. In St. Bart's, the court determined that the church building therein was adequate for use because the church was able to rent out some of its space to area businesses. The court rejected the applicant's assertions that it could not afford to expend money to keep the building in good condition. Because the church did not provide the commission with any financial projections, this was fatal to the claim of prospective financial hardship. In addition, the commission has separately recognized that self-imposed hardships are contrary to the letter and spirit of the landmarks law, and thus do not qualify for approvals for a hardship. Installed, the applicant's self-imposed hardship contributed to this commission's denial of the hardship application. The commission found that the applicant had consciously decided not to rent out empty apartments, and the costs associated with that were a self-imposed hardship. And on appeal, the court agreed. Related to self-imposed hardship, the commission also made clear in style that the LPC may consider factors such as the possibility of selling unused development or air rights, and the applicant's failure to pursue such opportunities to generate a reasonable return could result in the denial of the hardship application. The commission faulted the applicant in style for never trying to sell its development rights, since such rights, quote, have significant value. Similarly, in St. Bart's, the court found that the church failed to consider either the possibility of a capital fundraising project or the possible sale of the church's air rights to a nearby building. Since I have limited time, I refer the commission to Hiller PC's written submission, which shows how such precedent I have just discussed applies to the facts of this application and this applicant's proposal. We submit that the application has failed to meet the stringent requirements of the landmarks law based upon LPC and case law precedent. And we respectfully ask the commission to reject, reject this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Susan Sullivan. Susan, I'm Judy Miran. And I would just take this time to remind everybody to raise your hand, even if you signed up and you'd like to speak. And the next, Following Susan will be Zachary Tomlinson. Hello, I'm Susan Sullivan. I've been an advocate of historic preservation since I was a 13 year old, the youngest member of the Hull Historical Society in Hull, Massachusetts, a town founded in 1640. When I moved to New York, we chose to live in the village because of its beauty and relevance as an historic district. When my family outgrew our apartment on Greenwich Avenue, we looked throughout the city. While searching on the Upper West Side, the first sight of this stunning red stone church on the corner of 86th and Amsterdam sealed the deal. It was majestic. The very bones of this building told the story. In 2004, when Presbytery first planned to raise West Park, we founded Friends of West Park. Our entire community fought for its designation as a landmark. It took seven long years. We didn't give up and we succeeded. Now, 10 years later, the Presbytery is back again poised to make a $30 million windfall by raising a landmark building that embodies the legacy of the Upper West Side social activism and stands as a guardian of our past. Today, this building remains a vital part of the Upper West Side. Not only has the center at West Park succeeded in having a created, very creative adaptive reuse for the building with our vibrant performing arts center, but also continues as a place for religious congregation although not Presbyterian. Every Sunday, the Lighthouse Chapel worships at West Park. What purpose is to be served by demolishing this building? The prospect of allowing a developer to destroy this precious landmark and replace it with yet another market rate, high rise luxury building is absurd. If the, if the commission allows this petition, it will turn our landmark preservation law on its head, setting a dangerous precedent that will ripple across the landmark landscape. So let's get to the money. This hardship case is based on the Presbytery's documents that pronounce West Park should be demolished because it is essentially derelict. That is not true. West Park is structurally sound. Our insurance carry inspects the building annually and affirms that conclusion. 
What is true is the presbytery has knowingly and with intent failed to maintain a building they had an obligation to do so as the owner of a landmark. The highly exaggerated cost cited by the presbytery assumes that all restoration will be done in one fell swoop. Everyone knows that is not how historic restoration is usually done. Most important, such an assertion plays into the false narrative that West Park is derelict. WJE, our engineering firm, asserts that West Park is in, asserts that West Park is not in such disrepair that a phased restoration is untenable. Finally, the Presbytery's claim undermines confidence in the landmark laws and affirms that the Presbytery's only goal is to make a killing by delivering an empty lot to alchemy properties. Just as in 2004, we have no intention of backing down. Our community is going to fight for this landmark. Our numbers, both in terms of financing the purchase of the building and our support in the community is growing citywide every day. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, Zachary Tomlinson. And Zachary will be followed by Russ Jennings. Good afternoon. My name is Zachary Tomlinson, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Center at West Park, a nonprofit community performing arts center that has been the prime tenant and building manager of West Park Presbyterian Church since January 2017. I'm speaking today to urge you to deny the application to demolish West Park, which would seriously harm the thriving arts and culture community that we have nurtured at West Park over the past five and a half years. The Center at West Park was created as a partnership between West Park, the West Park congregation and the local community to save the building through adaptive reuse as a welcoming and intersectional hub for the arts and culture. Since 2017, we have leased the building from the congregation while reserving ample space in the building for church activities and invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into maintenance and repairs. If given the opportunity, we can and will purchase and preserve West Park as both a home for the congregation and our broader community for generations to come. I'd like to tell you about the importance of this beautiful and historic building with its soaring architecture and fantastic acoustics for our programs and our community of service. For over 133 years, West Park has been a home to artists and activists. Now the Center at West Park offers socially engaged arts programming as a continuation of this legacy. Since 2017, we have presented over 300 performances of theater, dance, music, opera, and puppetry to over 15,000 audience members. Our programs have provided over 100 residencies, creating opportunities for over 600 individual artists who are predominantly women, LGBTQ, and people of color. We have provi also provided over 10,000 hours of affordable performance and rehearsal rental space in the last five years. These programs are supported by government funders like the New York State Council on the Arts and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, foundations like the Jim Henson Foundation, and hundreds of individual donors. The Center at West Park shares this building with several long-term partners who sublet space from us. In the sanctuary, the Lighthouse Chapel, which is a predominantly Black and immigrant congregation, worships every Sunday. In the community house, we have Noche Flamenca on the first floor, the Russian, the Russian Arts Theater and Studio on the second floor, the Seeing Place Theater on the mezzanine level, and Manhattan Rhythmics, which offers youth gymnastics classes on the third floor. I believe the single basement black box space that has been suggested by the Presbytery, less than half the capacity of the existing sanctuary, would be woefully inadequate to replace the multiple large and beautiful spaces in the building that are an essential resource for so many people in our community. This building is the home, the history, and the inspiration of a thriving arts and culture community. On behalf of this community of thousands, over 2,500 of which have signed our petition, I urge you to help us save West Park. Thank you. Lisa, I think you're muted. Sorry, thank you. Um... Zachary. Uh, next, we have Russ Jennings, who I've brought in. Um, the panelist. And who will be followed by Sadie Von Walters. Hey, okay, Mr. Jennings, we just need to have you unmute and turn on your camera. Okay, um, please state your name for the record. You may begin. My name is Russ Jennings, and I am 
a member of West Park Church. I've, uh, I'm also a member of the worship committee within the church and a member of the church uh, session. The session is the governing body of the individual church. And I just want to, and as a member of the session, I've been involved for years now on dealing with all of the, all of the repair bills that we have been getting. We have a very small income at the, at the church, that's the fact, and we have had, try, we've had to do a great deal of juggling to try to uh, make sure that we could actually make sure the roof was fixed and things like that. This, this is because we, as a religious community, have a very important duty put upon us of the stewardship of, uh, of all of our resources and, and the resources of our community. And one of those, of course, is the building that houses West Park uh, Presbyterian Church. It's uh, our small congregation is essentially spending not, very little time doing the kind of work that we ought to be doing and spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to, how to keep the building from going under. And when we actually ran out of money, how to finance the next period ahead, which the presbytery helped us with, with alone. So we as members of the church are very concerned that this should be passed. This uh, hardship request should be passed so that we can reorganize our, our resources in order to go ahead into the future and do the job that we're supposed to do. We understand this is, I mean, it's not an easy decision for any of us. Everybody loves what that building could be in terms of beauty and in terms of function, but it is neither now. And it, the, put, the task of putting that all together is something that the church is not capable of dealing with. And uh, we really believe that we need to make this next move to go forward into our new a new, a new uh, era for us. Uh, so I would urge the, the uh, commission to vote in favor of the request for a hardship assignment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Sadie Walters, who will be followed by Charmaine Messiah. Okay, Sadie, um, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, it's really dark. I'm sorry. I apologize for the lighting. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Pastor Sadie Vaughn Walters. I currently serve as a supply pastor at Derrie Presbyterian Church in Brooklyn. And I'm here to speak in support of the West Park Presbyterian Church hardship application. I love the beauty and the architecture of old buildings. However, as I notice the deterioration of these creative masterpieces, I'm also noting the deterioration of human lives. We have to admit that over the past two years of going through this COVID crisis that we have seen the frailty of human life. We've witnessed the need for ministry to the sick, emotionally broken, and the mentally deranged. The world needs the church. Through the crisis of the pandemic, we've seen the compassion for one another on the rise. We've seen dedication and sacrifice to help others survive the crisis. The world needs the church. West Park Presbyterian Church needs to continue with its nearly 160 years of work to ensure the safety and prosperity of New Yorkers in body and in spirit. This church needs to once more be a place where people in need and despair just drop in off the street for rescue. It needs to be that place in the community that is a safe haven, providing respite and relief for the weary. And now we stand here with another opportunity to do just that, with West Park enabling them to offer services to the community in a greater measure than they have before by building a new place of worship and the arts, grow its congregation and hire a new pastor. The community needs West Park. It needs to be that place where people can be healed emotionally and spiritually. 
we cannot be about preserving buildings, but we have to be about preserving lives because lives matter. I will be the first to admit that when I drive through Brooklyn, the place of my home for decades, and I see the skyline transforming, I cringe. And when I see all those stru tall structures going up, but I've come to realize that we have to make room for everyone. Everyone deserves a decent place to live. Everyone deserves the right to decency and order in their lives. Everyone has a right to the services of human kindness and compassion. Although I still appreciate these magnificent structures, I've stopped ooing and aahing over buildings and I've started sighing and crying over the forgotten, forsaken, disregarded and discarded. West Park can't do everything, but they can do something. Allowing the hardship clause and permitting the sale of the structure would provide an opportunity for West Park to do something more as they pursue mission, um, pursue their mission-driven work for the congregation and the Presbyterian mission across the city. The world does need the church. The world awaits and human preservation awaits. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, Charmaine, Charmaine Messiah. Sorry about that. Okay. Charmaine, I brought you in. Okay, we, can you please state your name for the record? Do you need three minutes? Good afternoon, my name is Charmaine Messiah. I am speaking in favor of the West Park Presbyterian Church request to unlandmark their building. Today, we are discussing the life and death of two competing legacies. One is the legacy of a beautiful structure created by two well-known architects. The other is a spiritual legacy left in this community by believers with a strong faith in God and a desire to serve people. This church was commissioned and built with the money and faith of Christians wanting to have a place to meet for worship and carry out their biblical mandate to provide services to those in need, to provide hope and tangible services to uplift the community. Over the years, the deterioration of the building has hindered their ability to do so. They have instead spent a great deal of time and finances to minister to the needs of the building, leaving less time and resources to minister to the community and the members of the church. While I too am a lover of old buildings and a fan of preserving landmarks, I don't believe it should be done to the detriment of the people it was built for. The landmark status has been an additional burden that the congregation has struggled to maintain and carry for over 10 years. They've tried, they've not neglected, they've sold and sacrificed. It is time to release them and allow them to re-engage in their biblical work that is based on Matthew 25, the work of feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, holding the naked and visiting those who are sick and in prison. Unfortunately, None of us can have all of what we want during these times of transition. There must be compromise and sacrifice for the good of all. The church has sacrificed and compromised. Now it's time to swing the pendulum in their direction. Please don't choose the legacy of architects who are already paid for and um, celebrated for their contribution. Please don't choose the building over the legacy of the people of faith who have poured out their lives sacrificially for this community. Thank you and please unlandmark the West Park building. Okay, thank you very much. And next we're gonna call Andrea Goldwyn. Okay. And followed by Landmark West. Sorry. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good day, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf 
of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy's Public Policy Committee has reviewed this application and opposes demolition of West Park Presbyterian Church under grounds of hardship. We heard the thorough presentation, listened to the counter arguments, analyzed the assumption that restoration will cost at least $50 million and found it unpersuasive. Since 2001, the Conservancy has provided grants and substantial technical assistance to West Park. Our staff have inspected every part of the building. I've submitted a longer version of the statement with a timeline of these activities. They inform our understanding of this building, its challenges, and its potential. The application's first substantive issue relates to use. West Park's congregation has dwindled to a handful that meets virtually. However, the tenant is an art center which has welcomed audiences for several years, and another congregation worships here, so clearly the building can still be utilized. Next is whether the building would be capable of earning a reasonable return if it wasn't tax exempt. The applicant presents three scenarios that start with a $50 million restoration and end with a no. Our experience with restoration projects and West Park says that there are other options. We've helped many historic religious properties prioritize repairs, phase construction, raise funds, support their missions, build community, and achieve successful outcomes. I've submitted letters from five congregations from several denominations across three boroughs. Each recount how they embraced landmark buildings and how this approach worked for them. Altogether, we are sure there are ways to restore this building without $50 million in hand, undermining the analysis of no reasonable return. LPC should retain independent consultants to review the application's scope and budget for facade restoration, structural work, and code compliance. Over the years, we've seen an array of estimates for the facade, some for a limited scope of work to resolve violations and remove the sidewalk bridge, plus much less. The $18 million Siami budget referenced in the application is from a 2011 report we commissioned as a roadmap for fundraising, but it broke out the project into six phases to be undertaken separately over time with duplicate scaffolding and general conditions and prevailing wages. It also includes soft costs, which the application's $18 million line item doesn't. The structural work also warrants close review. It highlights issues at the rear elevations, but our 2011 report noted brick masonry cracking and open joint at the same locations, and those conditions don't appear to have markedly progressed. At the sanctuary ceiling and underside of the roof truss, old structures studied the plaster cracking in 2011, and concluded there was no evidence of structural deflection of the trusses and that truss movement didn't cause plaster cracking. Instead, it was likely the three years of vacancy without heating and roof leaks. The recommendation then was to secure the plaster. These are just two examples, but in the application, remedies to these deficiencies are costed at over a million dollars. Another major cost is bringing the building up to 2014 code. For this 19th century structure, use of the 1968 code as it might be applicable for some components should be seriously explored. As a final note, it's my understanding that the design and use of a new building at this site would not be under LPC's purview, so I hope you can clarify. Through the years, we've helped raise money, considered redevelopment plans, air right sales, or the sale of the building outright. We offered to get West Park listed on the National Register of Historic Places, a requirement for state grant funding. West Park is NR eligible, but hasn't consented to the listing. We'd be happy to help be part of the effort to explore any of these options. When the LPC designated West Park, you recognized its architectural majesty, rich cultural history, and essential place on the Upper West Side. Shrouded in sidewalk bridges, some- Andrea, you're it. well over your time. Could you I am wrap wrapping up? it up right this second, but it's an asset. With an owner committed to the long-term plan and a new vision, it can be a success, but first you must deny this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, Landmark West, followed by Historic Districts Council. I can't get the video to work, so I'm just gonna go. Thank you, Lisa. Good okay. afternoon, Commissioner Sean Corsandy for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recognizes that there are many strong emotions today on both sides of this application. These lay bare the importance of landmarks, not only on people's daily lives, but on their futures. Future focused in 2010, you, the commission, recognized the significance of West Park as, quote, one of the best examples of Romanesque revival style religious architecture, quote, in the city. 
This hasn't changed. He also recognized the social significance, serving as the site of the city's first same-sex union, the cradle of God's love we deliver, and the proving ground for Joe Papp's Shakespeare Festival. These achievements cannot be taken away. Since designation, the milestones are joined by further accomplishments through adaptive reuse by the center. Then why are we here questioning the physical manifestation of a congregation once recognized as the millionaire's gate to heaven? Because it all became too much, but not overnight. Disinvestment started decades prior and falls at the responsibility of the congregation and its leadership. While we hear much about 25309 of the law today, what about the legal obligations which arise when an owner of a building is, is designated, notably 25311, which outlines maintenance and repair of improvements? That remains ignored and unmentioned. The church has exercised demolition by neglect, period. Church leadership led a building molder to a point where they claim they cannot achieve a sufficient 6% rate of return if they make necessary repairs. It's curious how after waiting decades to act, their calculations demand restorative work happen at once. Verified estimates by professional parties seeking to restore the landmark estimate repair and stabilization at 6.6 .6 million, whereas applicant figures top 18 million, nearly three times more. Their figures fail to consider the 20% tax credits they're eligible for given their status, but regardless, the significant discrepancy of nearly 11.5 million or 13.7 factoring credits handily moots any of the three income approaches shown via base, infill, or multifamily scenarios. These facts are inalienable. So the question becomes one about belief systems. Simply put, who do you believe? Do you believe the community is the neighborhood that has rallied and offered to support repairs? Or do you believe the community is the five remaining congregants of a church whose leadership has fled? Do you believe this building has failed to be suitable for the church's religious ministry or the growing religious group, Lighthouse Chapel, who regularly worships here, proving its adequacy? Do you believe this is a nonprofit, which by law has no right to the highest and best use of its property? If so, why are we following 25309, stretching its charitable mission towards the construction of yet more luxury condos of greatest return? Do you believe the city would recklessly let a building allegedly so dangerous to public safety remain occupied and stand unchecked? Can you believe this at all? Throughout history, this complex fostered and served the community. Its past is extraordinary and at times unbelievable. With your vote against hardship, we expect you can keep it unbelievable. The Landmark West C of A Committee is vehement in opposition to rewarding demolition by neglect and this application. It recommends denial of hardship and invites you to consider our full comments on our website. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, Historic Districts Council. And following Historic Districts Council will be Miriam Shelton. Thank you, Lisa. Um, good afternoon. I'm Frampton Tolbert, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. HDC opposes this hardship application. While the case law does not envision a reasonable return test applying to charities, even if the test does apply, this owner can make a reasonable return on its investment. Other parties, like Landmark West, which you just heard, will, giving, will be giving detailed testimony on this point. Our testimony here focuses on the charitable purpose. We believe that the hardship test the applicant is proposing to rely on regulatory language only intentionally ignores extensive case law for nonprofits, which amply refute the arguments being proposed by the applicant. We have conferred with legal advisors and believe case law cannot be ignored for this application to be considered. The 1968 case of Sailor Snug Harbor versus Platt was the first example of how the Landmarks Law impacted the charitable purpose of the applicant. Given the time limit for testimony, I will only address some key points from this case law and urge the commissioners to read HDC's full testimony and to examine Society for Ethical Culture versus SPAT, the Snug Harbor case, and St. Bartholomew's Church versus New York. A significant weakness in the applicant's argument in support of demolition is its refusal to address case law and to instead rely only on the reasonable return argument in section 253092. As the law makes clear and case law further supports, unlike commercial owners, nonprofits do not have the right to the highest return or best use of their property. The applicant is only applying the statute and not applying what they call the judicial test. Time after time, courts, including the state's highest court, the New York State Court of Appeals, have opined that a request to demolish a landmark will be denied when the applicant is trying to claim best use of their property, and the applicant does not instead meet the charitable purpose test. This is settled law in the state of New York. Citing the decision in Sailor Snug Harbor versus Platt, 
The court in the Society for Ethical Culture case stated, a comparable test for a charity would be where maintenance of the landmark either physically or financially prevents or seriously interferes with carrying out the charitable mission. As a, as a charitable organization, the society could not benefit from the financial hardship sections of the administrative code. The charitable purpose test instead applied. The appellate division reason, the designation does not deprive the society of the present use of the meeting house, but instead would prevent it from altering or more specifically demolishing the building without commission approval to exploit the full economic potential of the Central Park West site. The only hardship upon the society is speculative upon a prospective use of the property, i.e. large scale development and the revenues to accrue therefore. The appellate division further explained that society does not simply seek to replace a religious facility with a new larger facility. Instead, using the need to replace its justification, it seeks the unbridled right to develop its property as it sees fit. This is impermissible and the restriction here involved cannot be deemed an abridgment of any First Amendment freedom, particularly when the contemplated use or a large part of it is wholly unrelated to the exercise of religion. Today's applicant has not met this legal standard. It has chosen to bypass this applicable legal standard and this should raise concerns for the LPC. Why didn't the applicant seek to meet the charitable purpose test? Because demolition of a nonprofit owned landmark to build luxury condos does not meet that test. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, Miriam Shelton. Who will be followed by Barrick um, Coma Miros. Okay. Uh, my name is Miriam Shelton. I'm a member of the Presbytery and currently working to help another church that had to close uh, manage its closing. So I'm well aware of uh, the issues of uh, small churches with shabby buildings, uh, uh, buildings in shabby state. I, I also want to say that the house where my mother was born has been landmarked. The little cabin, you could call it, where my grandmother raised her kids as a widow during the depression has been landmarked. So I viscerally know the value that a building can have to keep memory alive when that memory might disappear otherwise. I, I stand today though, in support of the church's request. Um, and I'll, I'll say several things to that effect. Uh, one is uh, that the claims that if the center at West Park or somebody else had the building, they would do a better job of raising money. That is simply hogwash. <laughs> the idea that the community would rally to provide all the, the I hope that wasn't a bad word. Um, I hope that the community has not rallied to raise the funds. And I, I frankly don't believe that they will rally for anybody else either. Uh, the building is on the way down. Um, now, estimates, of fixing it up at far lower costs than the 50 million are all based on patching things up. They are not based on making the building accessible. They are not based on plans to make it more functional. They are not based on helping West Park continue to be the kind of church that makes it worth the, it's building worth preserving. Several speakers have referred to things that West Park did in the past. West Park could continue to do those things. People have come to visit West Park from all over the world, not to see its building, but to see the people and, and try to plug in and imitate the kind of progressive, far-reaching, visionary kind of ministry that West Park has started. And that there are all kinds of things in the Upper West Side 
that you may not know are related that came out of West Park, including the center at West Park, also the senior, uh, housing for senior citizens uh, and other things that have been mentioned. There are more things to come. And when people claim, well, there's this other group worshiping in the church, in the building, you have no clue the difference between those, what that congregation is doing and what West Park has always done and would like to continue to do in the future. The, there is uh, uh, overall uh, uh, a change in religious practice. And those old buildings all over the country are having to be remodeled, refashioned, added on to, adding more sites in other places, converted to the kind of ministry that the progressive kinds of churches like West Park need to do to continue into the future. To say, oh, some church that just wants to sit in a chair and sing three hymns and pray and go home, that's not maintaining the mission of West Park. Now- Ms. Shelton, you've gone well, well over your time. Could you Okay, then up? I'll stop here. I, I think the opposition has a very, unreasonably low idea of what churches are and what they do and therefore don't understand the possibility of what West Park could continue if they could rebuild their site. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have Barak um, Komamira. Who will be followed by Marsha Flowers. Okay, Barrick, I brought you in. Hello? Yes, we can see and hear you. Oh, hi, um, my name is Barrick Kumamiro. I have been a session member of West Park Presbyterian Church since uh, 2015. Uh, my church activated experience took a place of uh, organize and promote a different church art programs such as um, organizing and curating fine art exhibitions, music events, and West Park International Music Festival in 2016, 2018, 2019, and 2021, which is a very successful uh, music festival. Uh, I love the church building activity, but I'm afraid that uh, it's very old and weak uh, construction. Uh, the church building may collapse one day. I'm uh, aware that recent reports from the building construction in the investigator say that the roof beam detached from the wall four inches on both sides and is in a um, dangerous condition. That mean the roof may collapse any time and kill the people who's inside the building. Uh, so that's very um, afraidable. And I hope uh, we understand that the building must be rebuilt and make a old church neighborhood community to get a brand new building and nice space to reactivate it, a church life at uh, West Park Presbyterian Church very soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next we have Marsha Flowers. And Marsha Flowers will be followed by George James. Video, I'm Marsha Flowers. I am a member of West Park Presbyterian Church and a ruling elder and a member of the board of the center at West Park. People on both sides of this argument have spent time, money, and goodwill dealing with this building at the expense of the real work that we are all called to do, create a more 
just, peaceful, and beautiful world. In this building, West Park people have expressed our faith as we understand it. We've welcomed the marginalized. We've promoted justice and fairness in how we treat each other, personal transformation of the individual, and expression of beauty through the arts. It wasn't the bricks and mortar that did this. It was all the people from different perspectives. The building is a vessel. It is not an end in itself. For many years, our congregation has sought solutions to the answer that we have de uh, demolition by dereliction. 10 years ago, we had an agreement with a developer that would have partially preserved the building, but he backed out when landmark designation became likely. Instead, we have sold our assets and forgone both staff and a pastor to keep up with repairs and maintenance. The accusation from some in the community that this is a money grab is offensive, mean, and wrong. Our congregation will build out a community space in a new building dedicated to worship, celebrating the arts, and maintaining West Park's traditions and legacy. We will commit remaining proceeds to an endowment fund to support outreach programs like shelters, soup kitchens, youth and senior programs that are operated by Presbyterian churches across the city. This waste of time, good intentions, personal reputations and relationships has got to stop grant the hardship waiver for removal of landmark status and release the value of the building so that West Park's mission, which has benefited so many, can spread throughout the city. That's a much more honorable legacy. And I might add before I'm thrown out of here, over the 10 years and even before that, the community has never come through with money, including purchasing air rights. I don't know why. We created the center in response to uh, uh, Councilwoman Brewer's uh, su suggestion that we needed to have a not-for-profit. We have a not-for-profit. The center at West Park is one, but sufficient funds have not been raised in order to maintain this building. I ask you to grant the hardship waiver for removal of landmark status we will create something that will be of value to the community for generations to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then next we have George James. And George James will be followed by David Feinhurst. And just a reminder to everybody, please state your name for the record when you join and keep your comments limited to three minutes. Okay, George James. I need you to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is George James. I'm an urban planner, and I was asked to examine the area surrounding the church to see if there were feasible receiving sites for some or all of the development rights. I prepared findings that were included in Michael Hiller's submission. In sum, there are receiving sites for the floor area. We found three prime sites that could use the development rights, and the hurdles to transfer those rights are not high. We also identified other sites. Um, which are less obvious or more difficult. All of the sites involved rooftop additions or otherwise using floor area within an existing building. Prime sites included 151 West 86th Street directly to the east and 168 170 West 86th Street, both of which are directly south. 151 West 86 can build a substantial rooftop addition using their own unused development rights plus floor area transferred in a zoning lot merger. The sites across the street could accommodate rooftop additions, making their buildings 20% larger through the use of a CPC special permit described in 7479. 
prime sites can use about 43,000 square feet of the church's development rights. Less attractive but still feasible sites includes the, a 7479 transfer to 151 West 86th Street, the building directly to the east so that its rooftop addition can be larger. Um, a zoning lot merger to move development rights to 145 West 86th Street is possible. And then finally, as a final site identified is the church itself, because regardless of the demand for its floor area, a landmark should reserve some floor area so that it could use, um, if, if the use were to change, they could adapt the church to that use. Um, all of these sites would consume if they were all to happen, over 99,000 square feet of floor area, which is more than what the church has. To be clear, of course, this was a hypothetical planning exercise. It did not ask owners if they had any plans or desires to expand their buildings, but planning exercises such as these are usually hypothetical because the plans for individual buildings change over time. There might not be plans for an addition now, but there may be in the future. Um, the details are in the analysis uh, that I've that were um, submitted on Friday, and I'm happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And next, David Feinhirsch. Followed by Justin Spivey. Spivey, if you're here. Hey, David. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hold on. Uh, yes, my name is David Feinhirsch. I'm a neighbor residing on the same block as the West Park Church on West 86th Street and a real estate developer in my own right. I have graduate degrees from both Columbia and Yale in real estate and in architecture and underwrite the financial feasibility of potential real estate opportunities as an integral part of my work. Quite frankly, this application makes absolutely no sense. At a very basic level, in the same analysis, if the same analysis were used to test the financial viability of any other building under normal circumstances in New York City, that building would fail, even before the net income were further reduced by the depreciation of the cost of the building as the applicant calculates. If the applicant followed the prescribed method for calculating, quote, reasonable return, unquote, as stipulated by the New York City Administrative Code, we would not be here today. Beyond that, the applicant inflates the cost of renovation beyond even conservative estimates. Moreover, the applicant does not analyze the most obvious and profitable uses for the church building, that being condominiums and retail in their alternative test cases. Most importantly, other financial feasible options exist that can be implemented today. Examples include a market rate private development or one spearheaded by a nonprofit, such as the center at West Park. There are a whole range of options from public and private funding sources immediately available that can be combined in a various ways. Until now, the only alternatives have been presented by the applicant itself. Indeed, the application is flawed and deficient in multiple ways. However, I have no doubt that if the commissioners do their homework and properly vet this application, it will be rejected out of hand. My respectful apology, but this hearing is about the preservation and the financial viability of the building itself, not the congregation. I have attached an analysis to my letter of testimony uh, that elaborates in detail on the statements made today. We all know that the property is worth more to the presbytery if the architectural treasure is allowed to be destroyed but it is worth infinitely more to 8 million New Yorkers if it remains. It is those New Yorkers for whom the Landmarks Preservation Commission was established to serve. If the congregation cannot come up with a plan, it needs to sell to uh, the next offer, which has been presented by the West Park or the Center for West Park. Um, thank you. One final note is that my analysis for financial fe feasibility relies on in the $18 million renovation cost of the uh, facade. It is very likely that that cost is lower. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I don't see Justin Speedy, so we're gonna go to Mitchell Shamroth, who I believe is Mitch 
in the Zoom name. And who will be followed by Janie Cavello. Hello? Hi. Can you please take okay. your name for the record? You have three minutes. Yes, uh, Mitchell Shamroth. So um, I am the uh, president of uh, 176 West 87th Street, a neighboring building, as well as I'm on the board of the center at West Park. So it is clear that nobody wants to knock down the building, except maybe the Presbytery, because they're going to get $30 million out of it, and Alchemy, because they want to build a high rise and make, obviously, a lot of money on it. Other than that, nobody wants to. So um, the Presbytery uh, has a basically self-imposed hardship. They put very little money into the building. They didn't try to save the building. They went straight to a developer, I think about a year and a half ago. They did not bring up anything to the center at West Park to try to see how we could save the building as well as um, raise money to do so. They, it was done totally separately. They didn't try to sell it to us. They didn't try to sell it to anybody as far as I know um, that would keep the building. Uh, and quite frankly, I think that they just tried to ram this through CB7 and Landmarks, hoping that there wouldn't be any kind of uh, backlash from the community because this was all done in a month and a half or something like that. So, you know, they purport that West Park is crumbling, is a crumbling building and that it's dead. Well, it's just the opposite. It's very, it's vibrant. Uh, and I, I certainly would urge you to visit uh, the, the, the property, when you can see that things going, the things going on in these, in the sanctuary and in the, in the entire building, it does have a scaffolding around and it does need some work, but what 130 year old doesn't, there's an offer to buy the building in which the presbytery wouldn't have any burden or the, or the, or the congregation at, at, at West Park would have no burden in, in having the building. There's an offer on the table for three and a half million dollars to buy the building and the congregation can do everything that they want inside the building. So as well as the community would have the Performing Arts Center as well as any other type of uh, community as well as a community center. And most just as importantly, this treasure can stay. Um, and so in less than a month, we have substantial pledges to support the three and a half million dollar offer to buy the building. Um, no one wants, so the argument that there and is- And you three minutes wrap, could you please start to wrap up? Yes, I will, thank you. Um, like Gail said, once done, you can't take it back. So I would just say that give, Give the community a chance. There's, there's always time to knock it down. There's no way to re-put re it back. So uh, give us a chance. We will get it done. And uh, I would just like to say also is that with 90 other churches that are um, waning, if this goes down, so there's going to be a lot of other churches that they're going to do this with. So thank you. Thank okay, you thank for you. your time. Next, we have Jamie Cavello, followed by Hope um, DeRogati. DeRogati? As a reminder, please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes to speak. Hello. Um, my name is Jamie Cavello, and for um, a few, many years, actually, I was involved with West Park. And most importantly, though, I'm here to discuss uh, the issues around uh, the fact that that West Park is considered um, a, uh, to be uh, 
forcibly uh, not fixing and, and dealing with a crumbling building so they could demolish it and the presbytery could make all this money. For two years, I was the leasing agent uh, during a, uh, my career at Cushman, my 30 year career at Cushman and Wakefield to sublet, this was between 12, uh, 2012 and 2014, to, to lease the church house, which is 10,000 square feet of space um, to a third party. And this would have been a five-year lease with uh, an opportunity for a second five years at a rate that would have supported uh, financing to repair the building. This was a strategy that was worked out by the mission and supported. They are, this is not a group that purposefully uh, uh, stood by as their beloved building was deteriorating. Um, we went through probably, I, I, I saw some comments from Pastor Brashear. We went through six or eight deals after after having 50 or so serious prospects we we negotiated five or six or seven deals in serious negotiations where uh potential tenants were spending money architecturally and understanding the interior of the building every single one of these fell through because their budget would not compensate for the for the repairs and constructions that was required for them to occupy the building safely in their, you know, according to their trustees, most of these were not for profits, very prestigious and serious not for profits. Uh, uh, a couple of ballets that you would, that are highly regarded and congregations. So we went through this exercise for two years and it was finally determined that this was not going to succeed. We spent a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of favors in getting this done. And we then went on to try and find a third party to be our um, provider uh, to run the center. And every single budget we looked at, which I'm sure is the case today, I have not seen the budget. I understand there's a lot of misinformation out there. I'm not up on it. I haven't read reports. So I, I'm not speaking from that uh, point of view or expertise. But this organization, uh, West Park, worked so hard to do everything that they could. Somebody mentioned, uh, you know, um, getting uh, fundraising uh, uh, for uh, supporting fundraising from the uh, Presbytery, from the um, Landmarks Preservation. They didn't have any money to attribute to a, 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 a grants writer. There was nothing. Uh, that they could do. And they ended up, I think that's my three minute bell. Is that what that is? It they is, yes. Up, could you start to wrap up, please? Yes, I will. I'm going to wrap up by saying that they, they spent all of the endowment on repairing this church. They then had to sell the manse. They spent all of the endowment provided by the manse to support the repairs and keep this church running and, and the center. And then they went on to use the money that they were using uh, that they were paying the pastor who who then retired to support the repairs in this building. And it is, I, I was on the center board for a period of time and resigned from the board because I was concerned about the environment and the safety and the fact that I'm in the commercial real estate business and I should know that I shouldn't be involved with something because I would be more personally liable than everybody else if the tragedy that I believe is waiting to happen there happens. So that's it. Hope it was helpful. Okay, Questions. Okay, and then next is Hope um, De Regatta. We hope they were got us. Um, I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Please accept the promotion. Okay, I think. Hope is not here. Um, we get ahead to Simeon Bankos. Okay, 
Can we please? Yes, there you go. There we go. OK, uh, hold on a sec. Let me just get all my screens together. Um, good afternoon. I'm Simeon Bankoff. I am a professional preservationist uh, acting as a consultant for the Center at West Park. I urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to soundly reject this application to demolish this individual New York City landmark on the grounds of hardship. This proposal runs counter to the spirit in which the landmarks law was written and to the standards of historic preservation practice. While hardship is a legally necessary element of the enabling legislation, which protects our landmarks, this application fails to meet its standards. Frankly put, the landmark building as it currently stands could still fulfill the needs of the religious institution which built it. It is not the fault of the building that that institution is practically non-existent. The building can still be used for worship purposes as it is being used by Lighthouse Chapel. The fact is that the West Park Presbyterian Church chose to abandon this building after its landmark designation 12 years ago. It was the church that left the building, not the building that left the church. Setting aside the worship purposes of the building is well adapted to, uh, well adapted to adaptive reuse for the community. It, uh, this is evidenced by the current successful use as a performing arts center. Others have spoken about the success of the center at West Park, and that doesn't include all the community participation and activity accrued by the, by the center's subtenants. Uh, it would appear that this building is serving the purpose assigned by the landmarks law to promote the use of historic districts, landmarks, interior landmarks, scenic, scenic landmarks for the education, pleasure, and welfare of the people of the city of New York. In New York City, there are numerous examples of buildings built for religious purposes that have been very successful second and third acts as cultural institutions, such as, and there's a long list, but let's just say Eldridge Street, the Agent Lawrence Sand Center, First Reformed Church of Jamaica, and St. Anne of the Holy Trinity. All of them are buildings which have outlined, outlived their original owner's capacity and desire to be stewards. All of them are important architectural and historic buildings for their community, and all of them are still in active use as neighborhood anchors and destinations. Performing arts centers in religious, historic religious buildings are a natural fit. They should be encouraged, not evicted. This application asked the LPC to set aside the principles of the landmarks law in order for the applicant to make a massive profit. I feel it is important to highlight the amount being proposed for the simple reason that West Park Presbyterian Church has repeatedly publicly stated it is no longer interested in owning the building. Any amount the church received for the desired sale of the building would be a profit. As the saying goes, we've established what is going on. Now we're just haggling over the price. As stewards of New York City's irreparable, irreplaceable built heritage, we're asking the LPC to look beyond the welter of financial procrastinations. Why do I use words I can't actually talk about? Okay, um, this uh, essentially, this application is in the service of the clear goal of making a higher profit off a vacant site. The Landmarks Commission has different priorities. The commission has a long record of encouraging private owners to find new uses for our city's historic buildings, bringing new life to old vessels. Um, the LPC must reject can this can application for entirety. Yep. Anything less than full refusal leaves the door open to damaging precedents, which could apply to any one of a number of landmarks in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back to somebody um, that we missed earlier, and that is um, Robert Fultz Morrison, who I think is here under your email address. Okay, great. I brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself on your camera if you choose. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. But you might, Sorry. if you have Zoom or YouTube on, could you please turn those off? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Are we getting interference now? Still good. Less. I think you could start. Please do state your name for the record. 
I am the Reverend Robert Fultz. I'm, I'm going to turn off my phone. Okay. My apologies. I'm the Reverend okay, Robert Fultz Morrison, and I'm the Executive Presbyter of the Presbytery of New York City. We have 88 congregations and 15 new worshiping communities in the five boroughs of New York City. And what I wanted to highlight tonight, today, were two votes that were taken last Tuesday. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please continue. There are two votes taken last Tuesday about the West Park Presbyterian Church's application for a hardship clause. Um, whereas 59% of a community board's members rejected the application in an advisory vote, same night, 91% of Presbyterian ministers and members from the five boroughs in the quarterly meeting cast their vote in support of a legally binding vote in the state of New York. Now, the ministers and members know what it's like week after week to make sacrifices to serve people with whatever resources God has given them. Their people, financial gifts, a building, other religious and secular partners, that's their mission. And many work to bring hope to people during what are some of the most difficult periods of their lives and even difficult periods in this city. So they voted in solidarity with the West Park Presbyterian Church. They wrote letters to you. They want to see the Landmarks Preservation Commission honor this congregation's storied history and serving others and their right to self-determination for a sustainable future with their property. You have been given by me a list of 97 different ways Presbyterian congregations in New York City are serving purpose persons beyond their own membership and extending their outreach into 30 nations on five continents. Last year, one small congregation who sold their building in their renovated space, they provided 1 million meals to hungry New Yorkers. Don't underestimate what even a small and dedicated group of persons can do. It happens every day in this city. So on behalf of the Presbytery's 88 congregations, I encourage you to support the detailed study that's taken place over the course of a year that you've been given that meets the statutes for the hardship clause so that the West Park Presbyterian Church can have a sustainable future in their community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then next we'll call Marion Warden. Will be Hey Marion? Yes. I am unmuted, I believe. <laughs> Yes. I am Marian, yes, please state your name for the record. Yes, I am Marion Ward and I chair the board of the center at West Park, um, a not-for-profit corporation with a two-part mission to revitalize the uses of the building owned by the West Park Presbyterian Church after its effort to sell and demolish the building was stopped by the designation as a New York landmark in 2010. A number of interested citizens looked at this building's potential for a useful and vibrant life as a place for the community to gather and for the arts to flourish in its beautiful late 19th century structure. The second part of our mission is to do everything possible to assure the preservation and restoration of the building, to enable it to serve the community for years to come. We worked with a small congregation to clean up and open the doors to all who wanted to help with bringing the building back to life. 
and we discovered that it was necessary to raise funds from multiple sources, many of which were not available to religious institutions. So we concluded that the center needed to become a 501c3 organization, which could apply to governmental and foundation sources, as well as private donors. Several artistic groups joined us in using space for their offices, rehearsals, and performance venues, and audiences began to discover the creative presence of programs in theater, dance, music, and puppetry, which gave voice to often marginalized communities needing to, to have their stories told. The building has its challenges, to be sure. And our lease with the church gives the center the responsibility for managing and maintaining the interior. We have addressed numerous issues which have enabled artists to work safely in the space, which they love to do because of its soaring volume and excellent acoustics. The center and its resident artists are committed to working toward full restoration and care of the building when we are freed to do so. We realized that the church had neither the interest nor the resources to steward the building anymore into the future. And we offered to buy the building in 2020, an offer that we have since upgraded. There was no response to our first offer, but we have pledges of financial support to support such an offer. And when the building's landmark status is affirmed and the building can be maintained intact, we intend to do just that. The Center at West Park strongly urges the Landmarks Preservation Commission to deny the petition for hardship and the resulting demolition of the West Park Presbyterian Church. It demonstrated over the last 12 years that the building is viable and an asset to the community. It is in daily use by arts groups, programs for kids, weekly worship, and by the community at large. We commit to continuing to develop it safely accessibly and usefully for the future. It would be an affront to the Upper West Side in the city of New York to allow this landmark building to be demolished. Please make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you. And next we'll have Ted Berger. followed by Paige Kelly. Mr. Berger, we just need you to unmute and turn on your camera. Is that right? Yes, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. I'm Ted Berger, uh, a Center for West Park board member. Um, and also the Executive Director Emeritus of the New York Foundation for the Arts, where I served for 35 years. 12 years ago, I discovered the neglected and abandoned building at 86th in Amsterdam. Without heat, without plumbing, nothing was happening in the building then. The congregation worshiped elsewhere, overwhelmed by its pressures, its relationships with neighbors, bruised from recent landmarking battles. No presbytery support was forthcoming. West Park's future had eroded. It couldn't reimagine new possibilities. Along with MIM, I joined a cadre of people who united, including members of the West Park Church as well, and launched the Center for West Park creating a separate non-sectarian, non-profit necessary for public-private fundraising, building on simil similar models such as Jil Judson Church and especially Eldred Street Synagogue. The arts bring possibilities, reigniting creativity in the organizations, neighborhoods, and ourselves. West Park spaces and its excellent acoustics suggest endless possibilities for exciting adaptive uses. Now the center is an intergenerational hub of lively, thoughtful, cultural and community activities, fully insured and inspected annually. 
it's taken time to get official IRS approval for our not-for-profit status. It's taken time to get funders in, interested in making an investment. It's taking time to develop programs, rebuild neighborhood and community relations, as well as deal with the impact of COVID on all aspects of the center's operations. Now we are looking for a collective phased-in plan for ownership, funding, and community involvement. But it's obvious the Presbytery has been working for a long time on its deal with alchemy. Our approach, meant to forge a mutually beneficial long-term plan, is a collaborative investment of time and energy, developing human and financial resources to purchase, share, and restore what will be a living landmark. Our recent efforts with the Presbytery have been rebuffed. The Presbytery alchemy deal seems more like money via de demolition, inflating repairs and restoration costs while stoking community fears. Certainly safety is our concern, but significant restoration funds are possible only with the long-term site control. Remember, if it weren't for the center, the building would have remained in darkness. If it weren't for the center, the benefits to New Yorkers that they're just beginning to weep wouldn't be there. The Presbytery pleads hardship. The center offers possibilities, restoration, and stewardship. Please vote against the landmarking and demolition of the building. Okay, thank you very much. And next we have Paige Cowley. Who will be followed by Robert um, Brashear. Hey Paige, we just need you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hi, can you hear me? It's Paige. Yes. Can you state your okay. name for the record? You have three minutes. Um, sorry, thank you. Um, my name is Paige Cowley. I'm an Upper West Sider. I live a block and a half away from West Park. And I was introduced to this building by Tom Vitula Martin, oh gosh, maybe 15 uh, years ago. Um, and I found the whole environment and the people involved intriguing but it has had its ups and downs. And I think I was hired on occasion to work on this project to determine its viability as an existing and ongoing landmark because of the work I did at Strecker Lab. The, the Landmark Commission will know that the roof was caved in, but it was um, converted years later into a substation. The Dorothy Valentine Smith House which was also abandoned in Staten Island and we relocated it on the property. And the last really um, egregious one was the Atlantic Control House in Brooklyn, which we moved off and on the site um, and put it in a traffic island in the end. So what do these buildings have in common? These were all um, slated for demolition or were abandoned. And I have to tell you that West Park is far from that um, status. Um, it is very different. The church is in use. It's thriving. It's, it's a beacon. People know where to get off the bus on either 86th Street or West End Avenue because they see the spire in, in, in their sighting. Um, and it's not as damaged as any of these previous projects I, I stated were. And I've been very fortunate to work with the center at West Park in helping them understand the facade concerns, anything about the roof, the sandstone. And I just want to say one thing about the sandstone. You know, most of the West Side, all of the townhouses are sandstone. So if you condemn this building, you're condemning every single owner who has been plugging, patching, replacing, and putting new stone into their stoops and facades. Um, we did an estimate. We've done photogrammetry on the building on both sides so that I'm willing to share this information with everyone that is, wants to participate in this restoration. We've sought out the um, expertise of Brisk Waterproofing, CAMI, and Eurostruct to help us um, curtail and find the easiest way 
to restore the building. So there are no landmark violations or facade violations. There are only three construction violations relating to the 86th Street Gable Wall. And I urge everyone to really put their faith in this building, assist it by becoming a member, volunteer your time, work with the Landmarks Commission, and let's bring this one home. Let's save this building on the corner. It's too valuable, too precious, too historic, and too remarkable to give up. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Robert Brashear. Hey, Robert, I've brought you in. Unmuting and I'm starting my video. Okay, great. All right, so you got me and you can hear me. Yes. All right, good. I'm Reverend Dr. Robert Brashear. I currently serve as moderator of the Presbyterian New York City, previously served as pastor of the West Park Presbyterian Church for over 22 years, and was one of the founders of the board of the center at West Park. Through the public hearings and other presentations over the last several weeks, the amount of misinformation has been overwhelming, and I want to correct that record. Some continue to say that West Park has done nothing to preserve the building. That's in no way true. West Park has repeatedly sought to have a significant partner for the building long before the commissioner's decision to landmark it in 2010. There were several potential partnerships which you've heard about reaching serious levels of negotiation and development. However, the condition of the building made it a challenge and the landmark designation ultimately made it even more difficult. Even so, local politicians promised to help fundraise for the church upon the landmarking. Knowing that government could not easily fund churches, the West Park congregation worked with like-minded community members to create the center at West Park as a 501c3. We did that. While meaningful funding did not come in through either elected officials or the center, the shrinking congregation at West Park did everything it could to maintain and restore the building, spending nearly a million dollars. If the commission approves this application, West Park has an opportunity to be reborn and support projects throughout the five boroughs as a true extension of this congregation's legacy. In conclusion, it's your duty to determine if West Park has met the legal requirements for hardship relief. If you determine that it has, then rule as such. But if not, there is a moral and ethical responsibility to do everything in your power to encourage and facilitate the necessary collaboration for a realistic, for a realistic and sustainable solution. It's time to stop the acrimony. It's time to stop accusations and to try and come up with a conclusion that brings the best for all involved. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Jen Rogers. Hi, um, my name is Jen Rogers. Uh, I'm a neighbor and I'm also on the board of the center at West Park. I actually live in the apartment on the West 86th Street that Andrew Goodman grew up in. Uh, he was one of the three civil rights activists murdered during Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1964. And one of the first events that I actually attended at West Park was an event marking the 50th anniversary of the murders of Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner. I would like to say to uh, Reverend Dr. Brashear's comment that you know, West Park has been involved. That was something that we had worked on together. And I really thank him for that. You know, being in that sanctuary surrounded by people and music is a feeling that can't be replicated in a new black box theater. History is heavy. It has the power to make you feel different in a special place like West Park. Uh, so I submitted written testimony. I hope that you all read that. But listening to the application today, I really wanted to drill down on one key part that's in front of you right now, whether this building is adequate, suitable, or appropriate for its purpose. And just to run you through what my weekend was like in relationship to the center at West Park. I took my daughter to a rhythmic gymnastics class on the third floor of the community house on Friday. Saturday afternoon, I went to a tag sale on the ground floor. Saturday night, I stopped by the last performance of Macbeth from Shakespeare Isn't Dead. Uh, Sunday, I went over and talked to our long-term religious tenant, Lighthouse Chapel who was having their second service of the day. Every week, this church is full of artists and students and worshipers for whom it is more than adequate 
suitable and appropriate. And on top of it, it is a building that we would all like to see restored. We would love to get that shed down. And we have plans to do that. We have a plan in place. We have commitments for money for our purchase agreement. People there don't feel unsafe. All weekend, people are in there doing their craft, worshiping. Uh, We have insurance on this building. This building is inspected every year. Our insurance is renewed. It is not falling in on itself. You will see that in further detail when you get the engineering reports as well. But people there feel inspired, not in threat uh, of what is going. So what really blows me away with all of this is how, first of all, I thank everybody for coming. It's great to see all of our passion and work here for the community. But the applicant's presentation, it's really good. They've had 14 months to be working on this. We have just come in here and we're trying to get all of our ducks in a row, but they are getting in line. I have never seen the Presbytery work so hard on this building as they have to sell it. I have never seen them bring in the national uh, organization to try and fundraise a capital campaign, try and get this organization back bring more members in, bring visiting pastors in, try and program in there. They are the people that will benefit the most, the larger organization. We're not talking about the session here. People that have put in some time, we're talking about the larger presbytery, $30 million going there. They have not come to bring to bear all that their resources can and can bear. And they could really step up. Ms. Rogers, you've gone over your time. Could you, could you wrap up, please? I'm done. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I'll be taking on testimony going forward. Um, The next speaker is Mark Diller, and I will be promoting you to panelists, Mark. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for uh, calling on me. My name is Mark Diller. Uh, You've heard me testify any number of times on behalf of Community Board 7. Today I'm testifying in my individual capacity. Um, uh, I'm grateful to uh, Reverend Carpin who uh, delivered uh, the resolution of our board, which I support. And I'm here to offer what I hope will be uh, some additional reasons, perhaps ones that haven't been highlighted in the lengthy testimony you've already heard. Um, for the relief we've sought through the resolution, which is to, uh, to deny the application as presented. Um, one, of the, one of the points that I wanted to raise with you is um, the issue of precedent. Um, I was involved as, as many of my colleagues were uh, back in 2009, 2010, when this uh, beautiful building was sought to be protected. And, the, and many, many of the arguments that you're hearing today are repeats of arguments that were Uh, offered back then. Uh, And it's not a surprise, they actually are identified as such in the in the moving uh, papers. Um, I have a deep concern procedurally for relitigating matters that have been already adequately uh, litigated. Um, Also, uh, a precedent issue, which is that there are uh, countless houses of worship in a similar circumstance. And this application will become a roadmap for many of them. I actually served on the board of a church that was in a similar situation at one time um, and empathize with where uh, the congregants are, um, but there are obligations that go with the landmark and they they need to be addressed. Um, I also wanted to share with you my personal view that this is not a level playing field. The applicant has had more than a year, by my count at this point, about 15 months, as well as access to unprecedented resources, including some of the best land use attorneys um, in the English speaking world, um, and some fabulous consultants, all of whom have had uh, ample time and a point of view to support the positions that they have put forward to you. Um, The folks who are um, joining me in opposing this application have not had either that time or those resources. Um, It is crucial because the test, which I, on another day and another time, will bend your ear about how it doesn't apply to a situation like this, but the test that we're held to with the 6% return would be materially changed and the outcome would be materially affected by 
even a modest change in some of the numbers that are put before you. The, uh, the overarching concern here is that, uh, as has been amply said before, and I will add to the drama by saying that, of course, demolition is permanent. Um, and so the uncertainties that with respect to the calculation before you and with respect to the matter itself um, are, are ones that can't be reversed if the application is granted. Um, it harkens back to my early days uh, as a baby lawyer uh, being- a, I'm sorry, you've reached yep. three minutes. If you could please wrap up your testimony. Very good. You saved me from an unfortunate reference. And so I will just urge you to, uh, to deny this application as presented. And I thank you for the time. Thank you. Our next speaker will be John Graham and I'll be promoting you to panelists now. If you could please accept that invitation. John Graham. Okay, uh, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society in New York. The Victorian Society opposes this application for demolition for the West Park Presbyterian Church on the grounds of hardship as the applicant has not met the criteria required for such a finding. Specifically, a not-for-profit owner must demonstrate, among other things, that the building is no longer adequate, suitable, or appropriate for use in carrying out the owner's purposes. In this case, the building is a church, the owner is a church congregation, and the building was, is, and always will be suitable for use as a church. The enhancement of the owner's mission that might result from selling the property for purposes of demolition is not a relevant finding. Almost any not-for-profit owner of a landmark building could say its mission would be enhanced if it didn't have to maintain its old building and could sell it for demolition. And that's why the finding that the building is no longer suitable is required for not-for-profits. No evidence is provided that the building is unsuited to the owner's purposes and no evidence is provided that the building requires a full restoration upgrading at the cost of more than 50 million to remain usable. Financial hardship cannot be used as the reason the building isn't suitable for carrying out the owner's purposes. Commissioners, these are dangerous times for historic preservation in New York. Forces have been working for years to weaken the Landmarks Law and the Landmarks Commission. If the commission approves this hardship application, we can expect much knocking on doors of not-for-profit owners of Landmarks regardless of their condition, with offers of monetization in exchange for hardship demolition. Perhaps that's the goal of those behind the current application, or perhaps they are looking for a route to the Supreme Court whose current members are no, fraud, no friends of precedent or the, of the public good. That's why this is such a dangerous application. We believe it should be denied, and at the same time, we urge the commission to develop a plan to thwart the anti-preservation forces that will doubtless pursue other avenues to achieve their ultimate goal. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Cristobal Rao. And after that, we'll have Alia Sumro. Cristobal, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, this is Christabel Goff speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Am I coming through? Yes, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Today, the best way to monetize architecture may be to destroy it. The value of the land it occupies may seem more important than what Landmarks Commissioner Bill Conklin once called intricate old architecture. The original design and execution of West Park are matchless today because modern New Yorkers have little ambition to create a unique structure in praise of God, or even to house a company of dancers in anything more than a modest black box space. Our idea of alchemy is not to transform base substances into gold as in the Middle Ages, but rather the reverse. A number of citizens have expressed the view that demolition is the best we can do. We have to hope that they are wrong and that a better outcome can be negotiated, as has happened with hardship applications in the past. If you try to find a way 
this architectural vision of our predecessors might remain as part of the city we have inherited. Just as every individual landmark is unique, every hardship application presents unique facts and unique challenges. It is well established that the possibility of reversing a designation is necessary to ensure the continuing viability of the law that saves landmarks. Built into this procedure are provisions to ensure that every possibility of avoiding demolition has been impartially explored before that step is taken. In this case, while the situation is obviously dire, we question whether the expense analysis is complete, balanced, and accurate. It may still be possible to find an alternative resolution that preserves the building while offering some more reasonably scaled compensation to the recently created entity representing the financial interests of the Presbytery, the West Park Administrative Commission. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Alia Sumer. And uh, Alia Sumer, you should be able to unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Alia Sumro, and I'm the Menapace Fellow in Land Use Law at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. MAS has also submitted written testimony. MAS is extremely concerned about the citywide precedent this hardship application could have for the New York City Landmarks Law and other houses of worship. While MAS recognizes the financial difficulty of maintaining a landmarked building by a tax-exempt religious organization with a dwindling con congregation, we believe the applicant has not demonstrated a financial hardship as required by the landmarks law. We urge LBC to deny this hardship application and critically review the details provided by the applicant to identify alternatives to demolition. Despite being on notice of the responsibility of maintaining a landmark building for 12 years, there is little evidence the church was proactive in updating and maintaining basic features of the building or exploring alternative use or ownership options. For instance, even though the building ceased to be used as a religious institution in 2018 and instead was leased to the center at West Park for use as a performance space, the church has not made any improvements to make the building accessible to persons with disabilities. Additionally, while the church asserts that the building went up for sale in 2014, it has not offered any specific details other than the fact that there were no interested buyers. Given the limited set of alternative scenarios the applicant provided, MAS urges LPC to hire an independent consultant to assess the financial information the applicant provided. LPC must evaluate more adaptive reuse alternatives, such as preserving the church's chapel and conserving the church facade while restoring the interior building for a new program. Additionally, an independent analysis should study additional ownership options, such as nonprofit cultural organizations or private ownership, restoration of the building in phases, and financing options options such as selling development rights, pursuing historic preservation tax credits, grants, loans, and other subsidies at the city, state, and federal level. Lastly, LPC must recognize a citywide precedent of this hardship application. The issue of dwindling congregants for individual congregations is becoming more common across the city for houses of worship and consequently raises policy issues the city, city must address. While MAS recognizes the need for tax-exempt properties to fulfill their charitable mission, as the programming needs within these spaces shift to respond to fewer worshipers, more support from the city is needed to support congregations, the historic resources, and the broader community. MAS urges the city to take steps to identify more funding opportunities for sacred institutions and develop creative policy solutions, such as expanding the radius of TDRs for individually landmarked religious properties, similar to the theater district and the 2017 East Midtown rezoning. In sum, the lack of creativity on the part of the applicant puts this landmark building and many other landmark properties, especially houses of worship, at risk. LBC must deny this hardship application and explore alternatives to de demolition. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Francois Bollock, um, followed by Josette Amato. So Francois, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Francoise Bollack. I'm an architect and I'm testifying today as the chair of the Preservation Committee of the City Club of New York. 
Um, so if we believe the applicant's technical report about the condition of the facade, this building should be a pile of stone on the street. And it isn't. Uh, and it hasn't been a pile of stone on the street for the last 20 years that the scaffolding has been up, the sidewalk bridge has been up. Over these past 20 years, the church could have uh, engaged in a phase plan to, to secure the stone, to replace, judiciously replace some stone and to secure some others. It hasn't done that. Instead, it has chosen to pay for scaffolding for 20 years without doing anything. And this paying for scaffolding is a completely dead, unproductive cost. So this is, this has been its choice. Uh, it can still engage in a, in a phase plan of stabilization and judicious replacement. But instead of that, it, it um, budgets uh, a, an inappropriate and really uncalled for uh, operation of essentially completely re rebuilding this facade. Um, now I wanna say in conclusion that as to the community not showing up and not funding West Park, I live a few blocks away and we get plenty of requests for monies from our community, from, from our block association, from the little community garden that's nearby. And these people have no staff whatsoever from God at Riverside, which is a well-established social services organization. And we respond to these requests for funding. We have never been approached by West Park to support them, never. So you don't get money if you don't ask for it. So I will, I will um, leave the commission to judge this application for what it is. And on behalf of the Preservation Committee of the City Club, I'm asking you to deny this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Josette Amato. And Josette, you should be able to unmute your line. If you can please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Josette Amato, West End Preservation Society. When is a landmark no longer worthy of being a landmark? When the walls start crumbling, the Russian, the Russian, the Roman Colosseum would differ. When fire consumes it, the cathedral at Notre Dame would say otherwise. The answer should be never. We are not equating our landmark with its European colleagues, but as newcomers to the world monument stage, this is as fine an example of a Romanesque revival style church that we have in this city. Its landmark status cannot be dissolved. It can only be ignored and destroyed. Can this be restored? Absolutely. Anything is possible if you have the funds and therein lies the rub. The congregation, whether by design or default, has neither the ability nor interest in retaining their home now. The applicant has stated they examined other alternatives, but only this one yields the magical 6% return. Even if restored, they say the building would not be able to earn sufficient income to generate a reasonable return. We do not understand how the financial hardship requirements in the law apply to a religious institution, but surely if it was restored inside and out, they would be positioned to maximize their property and continue their mission. If one statement makes little sense, should we not view the other statements more skeptically? We've seen adaptive reuse on West End at 87th Street. We've witnessed facadism on West 86th Street between Broadway and West End. There are examples throughout the city of houses of worship restored and integrated into new developments. We would ask the same energy and imagination be brought forth for saving this one either whole or in part. If this team can't do it, maybe some other team can. Allowing it to be destroyed will send the wrong message and provide a blueprint to any owner who wants an exit from landmark status. This is bigger than one historic church on one corner on the Upper West Side. It goes to the very heart of what we believe a landmark is. Is it transient when the cost gets too high or is it forever and requires everyone, including the city, to find a better solution to this problem than obliterating it? We must not be so short-sighted. We ask that you deny the application. Thank you for considering our comments. Thank you. And our next speaker will be James Singletary. James, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record. Uh, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. 
Chair Carroll and LPC commissioners. My name is James Singletary, and I am Save Harlem's now newly hired executive director. I'm delighted to be here today and to give testimony against the demolition of the West Park Presbyterian Church. West Park struggles are not new, and they are painfully familiar to dozens of, of congregations in Harlem. Many of our faith-based institutions are burdened with dwindling membership, a lack of funding, deferred maintenance, large assets that are costly to maintain, and relentless real estate pressures from a city and an industry that encourages them to sell their properties in exchange for meager premiums and lofty promises. As an ordained clergy person, I understand that churches are not only places of worship, they represent the heartbeat of the community that they have helped to build. We gather in churches to celebrate weddings, to bless our babies, to baptize believers, and to say our last farewell to our elders and loved ones. Churches are the original social service provider where all community members are served regardless of their status or social location uh, and their needs are met. West Park has been all of these things to the community. West Park's stunning Romanesque revival style is a reminder of St. Martin's Episcopal Church, an individual landmark in Mount Morris Park Historic District, and its sister church, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Hamilton Heights. The similarities between West Park and these two Harlem churches is not just a matter of style, but of substance too. Both Harlem churches are in distress and in the face of the same challenges. In fact, St. Luke is currently up for sale. The only thing that is keeping these churches standing is that they are designated landmarks. Their landmark status is also what gives us hope in their surrounding communities that they will never be demolished and that whatever the future brings, any proposed alterations will be subject to rigorous review by this commission to an ensure an appropriate outcome. Allowing the demolition of individually landmark West Park will set a terrible legal precedent that will tie the commission's hand and will make it increasingly difficult to say no to the next designated church that chooses demolition over an alternative plan for survival. Save Harlem now asks that the Landmark Preservation Commissions unequivocally reject the hardship application. Volunteer demolition of an individual landmark is not the only way to address challenges faced by West Park, dozens of other churches in Harlem, and others around New York City. We need new thinking to solve growing problems facing the city's historic churches and their neighborhoods. Thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to present this testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Michelle Arbelou. Michelle, uh, if you could unmute your line, you can state your name for the record and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arblue for the Historic Districts Council, uh, addressing a separate but re related part of the application around charitable purpose. HGC has serious concerns about the applicant's premise that the building cannot serve the current charitable purpose of the congregation. We know that the building is in active use by multiple parties from the tenant at Center at West Park. We use it constantly for cultural use, Lighthouse, a separate congregation from the one that is part of the applicant, and the 12 congregants who are still using the building. If all of these parties are using it and others have expressed interest in using the space and indeed purchasing the building, then how can it be serving, then how can it not be serving its purpose? The applicant has not fulfilled its claim that it needs to replace the church immediately to fulfill its charitable mission. While it is clear that the building needs work, the applicant has not demonstrated that analysis of the condition of the building has been fully explored, nor that the entire structure needs to be rehabilitated at all, all at once to become a more useful site. The costs provided by the applicant are a complete restoration and rehabilitation of a landmark structure. We know that this is not necessary for the building to continue to serve its intended purpose. A phased approach, which would be able to save the structure by providing each of the elements of a restoration plan in a phase over multiple years. All old buildings age, and we know that most of them are not fully restored at all at one time. This needs to be the case here. This need not be the case here either. In addition, a sympathetic buyer could be found who would retain the church building and repurpose for its new uses. The information provided by the applicant on past efforts at selling or leasing the building have been vague and contradictory. 
In their own application materials, the applicant states, quote, West Park has been unable to meet these steep financial challenges and has no other viable opportunity but to sell the building. Given the church's landmark designation and its condition, it is unclear if West Park could realize any value from, from the sale today, end quote. We know that last part to be untrue, and there are groups that have expressed interest in buying, although possibly not for the $30 million that the developer has promised. As is clear in the Landmarks Law, nonprofits do not have the right to the highest return and best use of their property. So shouldn't the applicant be required to put the property on the market for a buyer who may make an offer contingent on keeping the building? Certainly the applicant has not shown that it, it used due diligence to sell the building without demolition as a contingency in the recent years. Whether the new owner is center at West Park or not, we urge the congregation and the presbytery to put the church on the market in a public manner considering all the bills, bids that would preserve the landmark. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Fern Luskin. And uh, if you could please accept my request for you to be promoted to panelist, Fern Luskin. Okay, um, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. This is, I'm Fern Luskin speaking for Friends of Hopper Gibbons House Underground Railroad site. If the owner is able to demolish this landmark church, this landmark 19th century church and build a new structure on this property claiming hardship, a multitude of developers will gleefully follow suit and attempt the same tactics. The destruction of this church would rip out a significant piece of the historic soul of this neighborhood. It is a respite from the prosaic buildings surrounding it. The Romanesque style is so rare in New York. I tell my students on the first day of class to always look up while walking through the city to see our architectural heritage and that they have the power to preserve it. To unlandmark a landmark and worse, demolish it and let it disintegrate into dust so it exists never more? Then what's the point of landmarking? We must not let this happen on our watch for the sake of future generations and for people who may not otherwise ever get the chance to see the Romanesque style, like some of my students have never been beyond Queens, let alone France. If charred Notre Dame, an actual medieval church can be restored, so can West Park. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Friends of the Upper East Side, Laura Variale. If you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. This is Laura Variale representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Chair Kara and Honorable Commissioners, before you today is an application by West Park Presbyterian Church that seeks to demolish its individually designated property at 165 West 86th Street on the grounds of financial hardship. This is only the 20th hardship application that has come before the Landmarks Preservation Commission since the Landmarks Law was enacted in 1965. West Park Presbyterian Church is a landmark in every sense of the word, from its official designation as one of the finest examples of Romanesque revival architecture in New York City, to the important role it plays as a distinguished anchor on its corner on the Upper East Side, West Side. Although we understand the challenges facing historic religious buildings, the assumptions on which West Park's hardship application are premised deserve close scrutiny and independent review by the Landmarks Commission and the public. The hardship provision exists in the Landmarks Law as an important safety valve, but it is not intended to be a loophole to undermine designation. 
A determination of hardship in this case would send a message to owners of landmark properties citywide that years of neglect will be rewarded, rewarded if they just wait long enough. Therefore, as part of its analysis, Friends urges the Landmarks Commission to undertake a hard look at whether the claim, the claims made in the hardship application meet the rigorous standards as, as outlined in the statute. From our initial review, we questioned the validity of the conclusions about the material conditions of the building, the cost to repair and renovate this structure, and the financial assumptions upon which the application is premised. In addition, there is no evidence that all the adaptive reuse avenues were properly exam examined by the owner. The most recent hardship application reviewed by this commission is a fine example of the benefits of cooperation between LPC and the community. At the time, both the agency and friends pursued independent analysis, questioning the assumptions laid out in the applicant submission. We believe that it would be imprudent to allow this application to go forth without similar dual approach. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Olive Freud. Olive, you should be able to unmute your line and uh, state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Olive, are you able to unmute your line? Oh, I see that you're unmuted now. I don't, I am unmuted. All right, thank you. Set. Thank I you. sent in testimony and I've listened to all the speeches. Um, and I just wanted to add a few thoughts. Just to take a look at that beautiful building. It would take a barbarian to want to tear it down. Someone not thinking about history, not thinking about culture. There's no doubt it, it's, a, it's an, an icon, it should remain. And of course, it's an old building. What else do you la a landmark but old buildings? Um, a, in the presentation by the developer uh, of what he wants to do in place of that building, he says he wants to put up a um, 210,000, the 210 foot building. I should say um, who I am, Olive Freud. I am the committee, the president of the Committee for Environmentally Sound Development. And I have recently been through a lawsuit uh, with a developer who put up a building much, much too tall. Uh, when they presented, it's one thing, but when it gets to be put up, it's another. Uh, I would ask the commission to find out exactly what, what, what they're going to do with this new building. One of the terrible things that happened was that um, all the facilities in the cellar were put up higher in the building so that they were allowed to make it much taller than it was. And a few, uh, a few other things um, that developers do. So uh, don't think that uh, you're going to get something that's suitable for the neighborhood if indeed it does go to a, develop to a developer. There have been many reasons why uh, and many people have said uh, why this building should, re um, should remain a landmark. And of course, I agree with that. And um, there, there's so much to worry about of the fact that it might go to other buildings, that what will happen to all the churches in, in, this, in, in this city. Uh, and it's very hard to know from the, from the start what the developer has in mind. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Nina Musinski. And after that, we will hear from Susan Sullivan. So Nina Musinski, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Very much. My name is Nina Musinski. Uh, I, I, I'm an antiquarian bookseller and I have a very strong investment in history and have been extremely upset by what has been happening with this church. I was involved with a group, uh, Friends of West Park, that helped worked with Gail Brewer to get the building landmarked um, a mere 12 years ago. Uh, the Presbytery opposed landmarking. 
because it put the kibosh on their first effort to uh, sell the site, to demolish the church and sell the site to a developer. The Presbytery and the congregation have been trying to get rid of this church for years because they view the church building as a burden that takes money away from their mission. And as I understand from other speakers, this is common with churches and it is understandable. Um, they, they view the church as a congregation and as a mission, not as a building. Um, and the mission of this congregation has indeed been extremely important. The West Park pastors and congregation were vehement supporters of gay rights in the 70s. And when the Presbyterian Church voted to allow the ordina ordination of gay members in 2011, this was largely thanks to West Park. So my view is let them sell the church and at the same time maintain it as a living monument to all that it has witnessed and to all that they've accomplished to the great the great work that was done within its walls. This would be a good outcome for all. As, as Bob Brashear said, let's find a good outcome for all, not just for the presbyteries and the developers' pockets. And I'm going to repeat what's already been said. In their designation, the Landmarks Preservation Commission stated that the West Park, Pres I'm quoting, the West Park Presbyterian Church is one of the Upper West Side's most important buildings. If, in spite of being landmarked, one of the city's most important buildings is allowed to be demolished because of neglect on the part of its tax-exempt owner, where does that leave the rest of our patrimony, the many other historic buildings that either have been landmarked or need to be? This would not only set a terrible precedent, it would completely undermine the landmarking process. It, the Presbytery has not met the requirements for a hardship exemption and a determined contingent of our community wants to help a nonprofit buy this church in order to renovate it and to continue its, to, to keep it as a center for the arts, for culture and for the community. We have the will and the capacity to do this and I urge the commission to please reject the hardship application. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker is Susan Sullivan. Susan, um, if you could please accept the request for promotion to panelist. Great. And Susan, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, my name is Susan Sullivan. Um, as much as I would like to speak again, I spoke in the one o'clock hour. So everyone who came before me is much more eloquent than I. So I defer my time. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Caroline Ellen. And Caroline, you should be able to unmute your line and state your name for the record. Hey, uh, you have three minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Caroline Ellen. Thank you, commissioners, for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I respectfully urge you to affirm the landmark designation of West Park Presbyterian Church and deny the request to remove the landmark designation. Um, this neighborhood, and I look at it every day and it's just so uplifting. Um, I respect and admire the work that the Presbytery does in New York. And it's my belief that this is really a case of both and. This is not an either or. We can both save this historic treasure of a building and at the same time, help the congregation continue their deeply important mission so that they can thrive in this special landmark building without bearing the burden of preserving it. My neighbors have really galvanized in the past month over the hardship application and we want to save the building. We understand that this is a crucial moment to save it and I've met with dozens of neighbors and we are energized, we are excited, we're passionate to find a solution, like Reverend Bashir said, like, let's find a solution. We can do this, we can save this building. We're committed to restoring it, to preserving it, to transforming it into, um, I mean, my, my recommendation is into a welcoming and vital nonprofit community arts center uh, or whatever other solution can be found. Um, and I just wanna say to people who've doubted that the money is there, that this is real. We have made concrete pledges. We're poised and ready to write checks. We're poised and ready to dig deep, even when it's hard, because we care so much. We are ready to write checks to support the work that needs to be done now. 
And please, please give us a chance to preserve this historic treasure for the congregation's use, for the community's use, for the city's use, and for the enjoyment of future generations. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Thomas Collins, followed by Bryn Walker. And so Thomas, if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, hi, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Thomas Collins. I'm a graduate uh, at CUNY University where I study architectural history and I actually live on the Upper West Side. Uh, in Notre Dame de Paris, Victor Hugo wrote that in the Middle Ages, men had no great thought that they did not write down in stone. For Hugo, the great cathedrals of Europe were books of stone that conveyed the worldview and intellectual climate of their makers. Equally importantly, medieval churches and their complex system of iconography were not merely a product of theological devotion, but were the embodiments of a communal spirit and attested to the skill of artisans and designers who built these soaring edifices at great cost. Architecture does not exist merely to attend to our material needs. It must serve deeper functions that can transcend the concrete reality of our daily lives. The book of architecture, Hugo writes, no more belongs to the priesthood, to religion, to Rome. It belongs to the imagination, to poetry, to the people. Under the pretext of building churches, art grows to magnificent proportions. In West Park Presbyterian, we can read in this book of stone, the Richardsonian influences that gave birth to a new robust American architecture. It should be celebrated and restored, not demolished. The church claims that years of deferred maintenance would require nearly 50 million in construction costs to restore. Prior studies excluded from their application have shown the true cost to be substantially lower, especially when repairs are triaged through phase construction. In their reasonable return calculations, the church has used these re high renovation estimates as part of their total depreciated development costs, which factors into the financial feasibility of the base infill and multifamily conversion scenarios. It is essential, therefore, that independent physical condition assessments of the church and cost analysis of phase renovations be provided to the commission. When St. Bart's applied for hardship to demolish their parish house, LPC utilized a third party evaluation of the maintenance cost to determine that the financial hardship claims had been meritless. Has LPC reviewed independent restoration and cost studies for this application? It is imperative that the commission possesses all the necessary facts to make an informed decision. The decline of religious membership across the city raises serious questions about how these historic resources will be preserved for future generations. But fortunately, West Park Presbyterian Church has many friends in the community and among elected officials who have vowed to see this building restored. Unlike many declining churches where viable uses are not forthcoming, this building currently enjoys an active and vibrant use as an art center. The choice is not simply between wasteful demolition of a designated landmark and yet another multifamily residential conversion that would destroy the exquisite sanctuary interior. In closing, I ask that you vote unanimously to reject the West Park Presbyterian Church's hardship application. The church has not demonstrated that they have met the statutory requirements to utilize the hardship provision. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Bryn Walker. Bryn, I, um, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Hi, everybody. I am Bryn Asha Walker. Um, I am the producing artistic director of the Seeing Place Theater. I just ducked out. I'm in the middle of teaching a class. Um, so I'm in the bathroom at work. Um, but I am um, teaching at CUNY School of Professional Studies. I also teach at Hunter College and Brooklyn College. Um, the Seeing Place, which is a theater company that I co-run, works out of the West Park Presbyterian uh, Church and we rent from Center at West Park. We're in 3A. It's really been our first artistic home as a studio and it's especially in this cultural climate where so many rehearsal studios have shut down 
around the city because they weren't able to survive the pandemic, it really would be crushing for us if this proposal goes through. So my particular request to you all is to um, deny this request. I'm, I'm against the proposal to demolish the church. Um, our theater company, The Seeing Place, uh, I'm trans feminine non-binary. I'm also neurodivergent and disabled and I'm half black. I'm very light skinned, but I'm half black. Um, we primarily serve communities that are from the BIPOC populations, from LGBTQIA, from uh, neurodivergent and disabled populations, uh, immigrants and uh, women and underrepresented genders. Um, and it is a space that has afforded us the ability to continue to work and to actually have a place to be. Um, I don't, I mean, yes, it's maybe not the prettiest building in the world in terms of what its current uh, stature is, but it is certainly workable and it works really well for us. And so I think some renovations might be useful, but with that said, like this is a working building uh, as many people have shared on this before my class started. Um, and I just wanna say that and say that I'm very much against this and it's really useful. Um, for our purposes and for our communities. And we've been a theater company for the last 11 years and we have served those populations very heavily in that time. So we're a nonprofit organization as well and um, very much would like to stay. So that's what I have to say. And thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Paul Kampfer. And Paul, you should be able to unmute your line and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Okay, can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so my name is Paul Camper. I'm from Hiller PC, but I'm gonna be reading a statement from Justin Spivey. Uh, Justin is a senior associate at WJE Engineers and Architects. He's a New York State professional engineer and an APT recognized professional. Uh, his statement is as, as follows. In addition to assisting my colleague with the building envelope condition assessment, I also performed an independent review of structural conditions discussed in the developer's submission. While focused on structure, the Severod's Associates Report also discusses facade conditions and repeats facade MD's recommendations to completely replace all deteriorated stone regardless of the extent of deterioration. That's in addition to inappropriate recommendations such as high pressure washing that is likely to further damage the historic masonry. For interior structural items, LBG's estimate based on Severod's report includes $1.5 million for removing and replacing interior finishes to access roof trusses and bearing walls for repair. Although the church is not currently designated as an interior landmark, we believe that the impact on the historic plaster finishes could be minimized by using boroscopes, digital radioscopy, and other minimally destructive, techni uh, destructive techniques to confirm whether any deficiencies exist. That is followed by targeted removals of finishes in only those locations where repairs are needed. The $250,000 allowance for structural steel in LBG's estimate may not be required if the observed roof trusses deflection is entirely attributable to long-term creep, which is normal, normal and expected in long-span heavy timber how trusses of this vintage. The $500,000 allowance for repairs to interior bearing walls is unlikely to be required given the general absence of cracking indicative of structural distress below the roof truss bearings or elsewhere at the interior. Finally, estimates for smaller structural repairs seem excessive, such as the $25,000 for what we estimate to be 100 square feet of wood floor framing repairs. In summary, building envelope and structural conditions are not significantly worse than similar buildings of this vintage with comparable le levels of maintenance. We believe the violations can be addressed and critical safety deficiencies resolved for significantly less than the developer's $50 million estimate. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Michelle Dalhoff. Michelle, you should be able to unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for your time. My name is Michelle Dahlhoff, and I'm an architect at WJE and Engineers and Architects, working with the team engaged by the Center at West Park and with Justin Spivey, whose testimony was just delivered. We have been engaged to perform a condition assessment specifically focusing on the ex existing facade and structural conditions cited by the church and their consultants and the associated cost projections for necessary repairs. Extensively detailed as part of the application, portions of the existing sandstone along West 86th Street and Amsterdam Avenue require repair in order to maintain a safe facade and address previously issued violations. During our assessment, it was noted that the deterioration of existing sandstone conditions was primarily associated with the red sandstone detailing elements, including those areas with carved details, arch window surrounds, and striated banding and water table details. As part of our review, the brown sandstone units, a material frequently used at the rusticated ashlar units, was observed to be in generally good condition. In our review of the proposed masonry repair scope and cost, extensive sandstone replacement in the form of full unit replacement was recommended. We believe these estimates to be in excess of that necessary to achieve make safe repairs for the following reasons. One, the repairs detailed as part of the application submissions do not discuss or address the variation of deterioration in existing red and brown colored sandstone units and include full replacement of large percentages of the existing units. In our review of, of Facade MD's repair estimate ranges, both the median and high end of their estimates, the, they project full replacement of 60 to 90% of the existing bell tower sandstone units. As is typical with exfoliation of weathered sandstone, the depth of material loss likely varies at the facade based on stone performance, exposure, and runoff conditions. That being said, repair strategies may include removal of loose material and retooling, partial depth of Dutchman repairs, and full replacement as required. The variations in these repair approaches will impact both the total repair duration and individual repair costs. With respect to the existing windows throughout, the applicants compiled pricing estimates assume large quantities of wood frame repairs, leaded glass resetting, and replacement to existing protective plastic layers. We believe that these estimates are excessive projected at over $2.7 million and consistent with a detailed restoration campaign and not that what that is necessary to maintain a safe and weather type building envelope for continued use. Although we agree that repairs are necessary to address broken lights, damaged frames and omitted protective layers at some locations, we believe the work necessary to achieve these repairs is significantly less than outlined by the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Laura Sewell, uh, followed by Geneva Overholster. And so Laura, you should be able to unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, hi, I'm Laura Sewell. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, LESPI, and the East Village Community Coalition. The Lower East Side Preservation Initiative is highly opposed to the reference applications proposal to demolish the West Park Presbyterian Church, which is certainly one of the great individual landmarks of the Upper West Side. As one of the most important Romanesque revival style religious structures in New York City, the building is a landmark in the truest sense of the word, serving as an architectural and historical beacon for the community. Along with its stunning brownstone facades, the church is also important for its cultural history. First, during the 19th century, when it welcomed Chinese Americans during a time of great prejudice, and later standing at the forefront of the African-American and LGBTQ civil rights movements. The building's current occupant, the Center at West Park, is a nonprofit community performing arts center, which has made a significant impact on the cultural fabric of the Upper West Side and the city. Although the property is located well north of Lesby's catchment area of the Lower East Side, we comment here because of the terrible precedent the demolition of this church would present for the landmark religious sites throughout the city, including on Manhattan Lower East Side. I also say that EVCC does not typically comment on, on applications in the Upper West Side, but we're here for the same reason. We're sympathetic to the concerns of a struggling parish, of course, but not to the Presbytery's intent to use the proceeds from the sale and demolition of an architectural treasure 
that the commission landmark for the enjoyment of all New Yorkers to support their programs, however valuable they may be. We appreciate the commission's robust examination of the facts before them and thank our fellow preservation orgs for so thoroughly noting the reasons why this application does not meet the criteria for hardship. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, will actually be Louisa Steinberg. And Louisa, you should be able to unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Louisa, are you able to unmute your line? Hi, this is Allison, Allison Greenberg. Hi, Allison. Um, Louisa, am I on deck? Next? You are next. Why okay. don't you go ahead and we'll see if Louisa can come on afterwards. Thank you. Okay. My name is Allison Greenberg. I live on West 89th Street, blocks from the church, and marvel at its beauty as I often pass. I'm the president of the Historic Districts Council, but testify in my individual capacity. And apologies, I was just walking my dog on a break. The LPC designated this property as a landmark in 2010 over the objections of the applicant. No guarantees were made by anyone of millions of dollars of funding to pay for maintenance and improvement. What matters is that this body decided that the structure was worthy of designation. Any decay over time does not change the merit of the designation. With creative effort, this structure can and should be saved. You've heard today from well-paid experts hired to convince you to grant the application. It's a very lucrative deal and a lot is riding on it. The church could not hire the presenters on their own. Alchemy is providing the presentation to you. Alchemy is driving this nonprofit hardship application. The applicant representative is a trustee of the Presbytery, not a member of the church, which owns the building. So please do an independent assessment of the numbers, the safety threats, everything you've heard by, by the applicant. As tempting as it may be to say yes to this application to allow the Presbytery to put good use to the millions of dollars of anticipated proceeds, that should not be your concern at all. The case of Society for Ethical Culture is on point. The main issue is whether demolition is necessary for this church to fulfill its charitable purpose, not that of the Presbytery or some future formation of a church congregation. Under the test that applies, the LPC should deny the application because you would not be preventing this church from fulfilling its charitable purpose. This church has not demonstrated evidence that it used good faith efforts to sell the building as is without demolition to advance its charitable mission. In 2008, you granted the exception to St. Vincent's, which was made by the Rudin developers along with the hospital. Dan Kaplan was one of the main presenters and he did a very good job then too. There was voluminous testimony about that nonprofit, St. Vincent's Hospital providing charitable purpose to the community, to the Greenwich Village, com Greenwich Village community and beyond. It turned out that St. Vincent's um, was in financial peril and had not provided that information. The hospital folded overnight, you know the rest. But in this case, we haven't seen that type of evidence from this applicant about whether it's actually serving an active mission, an active charitable purpose. Sadly, it seems that the church has not been active for years. And ultimately the Presbytery is not the applicant. If you accept the application, the LPC will radically change the standard for hardship exceptions under the law in New York and will open the floodgates to religious institutions and other nonprofit owners of landmark worthy status, trading in their landmarks for financial windfalls. I can't imagine this mayor a person Sorry, comprises. Allison, you're at three minutes. If you could please wrap up your testimony. I can't imagine this mayor, a person who prizes beauty, dignity, pride in appearance, and civic pride, supporting the rewarding of an owner of a landmark 
which has uh, neglected that landmark, as is the case here, with a mega million windfall, it would look really bad. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm right, actually. And I hope that you'll reject this application. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll try Louisa Steinberg again. Um, if you can unmute your line and state your name for the record, you have three minutes to speak. Let's see. There you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Louisa Steinberg. Uh, I have been living on the Upper West Side since 2013. Uh, we moved into a neighboring building uh, on 176 West 87th Street uh, in 2018. Um, and I just want to speak and say that I'm strongly opposed to the demolition, um, not only because I'm a neighbor of the building, but really because I do think this is really a beautiful historical landmark. One of the things that makes the Upper West Side so special is the many landmarked buildings. And I am concerned that if this, uh, if this building is de-landmarked, that this will set a precedent for other buildings as well. Um, I would like to see the building restored um, and restored to its former beauty. Um, but again, I don't think that demolition and building a new construction there is uh, the the right solution. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Eileen Farkas. Eileen, uh, if you can accept the promotion to panelist. Eileen, are you able to unmute your mic and uh, state your name for the record? Okay, I think we'll move on at this time. Um, those are all of the signups that we have. So now I'll move to some hands that are raised. Um, Dion Thompson, I'll be promoting you to panelist if you could please accept the request. And if you could please uh, unmute your mic and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, it looks like they put their hand down. Um, a person by the Zoom name of Layla, if you, I'll be promoting you to panelist, if you could please accept that request. Hello there. Hi, my name is Dion Thompson. I'm a uh, an elder of uh, West Park Presbyterian Church and have been a um, a member of the congregation for over ten years. I have a long allegiance to the historic building. Um, if the walls could talk, boy, the words that would speak has so many spiritual and social and personal and artistic significant impacts on uh, the Upper West Side. For for over a decade, I've uh, managed a uh, and hosted a uh, an open mic in the chapel. Uh, it's a unique form of ministry. Uh, it was actually the torch was passed from from someone who who started uh, the the notion uh, under the the vise of uh, the name uh, Rhythms Repair and Renovations. Um, which which uh, uh, the the money uh, uh, went into helping out the building and and the man put a lot into it. R.L. Haney and and as, uh, carrying the torch on for for all these years, we've we've uh, we we, uh, the, we we show God's love in a in a very practical way, unlike uh, practically uh, all the other activities. Um, this this is open to everyone in the community. It it, it fosters personal growth. It, it's a great recreational event for the. Uh, for 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 everyone, West Park's always been uh, known for for the arts and having a lot of um, uh, uh, supporting uh, 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 all all types of uh, open for everyone. That, that you know the notion of God's love. Um, we uh, you know with with that being said, I'd like to say that we the longstanding tradition um, 
can can be done at any location. It doesn't have to be in the uh, in the building itself. It could be anywhere. It's it's not. Um, you know, this, it, I love the, the beauty of the building, but it, it, it's like it, everything's decaying, all, all the money and everything's invested. It's not like we haven't been trying to to uh, do fundraisers and support. And and then, uh, you know, so many people have talked up, but very few people put up, especially. I feel like the same same things are being said now that have been said over 10 years ago. Um, but in any event, um, I, I, I'd like to say that uh, it, it's it's uh, officially acknowledged how we've exhausted our, our resources and uh, trying to sustain and maintain the building. Over the last 10 years, we haven't received, uh, uh, we didn't receive any of uh, the promised support from the community. Um, I, 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 I've, uh, I'm sorry. Um, we, um so we didn't get any promise support from the community i i i i'm totally in favor of the church um uh being being offered in favor of the uh the d land marking i i um uh, uh, i support the uh presbytery and and um I, I hear the uh, then end cap there for the time. So uh, the sale would allow the congregation to have seed money as long as well as offer a lot of people. Okay, well, thank you for your testimony. Um, the next speaker is, is Layla. And Layla, um, you should be able to unmute your mic if you can state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Layla Elias, and I'm a West Park church member. I've been for many years, and also I work as the administrator for West Park Presbyterian church. While I do not want to disrespect the center and all the work they have done to help the church out for you for many years, but now they have changed. They have now taken credit for all the creative and, and endeavors and the renters in the building, i.e. Noche Flamenca, Lighthouse Chapel, and originally Russian Art, Russian Theater Arts Group, and many others. Um, West Park Presbyterian Church brought in these art groups and sponsored Noche Flamenca's acclaimed Antigone, which was very successful at the church. The church also provided the center with a fully renovated office with equipment, which was donated by one of our own church members, Don France, saying that the church has done nothing and the center taking credit for all of West Park's programs throughout the years is wrong. The center pays very little rent to the church, 2,400 a month, and the church is still responsible for paying building insurance, which is close to 40,000 a year. I feel making a quick decision on landmarking and forcing the church to give or sell the building to a nonprofit organization is property theft. I hope we will not make a quick decision without looking at all the evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be um, a 212 number. I believe it's Ted. And I've, I'll be allowing you to speak now. If you could please um, unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Confirm that you can hear me, please. Yes, we can hear you. This is Theodore Grunewald. Good afternoon. Every commissioner today will recall the unlandmarked yet venerable St. Bridget's Roman Catholic Church, a.k.a. the historic F Irish Famine Church, uh, at the corner of, First, of Avenue B and 8th Street, opposite Tompkins Square Park. Uh, designed in the Gothic Revival style by well-known architect Patrick Keeley and built in 1849 by local Irish shipwrights from the nearby East River Dry Docks, St. Bridget's served multiple waves of immigrant arrivals. The church's tumultuous 174-year history culminated in 1992 when its rear or eastern wall began separating from the lateral walls of the nave. Buttresses were erected to shore up the wall 
and a visible crack on the north facade began widening. Floor joists pulled away from the wall nearly a foot. By 2001, St. Bridget's constructed a brick masonry bearing walls with wood floors and in great danger of structural collapse was ordered closed. While parishioners organized and filed suit, the archdiocese obtained demolition permits and began raising the church in July 2006. As the case wound its way through the courts, an anonymous donor stepped forward with a gift of $20 million. The gift included $10 million to restore the building itself, $2 million to establish an endowment for the parish, and $8 million to support St. Bridget's School and other Catholic schools in need. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2009, uh, Atchison Doyle Partners Architects commenced the extensive $10 million restoration work, which included underpinning of the timber pile foundation, construction of a new concrete support wall at the exterior of the east wall, rebuilding of the majority of the north wall due to deteriorated mortar, a new copper roof, facade recladding and custom cast stone units, rebuilding damaged plaster vaults, new mechanical, electrical, and lighting systems, all up to code, a new stairway and accessible lift, restored interior finishes, including new stained glass windows in rebuilt wood tracery and by-hand replication of historic plaster moldings and finishes. Today, West Park is nowhere close to the imminent danger of structural collapse that St. Bridges was, and even accounting for an approximately $2 million cost overrun and for inflation, St. Bridget's extensive restoration and repair of its severe structural issues were successfully completed for a small fraction of the estimated 50 to 80 million presented today as the estimate for West Park's restoration. The applicants' figures are not competitive, and the hardship application should be denied. It is also incumbent upon me to remind the commissioners that West Park is the sole remaining example of a true full-throated, vigorously articulated, rock-faced, Richardson Romanesque building in New York City. While the city has townhouse facades with earmarks of the style, and the 1891 post office at Cadman Plaza in Brooklyn does come close, it does date from a later period after the Romanesque revival style had evolved into a smoother, more refined phase, more aligned with the emerging Beaux-Arts than West Park's strongly rusticated rougher, tougher masonry vocabulary of the 1880s. Well, me, once, reach three minutes, if you could please wrap up oh, your testimony. We'll wrap it up. While once relatively idios, well, while once relatively common, the idiosyncratic hallmarks of the full-blown rock-faced Richardson Romanesque style was as short-lived as Henry Hobbs and Richardson's brief 46 years. Many works of his style became easy targets for demolition, since the style, so associated with its 1880s apokji, was perceived as dated. New York is fortunate that we still have West Park Presbyterian, uh, the sole remaining exemplar of the Richardson Romanesque, uh, a visual feast of remarkably high architectural quality and integrity. Please do not lose this monument to the Richardson Romanesque, our only example. Thank you. Thank you. And so as a reminder, um, we will only be allowing uh, each member of the public to testify one time. And so if uh, your hand is raised and you've spoken previously, we will be uh, moving those hands down. Um, and so I'll now call on Alec Roman to speak. I've just promoted you to panelist, Alec Roman. If you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. Alec Roman, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next speaker, um, Susan Simon. Susan Simon, if you could please state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my name is Susan Simon and I'm the founder of the Central Park West Neighbors Association, which is a community organization originally formed to protect the landmark First Church of Christ Scientist 
on Central Park West in 96 from a developer who saw a rich opportunity to build luxury condos for the very rich in this space, in this space once built as a sanctuary. First Church was considered one of the most significant churches in this city by, Robert, by architect Robert A.M. Stern. It was designed by the premier architects of the Gilded Age, Carrere and Hastings, yet a plan to punch nearly 40 windows into its solid New Hampshire granite was actually approved by the LPC. And that was a roadmap to the desecration of this magnificent monument until the developer, in spite of his cadre of highly paid architects, lawyers, and real estate lobbyists, failed to win the variances he needed to proceed from the BSA. Our community fought and we won. If I had a dollar for everyone who said we would never succeed, the church building was obsolete, it should be demolished, it was an eyesore, no one would ever come up with the money, I would be an infinitely richer woman today. I'd like to add that as West Park, First Church still had much activity inside it, including an active congregation and rentals for graduations, religious services, and more. But it was seen as a good deal to sell it out from under those folks by a mother church in California when developers came nipping at their heels. Eventually, with much effort by our community, including Gail Brewers and Landmark West, First Church was sold by the developer and purchased by the Children's Museum of Manhattan with ambitious plans for a wonderful facility inside. The money was raised for its $45 million purchase and for the additional major construction plans to come. It will become a world-class museum, not only for our community, but for the entire city. This is an example of what can happen to not only preserve our historic landmarks, but to enhance community use. The plan to demolish West Park is not just a last case scenario, it is a worst case scenario. This is an important designated landmark, not only for the Upper West Side, but for the city. This claim of hardship is certainly convenient when a major developer has come with enormous money to build yet another homogeneous temple for the worship of multi-million dollar investors. We must remember the absolute importance of why buildings in this city are given landmark status. We must never give way to the enormous pressures of the real estate industry who dangle so much money in the face of religious institutions that they forget their stewardship and their mission to jump on board. In closing, I maintain there is also a spiritual need for a city to retain its historic buildings as legacies to the past. And I quote, the city's architectural heritage embodies the spirit of the place its uniqueness and stories. A city whose streets combine past and present creates a space for memories and emotional connection. I ask you to deny this application and preserve West Park. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi this is Alec. I'm, I can I have my, I have, uh, my service back if, if I can still Great. go. If you could state your name for the record, uh, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alec Roman, and I'm a Upper West Side resident. Uh, I urge I urge you to reject the application to de, de landmark and de demolish the West Park Presbyterian Church. Um, shortly after I moved to the Upper West Side, I wandered into the church to watch an event that was being hosted inside. Uh, I was impressed with the beautiful interior of the building, the cathedral ceilings, and stained glass windows, and all its history. To me, it was the prime example of the character and history that make the Upper West Side a great place to live. Because of this, I was very upset to hear of this attempt to demolish the historic building and replace it with high-end condominiums. I was especially frustrated after more closely examining the calculation for reasonable rate of return offered by the applicant and seeing that it was clearly flawed. The structure of the building, as anyone who goes inside can see, 
is clearly sound, though some funding is required for the facade. Independent reviews, like one that is nearly complete, will clearly show that, and in, by independent reviews, I mean those without a financial interest in the answer, will show that, that this is the case. The Presbytery has received a full, fully committed cash offer to purchase West Park Church that accomplishes all of the following. It, pre it preserves this great historic building for all to enjoy. It provides a multi-million dollar payout to the Presbytery, which it can share with West Park congregation as it sees fit. It relieves the congregation and the Presbytery from any financial risk or obligation to repair and maintain the structure, guarantees the congregation permanent use of the historic structure for continued worship, and offers the Presbytery rights to the excess proceeds should the church ever be sold, and that includes the land and air rights. The only advantage of the offer that Alchemy and the Presbytery are currently pursuing is that it maximizes proceeds to the owner. All the other issues that have been raised are better addressed by an alternative, such as the one I just mentioned. This debate boils down to the question of whether de-landmarking should be a tool available to owners of historic, culturally significant buildings who are no longer willing or able to maintain them and are focused instead on maximizing the proceeds. If, if the owner of this historic building is rewarded for this approach over the last few years, others are sure to take notice and follow suit. The allure of cash payments from luxury condo developers is too great for many to resist. I am genuinely, genuinely afraid for the neighborhood and the city if what makes both special is allowed to be demolished and replaced with cookie cutter investment properties. An important piece of the neighborhood's history would be lost. The vibrancy of the culture center and theater productions would be silenced forever. My sincere hope is that all of these things are what landmarking is designed to preserve and protect. Please vote against the landmarking and demolition. Thank you. Thank you. And so we do not have any other speakers signed up or any other hands raised. Oh, one more hand raised. Uh, Don Franz, um, I'll be promoting you to panelist. You should be able to uh, unmute your mic, Don, if you'd like to state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Well, um, he lowered his hand. So in that case, um, I will turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you very much. And I wanna thank everyone who participated today. We had a lot of um, testimony, a lot of uh, helpful um, thoughts and comments. And many of you also submitted documents, which we, as I said, will be reviewing very carefully. So I wanna thank you for all of the efforts that you've put into this process. Um, as I said, we are going to consider all of this information um, that's been that we've heard today and that has been submitted to us. And um, then we will start to think about the questions we have based on what we've heard today. And um, we will reconvene at a public meeting in July to continue the discussion and ask those questions and continue to gather information. But, and, and at that time, the applicants will be able to answer uh, questions, but I wanted to give you the opportunity now if you wanted to uh, do any preliminary response to the comments we've heard in the testimony today. I think um, given the hour and the fact that everybody has been listening uh, to a lot of testimony, both pro and con for over four hours, um, I think we would like to defer our response uh, to the public meeting in July. Okay. All right. So with that, then, commissioners, I'm going to start to send you requests to unmute so that we can make a motion to close the hearing. All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? Second it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, the hearing is closed and we will, um, as I said, consider all of the information that we've received and that we've heard today and we will reconvene at a public meeting in July and we will keep everyone posted on the dates and the next steps in this process. So thank you all for participating and thank you commissioners for your commitment today as well to engaging in this process. Thank you.